Blindsided. Written and narrated by Christine Kersey. Copyright 2017 by Christine Kersey. Chapter 1 I know this is last minute, Hank, but it can't be helped, London Chamberlain said. Hank Parson frowned as he listened to his ex-wife, her voice filling his car over his Bluetooth speakers as he drove to football practice. I understand. This is just unexpected. I'm not thrilled that my movie shoot changed either, but we finished the domestic filming, and now we need to do the location work. It's just for a few weeks. She paused. It's going to be brutal, Hank. Extra long hours this time. Not the best place for a four-year-old. Plus, it's overseas. A loud sigh came across the line. And must I remind you that Harper is your daughter as much as she is mine? Annoyed that London had thrown that in, Hank frowned. He adored his little girl, and he loved when she came for extended stays, wished he could have more of them. But London had primary custody, and she often took Harper along on her movie shoots. I'm aware that she's my daughter, London. Barely controlled irritation rang in his voice. And you know that she's always welcome. No explanation needed. He wanted to make that clear, even if her coming right now would add extra stress. Sunday, four days away, would be the first game of the new NFL season, and his training had become intense. By the way, London said, her voice a little breathless, and Hank could picture her rushing out the door. Harper has a new nanny. Hank's eyebrows rose. Harper had had the same nanny her entire life. What happened to Emily? She got married and moved away. An exasperated sigh filled the brief silence. I told you about this weeks ago, Hank. Nostrils flaring at her condescending tone, Hank shoved down the annoyance that flooded him. Right, so tell me about this new nanny. He heard the sound of a door closing and then an engine starting. I've got to run, Hank. Harper and her nanny will be arriving tonight. The connection abruptly ended, and Hank scowled before calling Mrs. Stillman, his housekeeper and cook, to let her know that Harper and her nanny would be moving in for an extended stay. With Harper's little hand in hers, Mary glided down the airport concourse, her gaze sliding from one person to another as she searched for a driver holding up a sign reading Chamberlain. Harper's last name was Parson, the same as her father's, but London preferred to use her own last name whenever possible. Mary couldn't blame her. London was at the pinnacle of her career. At least, that's what she told Mary, and loved to flaunt her success. The extravagant salary London paid Mary to be Harper's nanny seemed to prove that. But Mary adored Harper, so the high salary was just a bonus. Am I going to see my daddy? Harper asked her green eyes shining with excitement. Mary stopped and knelt in front of her, then smiled as she adjusted the snow-white backpack on Harper's shoulders. Yes, you are. We're going to stay with your daddy while your mommy is making her movie, and we're going to have lots of fun, aren't we? Harper bobbed her head, her eyes wide. Yes! Tucking Harper's long blonde hair behind her ears, Mary smiled before standing. Help me find a man holding a sign that says Chamberlain, okay? I will, because I know my letters. Yes, you do. You're a smart girl, Harper. Harper beamed, and they continued walking. I see it, Harper said with enthusiasm a few moments later, as she pointed toward a row of people holding signs. I see the sign. It has my mommy's name. Pleased that Harper had picked it out before she had, Mary gently squeezed her hand. Good eye, Harper. Ten minutes later, they were seated in the back of a limousine and on their way to Harper's father's house, their luggage secured in the trunk. Mary had yet to meet Hank Parson, but when she'd taken the nanny job, she'd looked him up online. A running back for the Sacramento Vipers, Hank was six feet tall and well-built. According to the articles Mary had read, he was fast on the field, although Mary didn't care about that. Sports were frivolous and silly, especially football men wearing little outfits as they ran around on a field throwing a ball and tackling each other? What was good about that? How did that qualify as entertainment? How was that not a waste of time and energy? Art, on the other hand, 
Now, that was worthy of time and energy. Mary loved art, and she loved to paint. In the few weeks she'd been caring for Harper, she taught the little girl basic painting techniques, and they both loved to spend hours creating. She would have to make sure Harper's father provided a bright, sunny space for them to work. Thinking of Hank Parson, Mary recalled the pictures of him she'd seen online. Despite his silly profession, she couldn't deny that he was movie star attractive. Dark blonde hair, close-cut beard, strong jaw, full lips, and his eyes. Mary could see where Harper had gotten her green eyes. Despite his good looks, Mary didn't know what to expect. London and Harper had given her conflicting descriptions of the man in whose house she would be living. London had warned Mary that Hank could be charming, but that underneath it all, he was a selfish man. Mary was no fool. She knew London harbored bitterness toward her ex-husband, despite the fact that London had cheated on him, had left him. Still, Mary had to believe there was some truth to what her employer had told her. Harper, on the other hand, only had wonderful things to say about her father, how he gave her piggyback rides and read stories to her, how she had her own princess room at his house, how he played with her in his enormous backyard. She would see for herself soon enough. Chapter 2 "'We're going to my daddy's house,' Harper said, her voice filled with excitement, her eyes glued to the view outside the limo's window as she rode high in her car seat. It was early September, early in the evening. Mary hadn't been to Sacramento before. She was a Southern California girl. But the scenery they were driving through was beautiful. She especially loved all of the huge trees. "'There's Daddy's house,' Harper said." Mary watched as a limo driver paused in front of a gate and spoke to someone through an intercom. The gate swung open, and they drove through. Mary was used to London's mansion in Los Angeles, and in comparison, Hank Parsons' house was modest. Even so, Mary loved the Tuscan style of his house, and as they drove toward the building, her eyes were drawn to the trees lining both sides of the drive. She didn't know much about trees, but she immediately dubbed the tree with red leaves as her favorite. The car stopped in front of a courtyard. Daddy! Harper squealed as she wriggled in her seat. Mary turned in the direction Harper was looking and saw Hank Parson. He was wearing a huge grin. Undoing the restraints on Harper's car seat, Mary was surprised to find her heart pounding. What was that all about? She'd grown up around the most handsome and charismatic men in Los Angeles. Her father was an entertainment attorney. So why did Hank Parson, a football player of all things, make her heart go pitter-patter? The door next to Harper's car seat opened. Is that my Harper girl? Hank asked, his attention completely focused on his daughter. Harper held out her arms, and Hank scooped her out of her car seat, holding her tight. Mary smiled at the loving reunion, pleased to see how happy Harper was to see her father. The limo driver opened the door next to Mary and helped her climb out of the car. She walked around the limo and stopped, waiting for an opportunity to introduce herself. When Harper wrapped her small arms around Hank's neck and lay her head against his shoulder, he nearly melted. He hadn't seen her in weeks and had nearly forgotten how good it felt to hold his baby girl. Reveling in the warmth of her little body, he'd almost missed the nanny standing next to the limo. Wavy, light brown hair hung halfway down her back, and inquisitive gray eyes watched him. She was petite, couldn't have been over five foot three, and she looked about eighteen. Was she qualified to take care of his daughter? Where had London found her? He knew nothing about her, not even her name. With Harper still in his arms, he took two steps until he was in front of her, then he held out his hand. I'm Hank Parson, and you're obviously Harper's nanny. Her eyes never left his face, and when she smiled, her rose-colored lips revealed straight white teeth. I'm Mary, she said, her handshake firm. Hank shoved aside the immediate attraction he had to her. That's not her real name, Harper said, as she twisted in Mary's direction. Concerned that something was wrong here, that maybe Harper knew some sort of secret about the nanny, maybe something that this nanny didn't want him to know, 
Hank adjusted Harper on his hip so he could scrutinize the nanny's face. Not her real name? No. Harper was matter-of-fact. Hank looked at the nanny, who seemed to be hiding a smile. Hank turned back to Harper. What's her real name? Her real name is Marigold. It's a flower, Daddy. Mary is just a nickname. Holding back a laugh, Hank said, You mean a nickname? Harper's eyebrows furrowed. That's what I said. Of course you did. Glad that there wasn't something nefarious going on, Hank still wasn't completely sold on Mary's, Marigold's, qualifications to care for his daughter. What kind of name was that anyway? That's a unique name, he said to her. Something about having Hank's full attention on her brought a butterfly to life in Mary's belly. Just a single butterfly, because though she found him devastatingly handsome, according to London, he was charming yet selfish. Besides, he was Harper's father, and a football player, not someone to think of in romantic terms. True, he was only a few years older than her own twenty-four years, but that didn't matter. As far as Mary was concerned, the man was off-limits. It was my mother's idea, she said in answer to his implied question. She loves flowers, especially marigolds. I want a flower name, Harper said. Smiling at her, Mary asked, What flower name do you want? Harper's lips pressed together as she looked skyward, then she shrugged. I don't know. What about Pansy? Mary asked, or Rose, or Lily. I like Harper best, Hank said with a look at Mary, like he was trying to tell her to back him up. I want to be a Rose, Harper said, her lips forming a pout. Mary looked at Hank. What did he have against Harper having a flower name? Hank held back a frown. Why did he feel like he was being outnumbered, like his opinion didn't matter? It's just a name, he thought. Let it go. But that wasn't the issue. With London, he always felt like what he wanted, what he thought, was invalid. Like it didn't matter. Like he didn't matter. Harper's a beautiful name, Mary said and Hank felt a rush of warmth toward her. But I want to be a rose, Harper said, her voice tilting dangerously close to a whine. What color of rose do you want to be? Hank asked as he tickled her, kind of desperate to salvage the first few minutes he had with her. Pink, Harper said with a giggle as she threw her head back. Okay then, Hank said as he held her in his arms. I'm going to call you Pink Rose. Mary watched their interplay, happy to see that Hank had let Harper win the silly little fight, that he so clearly loved his daughter. Harper straightened and beamed at him. Princess Pink Rose! He dipped his head as he smiled at her. Of course, how could I have forgotten? Princess Pink Rose, you'll always be my princess. Then he nuzzled her neck, throwing her into a fit of giggles. Had London made up the whole charming but selfish thing? Because to Mary, he just seemed charming, and beyond adorable with Harper. Chapter 3 Should we show Mary your princess room? Hank said as he set Harper on the ground, the exhaustion he'd felt after practice beginning to evaporate with his daughter's enthusiasm for all things princess. Yes, yes, yes! My princess room! Harper fairly danced with joy. Laughing, he took her hand and walked toward the house, feeling more than seeing that Mary was following them. Later that evening, he wanted to talk to her, get to know her. It wasn't that he distrusted London's judgment, but he had to know for himself that this marigold woman was qualified to take care of a sweet Harper. After walking through the front door, he held it open for Mary, noticing again how petite she was. A fresh floral scent followed in her wake, and Hank found himself inhaling more deeply. Step back, he thought. She's your daughter's nanny. Mary thought the inside of Hank's house was just as beautiful as the outside. Did he have an eye for design? No, of course not. The man was a running back for the Sacramento Vipers, not an interior designer. He'd obviously hired someone. But Mary loved the feel of the interior distinctly masculine, yet warm and inviting. 
The circular entry featured stone-covered floors and walls, as well as a soaring ceiling. A doorway to the left led to a kitchen, but she barely glanced inside as Hank walked through an arched doorway and into a cozy sitting room with French doors that led to a stunning backyard. Mary was eager to explore, but before she could get a look outside, Hank began ascending a staircase. Hurrying to keep up, when they reached the landing, a large open space, Mary saw a room across the way that could only be Harper's. Mary, come see my room! Harper dashed to Mary's side and slipped her hand into Mary's before tugging her forward. Happy to comply, Mary threw a small smile at Hank. She didn't want him to feel supplanted by her, and allowed Harper to lead her into her pink palace. This is my princess bed, Harper said, her eyes wide and sparkling, her hands still gripping Mary's as they stood beside a white four-poster bed. And this is my special princess pillow. Mary looked at all the pinks and purples and lace and tulle and could see why Harper loved it. A mural of castles and princesses adorned two walls and a painting of a tree with a bounty of apples filled a third. It's the most beautiful room I've ever seen. Mary's voice was hushed as she smiled at Harper. You really are Princess Pinkrose, aren't you? Nodding solemnly, Harper looked from Mary to Hank. I am Princess Pinkrose, right, Daddy? Of course you are. He scooped her into his arms. And is Princess Pinkrose hungry? Harper's lips formed a half-frown as she nodded. Yes. We can't have that. I'll ask Mrs. Stillman to fix you something to eat. How does that sound? Are you going to eat with me, Daddy? Yes. Is Mary going to eat with me? Hank looked at Mary, but Mary didn't say a thing. At London's house, when London was home at dinner time, she often invited Mary to join her and Harper. Regardless, Mary didn't expect it. Hank had no problem with Harper's nanny joining them. It would give him more time to see how she interacted with Harper. Raising his eyebrows in Mary's direction, he asked, Does Mary want to eat with us? Smiling, she said, Sure, thank you. Hank knelt in front of Harper. Let's show Mary where her room is, and then after you both get settled, we'll eat. I want to show her, Harper said. Then she raced to Mary's side and slipped her hand into hers. There was no doubt that his daughter had bonded with Mary. Hank sincerely hoped the woman, girl, was truly qualified. Okay, lead the way, Harper. You didn't call me Princess Pinkrose. Disappointment shone from her eyes. Shaking his head as he softly chuckled, he said, So sorry, Princess Pinkrose. I'll try to do better. Her face brightened, then she looked up at Mary. You should be Princess Orange Marigold. Mary laughed and knelt in front of her. You know what? I'm a secret princess, and no one but you and your dad can know, so you should just call me Mary, okay? Harper's eyes widened. I won't tell the secret. Okay. Now where is this room of mine? Hank had to admit, Mary was beginning to grow on him. She was so sweet with Harper, and clever too. Letting Harper lead the way, he walked behind her and Mary, smiling at their interlocked hands, and not able to stop himself from noticing the way Mary's hips gently swayed in a most alluring way. Your room is right next to mine, Harper said, her voice vibrant. Mary smiled down at her. That's perfect. Then she looked at the space that she would call home. The room was pretty, yet simple. Nestled against one wall was a queen bed with a lavender comforter and several plump pillows, and across from it sat a matching dresser. A bathroom was attached to the room, and along another wall was a set of French doors that led onto a small balcony. Mary's focus went to the large tree outside the balcony like living in a treehouse. Her room at London's house was larger, but this room held a certain charm that appealed to her. Anyway, it didn't matter. She was there to take care of Harper. She wasn't on vacation. It's beautiful. I'm glad it meets with your approval. Mary spun around. She'd almost forgotten he was there. His striking green eyes were focused solely on her, and that butterfly in her belly was joined by another. My room's prettier, Harper said matter-of-factly. 
Glancing at Hank, Mary laughed. Yes, your room is the prettiest of all. That's because I'm a princess. Hank lifted Harper into his arms. A princess who needs to eat. Then he turned to Mary. I'll bring your bags up, and after you both get settled, come down to the dining room. He set Harper down. Harper, I mean, Princess Pinkrose, knows where it is. Harper giggled, and Mary nodded. Moments later, he was gone. Mary found that she was looking forward to dinner. Chapter 4 It's this way, Mary, Harper said, as she tugged on Mary's hand. Mary allowed the little girl to lead her into a dining room, but there were no places set at the table. Hank stepped into the room. It's nice outside, so we're going to eat out there. Hank looked at Harper. Can you take Mary out to the patio dining area? Yes, Daddy. Thank you. I'll be out in a few minutes. Before long, the three of them were seated around a large table in a covered area that would be considered a full-on dining room in most houses. The space continued the Tuscan theme. Dark red octagonal tiles on the floor, tan plaster on the walls, rich wood beams on the ceiling. An outdoor kitchen was nearby, and not far beyond, Mary saw the sparkling turquoise water in a tiled pool. The sun would be setting soon, and the evening was pleasant. They all sat, Hank at the head of the table, Harper to his right, and Mary beside Harper. An older woman, whose dark hair had streaks of gray, brought out a tray of food. Mrs. Stillman, Hank said to her, then he gestured to Mary. This is Harper's nanny, Mary. Mrs. Stillman walked around the table and smiled at Mary, her eyes crinkling, and her hand held out. Welcome, Mary. Mary shook Mrs. Stillman's hand. Thank you. It's so pretty here. If you need anything, Mrs. Stillman said, just let me know. I will. Mrs. Stillman carried out more food, and after helping Harper fill her plate, Mary filled her own. Hank sliced off a chunk of meat from the chicken breast on his plate. Tell me about yourself, Mary. Mary swallowed the bite of broccoli she'd been chewing. Was this like a job interview? London was her employer. She was the one who had the power to fire her, but she could understand Hank's interest. She was taking care of his daughter, after all, and he didn't know her. What would you like to know, Mr. Parson? His forehead creased. Call me Hank. Glad he'd suggested that, because he was only a few years older than her, even if he was her charge's father, she nodded. Okay. I know a gentleman doesn't usually ask a lady her age, but... She knew she looked younger than her years, so she didn't mind. I'm twenty-four. His eyes widened, like this was a great surprise. Mary suppressed a laugh. I can show you my driver's license if you want. Chuckling, he said, no, that's okay, I believe you. He paused a beat. How long have you been a nanny? So, this was going to be like a job interview. That was fine. Mary had complete confidence in her qualifications. I was a nanny for twin boys for three years, but when they started school, their mother decided they no longer needed a nanny. And London found you how? She's friends with a mother of those twin boys. All right. Mary noticed Harper struggling with her chicken, so she cut it into smaller bites. Some of Hank's concerns were put to rest by what she told him, but he wanted more information. He watched her cut Harper's chicken, glad to see that she was attentive to Harper's needs. What kind of education do you have? She finished cutting the meat, then lifted her gaze to look at him, her gray eyes appraising. Did she not like all the questions? He didn't care what she did or didn't like. This wasn't about her. It was about Harper, although he did notice the way her hair fell across her cheek, and he had to fight the urge to reach out and tuck it behind her ear. She tossed her hair behind her shoulder. I have a degree in art history. That had nothing to do with children. He frowned. Her chin lifted slightly. What about you? Eyebrows furrowing, he asked, what about me? Do you have a degree? He didn't like her questioning him, especially in front of Harper. Glancing at his daughter, who was focused on spearing her chicken with her fork, he looked at Mary and lifted his lips in a slight smile. Let's continue this conversation later. 
A flush crept across her cheeks as she nodded. Good. Maybe she would remember who was who in this house. The rest of the meal, Hank concentrated on Harper, with occasional glances at Mary. Now that he knew she was quite a bit older than eighteen, and only a few years younger than he was, he'd become more aware of the subtle things about her. The way her face lit up when she smiled. The way she made Harper her sole focus. The way she hardly seemed to notice he existed. Wait, why did that bother him? But it was obvious. He was used to the world paying all kinds of attention to him, especially now that London wasn't by his side to draw away everyone's admiration. Why was Mary different? Why did she seem to completely ignore him? She wouldn't be able to ignore him when they spoke later, when they were alone. Chapter 5 Mary had to work hard to ignore Hank Parson. There was something about the man that demanded she look at him. At those eyes, that chiseled jaw, that amazingly fit body. But she refused to listen to those demands. She was only there because of Harper, and that's where she needed to keep her focus. She kind of dreaded being one-on-one -on -one with Hank later. Without Harper to draw her attention, Mary would have no choice but to focus on Hank, and he would be focusing on her. Maybe she could get out of it, pretend she was too tired to talk to him. No, he would want to talk to her eventually. It was only natural. She was caring for his daughter, and of course he needed to assuage any concerns he had about her. She would just get it over with. Like usual, the meal Mrs. Stillman had made was delicious, everything cooked to perfection with just the right seasoning. So why was Hank having a hard time enjoying it? Could it be that he was hyper-aware of everything Mary did? But why should he be noticing her at all? She was his daughter's nanny, and he already had a woman in his life. Simone Greenwood. They'd been dating for several months, and though Hank liked her well enough, the spark that had been there at the beginning had begun to sputter, at least for him. But she was stunning, and smart, and good company. She was also demanding. However, there had been plenty of times when she had been attentive to him and his needs, enough times to keep him going, apparently, because he was still seeing her. "'Can I have ice cream, please?' Harper asked, pulling him out of his thoughts. He grinned. "'Ice cream? I didn't know you liked ice cream.' "'I do like ice cream.' "'Which flavor do you like?' He held up his hand. "'Wait, let me guess.' He squinted, as if deep in thought. "'Cookies and cream, with whipped cream and a cherry on top?' She nodded, her eyes growing wide. You're in luck, because I think we have some. Do you want to make your own dessert? I can do how much whipped cream I want? He laughed, <laughs> yes. His gaze went to Mary, who was watching him, her lips lifting in a smile. What about you, Mary? What flavor do you like? None for me, thanks. Mary doesn't like ice cream, Harper said, her voice solemn, like this was a great tragedy. Hank's brows rose. Doesn't like ice cream. He looked at Mary. Why not? One of her shoulders lifted in a shrug. I prefer fresh fruit over sweets. Hank preferred to eat healthy himself. Had to in order to stay in tip-top shape. Let me see what we have. She shook her head. Oh no, I'm fine. You don't need to go to any trouble for me. He'd gotten so used to Simone and her demands that Mary's insistence to basically forget about her took him by surprise. All right. He stood, then smiled at Harper. I'll be back in a minute. Mary watched him go, her attention drawn to his trim waist and muscular biceps. The man was in fantastic shape, no doubt about that, something she shouldn't be noticing but couldn't seem to avoid. Nearly ten minutes passed before he returned carrying a tray. He set it on the table, and Mary was surprised to see a colorful fruit salad in a large bowl, a small dish of ice cream, a can of whipped cream, and a pair of empty bowls. He set the dish of ice cream in front of Harper and held out the canister of whipped cream. Here you go, Princess Pink Rose. Harper beamed at him, then she turned the can partially upside down before pressing the nozzle. Whipped cream shot out, some of it going on her ice cream, and some of it going on her shirt. Wide-eyed, she looked from Hank to Mary and back to Hank. I spilled. That's okay, 
Hank said. Then to Mary's delight, he jumped right in to clean her up. Once he'd wiped off her shirt, he sprayed more whipped cream on her ice cream, not stopping until she'd said it was enough. Are you going to be able to eat all that? Mary asked her. Harper shrugged. I don't know. Chuckling, Mary said, just eat what you want. You don't have to eat all of it. She looked at Hank to see if he would contradict her, but he nodded. He handed her an empty dish, then pointed to the large bowl of fruit salad. Help yourself. Using the serving spoon, she scooped out a small portion. I hope you didn't make this just for me. He chuckled. Mrs. Stillman's the one who made it, and contrary to what a lot of people might think, football players actually try to eat healthy foods, not just fill up on carbs. To emphasize that, he scooped out a generous helping of fruit and dug in. Mary had never given a thought to what football players did or didn't eat, but she didn't want to puncture Hank's ego by pointing that out. As the meal drew to a close, Mary became more and more nervous. Soon, she and Hank would be alone, no harper to distract them. How would it feel to have his attention concentrated 100% on her? As she imagined it, her heart began to pound. Forcing herself to focus on Harper, she pushed down thoughts of Hank and her growing attraction. Chapter 6 I miss my mommy, Harper said with a frown as Mary helped her into her pajamas. She said she would FaceTime you tonight, Mary said. I'll text her and let her know you're ready. A slight smile lifted Harper's lips. Okay. Mary sent a quick text to London, and a few minutes later her phone rang. It's your mommy, Harper. Harper smiled as Mary started the FaceTime session and handed her the phone. Hi, baby girl, Mary could hear London say. Mary half listened to the conversation until Harper handed her the phone. Mommy wants to talk to you. Okay, go brush your teeth while I talk to her. Harper skipped off to the bathroom while Mary greeted London. How's everything going? London asked, her face filling the screen. Just fine. Harper seems quite at home here, so that's good. I'm glad to hear it. London's lips pursed. How did things go with Hank? Mary wasn't sure what she was really asking. Uh, fine. Harper was excited to see him, and he's been really sweet with her. London nodded. Good. She paused a moment. My flight is early in the morning, but I'll FaceTime Harper each night before she goes to bed. I'll be eight hours ahead of you, but I'll do my best to make it work. She'll love that, Mary said. A wistful expression came over London's face. I will too. She's my world, you know. Mary knew that. She'd seen how hands-on London was with Harper, how close the two of them were. I know. All right, London said. Take care, and I'll talk to you soon. Mary put the phone away and helped Harper finish getting ready for bed. A few minutes later, there was a knock on Harper's bedroom door. Harper raced to the door and flung it open. Daddy! He swept her into his arms. I came to tuck you in. Harper threw her arms around his neck and snuggled against him. Mary smiled in approval, then said, Good night, Princess Pink Rose. I'll be in my room if you need me. Good night, Mary. She walked out of Harper's room and went to hers, wondering if Hank still wanted to talk to her. When a knock sounded on her door ten minutes later, she had her answer. Inhaling deeply, Mary crossed the room, then slowly exhaled before opening the door to find Hank standing on the other side. Every time she saw him, she was drawn to him. He was more handsome in person than he was in his online pictures, and after seeing him with Harper, how sweet he was with her, Mary knew she could easily become smitten, not something she wanted to happen, not with him being London's ex-husband. Mary had really grown to like and respect London, and she didn't want to do something that would damage the relationship she had with her, especially if that would mean losing her job. Controlling her heart was critical. Mary waited for Hank to say something, but he just stood in the doorway, quietly appraising her, and she wondered what he was thinking. If Mary wasn't Harper's nanny, Hank thought, he would have liked to go out with her. Too bad she was off limits. Trying to get a read on her, he studied her face. As a running back for the Sacramento Vipers, he'd gotten pretty good at reading the other players' body language, 
and as he looked at the way Mary held herself so stiff while she chewed on her lower lip, the only emotion he read was nervousness. What was she nervous about? Was she worried about the conversation they were about to have? He didn't plan to interrogate her. At least, not too harshly. I'd like to give you a tour of the house. Maybe that would put her at ease before they sat down for a chat. Okay. He motioned toward the hallway, and she walked out of her room. There was that fresh floral scent again. What was it? He had no idea, but he liked it. Besides your room and Harper's, there's another guest bedroom up here, and my room is at the other end of the hall. She nodded. He gestured toward the stairs, then followed her down to the cozy sitting area where the stairs ended. He showed her where his office was, as well as a small home gym. You're welcome to use the gym, he said, wanting her to feel at home. Thanks. Next, he led her into the large family room, which was open to the kitchen and a less formal dining area. Don't hesitate to get what you need from the kitchen. As the tour progressed, Mary seemed to relax. Let's go out back, he said, before flipping a switch. The backyard lit up, and he walked out the door and toward the pool. As you probably know, Harper is a good little swimmer, but we still need to be careful around the pool. Of course. He looked toward a large grassy area and pointed out a playset. She loves to play out here. Then he motioned toward a structure a short distance away. That building over there is a game room. Not much Harper would want to do in there. He smiled at her. That's the basic tour. Feel free to explore while you're here. He turned toward the house, then faced her. Let's have that talk now. Mary immediately tensed up, but Hank ignored that and led the way to a covered sitting area. Chapter 7 The distraction of the tour had calmed Mary's nerves, but now Hank's attention would be focused completely on her. The man was hot beyond belief, and Mary couldn't deny her growing attraction, but if she wanted to keep this job, she would have to. Mary walked with Hank to an inviting sitting area. It was near where they'd had dinner, and she remembered the way he'd abruptly ended their conversation when she'd asked him about his education. Was he sensitive about that? She knew he'd been drafted into the NFL while he was just a college sophomore, that he hadn't completed his degree. That was nothing to be embarrassed about, even if a job in a silly game like football was what had stopped his forward momentum. They sat in adjacent chairs, and she braced herself for his questions. How are you settling in? he asked. Reminding herself that this wasn't a date, that it was more like a job interview, something she could handle, she felt her confidence grow. It's beautiful here, and I can tell Harper's happy. A slow smile lifted his lips. That's not what I asked you. The sexy way he smiled made this job interview feel much more personal. I'm settling in fine, and once I get more familiar with everything, I'm sure I'll feel right at home. Hank's eyes were steady on her, making the butterflies in her belly come to life. She needed to turn her mind away from thinking about how hot he was, how sweet he was with Harper, how much she was attracted to him. Enough, she thought. Focus. Earlier, he began, we started to talk about your qualifications. You said you have an art history degree. That's completely unrelated to taking care of children, so what led you to become a nanny? This was better, she thought. Focus on the job. Only the job. Not on how hot Harper's father is. Focus. Mary tossed her hair over her shoulder as she desperately turned her mind to the question he'd asked. It was kind of a fluke, actually. I'd finished school and was looking for a job when my father, who's an attorney, told me one of his clients was looking to hire a nanny. He suggested I apply, and since I've always loved children, I thought it was a great idea. She shrugged. She was the mother of the twin boys. As Mary spoke, Hank tried not to get distracted by the fullness of her lips, or the way her eyebrows lifted when she was emphasizing a point. But it was difficult, and out of the blue, he wondered what it would feel like to have those lips pressed against his. No, he thought. No, no, no. Stop that line of thinking right now. She's your daughter's nanny, not some groupie looking to get close to you. She'll be living under the same roof as you. 
show a little mental restraint. To embarrass you, she was saying. Hank had completely missed what she'd said, and he couldn't begin to guess what she was talking about. Scrambling, he said, Embarrass me? Yeah, when I asked about your education. Oh, he thought, at dinner, right. You didn't embarrass me. Well, maybe she had a little, but he wasn't about to admit that. Those shapely eyebrows rose. All right. Now those lovely lips tilted into a smile. I just, when you abruptly ended the conversation, I just thought. He shook his head, not only to deny her point, but also to clear his mind from the distraction of her beauty. No, I thought it would be better to have this discussion in private. There were other things he would like to do with her in private, but he shoved those inappropriate thoughts aside. She tucked her hair behind her ear. She missed a few strands, and Hank had to resist the urge to reach out and tuck those tawny strands behind her ear as well. He needed to get this conversation back on track. Tell me, Mary, where do you see yourself in five years? Her forehead creased, and she bit her lip. Had she never thought about her future? His life had been centered on football. Even as a kid, he'd been shooting for a spot in the NFL. Then again, not everyone was as hyper-focused as he was. No idea? he asked. Or maybe her future had nothing to do with being a nanny, and she didn't want to admit that. A soft blush rose on her cheeks, giving her skin a lovely glow, and Hank's fingers itched to trace the smooth skin along her jaw. Get a grip, he thought, and think about the question you asked her. He waited for her reply, wondering what was going on in that head of hers. Mary knew exactly where she wanted to be in five years, painting all day, displaying her works in galleries, earning a living from her art. Did she want to admit that? It was one thing to say she loved to paint, that she had a passion for it, but to tell Hank— a man who had achieved so much, a man she just met, that she thought people would actually pay for her work, that she had the talent to paint for a living. She wasn't sure she was ready to admit that. Then again, she didn't want to pretend like she had no ambition, because that wasn't true at all. Come on, Mary, you must have an idea. The way he goaded her made her pride kick in. Her work was good enough. If she didn't believe it, who would? I know exactly where I want to be in five years. His eyes widened like he was surprised at the vehemence in her tone. Okay, let's hear it. Gathering her courage, she pursed her lips. In five years, I hope to see my paintings hanging in art galleries. Hank's head tilted. You paint, huh? Pleased by his interest, Mary smiled. Yes, I've been teaching Harper how to paint, and she loves it. Really? I'd love to see her paintings. He grinned. Yours, too. Her cheeks heated. Not sure she was ready to show her work to him, she hedged. I don't have anything with me, but once Harper puts brush to canvas, I'm sure she would love to show off her work to you. His green-eyed gaze was steady on her, making her shift in her seat. What about your work? I guess so. And maybe she actually would show him when she'd completed something. Now that they were talking about painting, it was a good time to address a concern she had. Do you have a bright space where Harper and I could set up our art studio? During the tour, she hadn't seen any particular place that had the kind of space and light she'd hoped for. Art studio? Why did he make it sound silly? Football was silly. Art was not. Yes, a place where we can paint. We need lots of light. I'm sure we can figure something out. She appreciated his willingness to accommodate her, especially since he didn't seem to understand how serious she was about her work. Thank you. Hank had never been into art. Sports were his passion, particularly football. But he understood passion, and Mary obviously had it for painting. He liked that. He also liked that she was teaching Harper, another star in Mary's column. In fact, all he'd given her were stars. He hadn't found anything about her he didn't like, and his confidence in her ability to care for Harper had grown, as had his attraction to her. 
She kept her focus on him, waiting for him to ask more questions, but he'd heard enough. His gut told him she was the right person for the job, and Harper clearly adored her, which is why he had to keep their relationship strictly professional. If London got wind that he had a thing for the nanny, he was sure she would fire her. He didn't want that, not for Harper, not for Mary, and truth be told, not for himself. Thank you for meeting with me, Mary. Are we done? The look of surprise on her face made him smile. Yep, unless you had questions for me. Uh, no, I don't think so. But if I think of any... Yeah, feel free to ask. He paused and said, I leave by 6.30 most mornings, and I get home anywhere from 4 o'clock to 7, and I'm gone nearly every day. Wow, you work a lot. Contrary to what people think, playing professional football is time-intensive. What do you do all day? Her interest seemed genuine, which pleased him. Meetings to go over game plans, workouts, more meetings, more workouts, practices. One side of his mouth tilted up. It never ends. Well, I'm sure Harper and I will find plenty to do. Perfect. And Mrs. Stillman will be around if you need anything. The most important thing was that Harper was happy and well taken care of, but to Hank's surprise, it had become important to him that Mary enjoyed her stay at his house. He stood, and she did as well. That floral scent drifted off of her and straight into his senses, slightly intoxicating him. Trying to be subtle as he inhaled it, he paused a moment before saying, It was good talking to you, Mary. I'm sure I'll see you tomorrow evening and for the first time in a long time, he knew he would be eager to come home after a long day of football. Chapter 8 Hire! Harper squealed as Mary pushed her on the swing in Hank's backyard. It was early afternoon, and after a busy morning playing with dolls, it felt good to be outside. The September day was getting warm, and Mary was about ready to suggest they go for a swim. Pushing Harper in the swing, Mary let her mind wander to Hank in their conversation the night before. Though it had started as all business, when it had veered into more personal things, Mary had surprised herself with the way she'd opened up to him, exposing her innermost desire. What had made her do that? Had she been trying to impress him? Had she felt a need to show there was more to her than being Harper's nanny? Why did she care what he thought anyway? And why was she spending so much time analyzing her feelings for him? I'm hot, Harper said. Can we go in the pool? Yes, I think that's a fabulous idea. She helped Harper out of the swing, and fifteen minutes later they were changed into their suits, slathered with sunscreen, and climbing into the cool, clear water. With floaties on her arms, Harper swam with confidence, but Mary stayed right beside her. Doesn't this feel wonderful? Mary asked as she treaded water. I like it, Harper said with a big smile. Me too. London had an enormous pool, which they used quite a bit, but Mary liked the intimate feel of Hank's pool. It was still plenty big, but with the trees around the edges of the tiled area, it felt cozy. If only Hank were here, it would be even better. The thought took Mary by surprise, but it shouldn't have. He'd been on her mind all day. Does your daddy like to swim? She asked Harper. I don't know. Harper kicked her feet as she swam, splashing water in all directions. Don't you swim with him when you come? Yes. Holding back a laugh, Mary tickled Harper's feet. Then he probably likes it. Harper giggled. Maybe he'll come swimming with us sometime, Mary murmured, imagining how he looked in his swim trunks. Six-pack abs, powerful biceps, sculpted chest. Yes, that would be fun. Then she remembered him telling her he wouldn't be home until seven, and after a twelve-hour day, he would undoubtedly be tired, especially with all the physical demands his workouts and practices surely required. And going over all the new plays? That would be mentally exhausting as well. Maybe football wasn't as silly as she'd always believed. Hank pulled into his driveway, sore and exhausted, but when an image of Harper, and Mary, filled his mind, his energy renewed. 
He went inside, and when he heard laughter coming from the sitting room, his heart warmed. Smiling, he strode into the sitting room where he found Mary and Harper on the floor in front of the coffee table, a board game between them. That looks like fun, he said. Daddy, Harper squealed when she saw him, leaping to her feet and flinging herself at him. He swung her into his arms and snuggled her against him. Then his eyes cut to Mary, who was watching him with a soft smile. He almost hated to admit how many times she had popped into his head that day. More than Simone had. That wasn't good. But knowing it wasn't good didn't change the fact that it had happened. Repeatedly. Forcing his mind away from the intriguing and beautiful nanny, Hank turned his attention to Harper. He set her down. What did you do today, little Miss Princess Pink Rose? She giggled. I played on the swing and there was a bee, but it didn't sting me. He smiled. I'm glad to hear that. We swimmed in the pool, the bee didn't come, and now we're playing Candyland. Wanna play too? An image of Mary in a revealing bikini jumped into his mind, and without meaning to, he looked at her again. Yes, she said. Join us. At that moment, there was nothing he wanted more. Give me a few minutes, and then I'll join your next game. Yay! Harper squealed. Ten minutes later, he was sitting beside Harper on the floor in front of the coffee table, Mary across from them. You be the blue guy, Harper instructed, as she placed his game piece at the beginning of the colorful path on the game board. Who goes first? Her face lit up. You do, Daddy. Chuckling, he asked, how do I play? Harper tilted her head like she couldn't believe he didn't know this, and Hank glanced at Mary, who was clearly suppressing a laugh. You pick a card, Harper said. Hank did as instructed, and saw a card with two purple squares. Now what? He'd never taken the time to play a board game with Harper before, but he could see he'd missed out. There are two squares, Daddy, so you have to go to one purple square, and then another one, right, Mary? She looked to Mary for confirmation. Mary nodded. That's right. Watching Hank play with Harper was beyond adorable, and it endeared him to her even more. Why did he have to be such a great dad on top of being so hot? Resisting him was going to be harder than Mary had thought. Then again, why did she think she needed to worry about resisting him? He was Harper's father, not to mention London's ex-husband, not a man she was dating or would even have the opportunity to date. She needed to get over herself and focus on why she was in Hank Parsons' house. Your turn, Mary, Harper said. Her mind had been wandering, and when she glanced at Hank, he seemed to be studying her. Heat rose to her cheeks. Why was he looking at her like that? Harper's last nanny had never grabbed Hank's attention like Mary did. As he watched Mary take her turn, he analyzed this unexpected attraction he had to her. Not only was she physically alluring, lovely gray eyes, perfectly shaped eyebrows, kissable lips, fit body, but there was something about her that captivated him as well. Her sweet way with Harper, her dedication to her job, her passion for painting— which reminded him. Mary? Her gaze flew to him, her eyes wide and questioning, the innocence there capturing his attention fully. Yes? We need to talk about a space for you and Harper to set up your painting area. What did you call it? Your art studio? Rosy lips lifting into a bright smile, she nodded. Yes, we'd love a sunny space to paint. She smiled at Harper. Wouldn't we? Uh-huh, Harper said as she fiddled with a stack of cards. Fairly certain painting wasn't as important to Harper as Mary made it sound. He was still fine with giving them a place to work. Having Harper learn to paint seemed like a good thing. Still, he wanted to gauge Harper's interest. Do you like to paint Harper? She looked at him and nodded. It's important for her to express her creative side, Mary said. He didn't doubt that, but that didn't mean he couldn't question Harper about it. He turned to Harper. What else do you like to do besides paint? I like to go on the swing, and I like to swim. Before he could reply, she said, It's your turn, Daddy. Oops, I wasn't paying attention. He took his turn, and as Harper and Mary took theirs, 
he had the astounding sense that the three of them were like a family, which was strange because he'd never felt that way with Simone. Then again, Simone had barely met Harper, whereas Mary was an integral part of Harper's life. He shouldn't fantasize about things that could never be, even if deep within himself he could see the possibilities. Chapter 9 I don't want to play anymore, Harper said, once they finished their game of Candyland. Mary wasn't surprised. They'd been playing for a good half hour before Hank had joined them. I know what we can do, Hank said. Harper pushed her long blonde hair behind her ears. What? Hank looked at Mary, making her heart do a little flip. Let's figure out where your art studio is going to be. Thrilled that he was taking the initiative, Mary smiled. I think that's a fabulous idea. Hank grinned. I thought you might. He stood, and Mary stood as well. Then Harper leapt to her feet and slid her hand into Hank's. Warmed by the sight, Mary followed the pair toward the French doors that led to the backyard. It's outside? Harper asked, her little face gazing up at Hank. Yep. He opened a French door and stepped outside, stopping and turning to Mary. Wondering where this art studio was going to be, Mary crossed the threshold and stopped beside him, noticing how big and strong he was, how masculine. And when he looked at her, those eyes appraising, she attempted to squelch the attraction that bubbled to the surface. She failed miserably. Even though London had warned her that he was charming but selfish, she had yet to see the selfish side. In the short time she'd known him, all she'd seen was a man who worked hard and loved his daughter, an extremely attractive man whose very presence made her sit up and take notice. The game room should work as an art studio, he said as he looked at her. Let's check it out and see what you think. Using all her self-discipline to rein in her feelings, she nodded. Okay. The sun had set, but he turned on the exterior lights, and as he walked past the pool and across a large patio area to the building he'd pointed out on their tour the night before, Mary couldn't help but think how romantic this setting was. Too bad this time with Hank had no romantic undertones. Here we are, he said, as he opened a door and flipped on the lights. You can't tell now, but during the day there's lots of light in here. Mary looked around the spacious room. Large windows lined two walls, and though there was a pool table, a ping-pong table, and an air hockey table in the room, there was still plenty of open space as well. This would make a perfect art studio. Thrilled, she turned to Hank with a smile. Where do you want us to set up? Hank could see that Mary was pleased with his idea to use his game room as an art studio. Glad he'd been able to accommodate her, he shrugged. Wherever you'd like. She slowly turned in a circle, and when she faced him again, enthusiasm was written all over her face. We could even use the space outside. Sounds good to me. He had no idea what an art studio would be like. Do you need any supplies? I brought most of what we need, but an easel for Harper would be great. He took his wallet out of his pocket and removed some cash, then handed it to her. You can get what you need tomorrow. He paused. You mentioned yesterday that you have your driver's license. She laughed. I'm from Los Angeles. Of course I do. He smiled. <laughs> Never know. You can take the SUV. Mrs. Stillman knows where the keys are. Great. Thank you. Smiling at Harper, who was playing with a ping-pong paddle, Hank said, What are you doing, Princess Pink Rose? She turned to him. Can we play ping-pong? It's time for bed, but I can play with you when I get home tomorrow. Okay. Her voice was resigned. Chuckling, he turned to Mary. Tomorrow I'll be home for dinner, but on Saturday I'll be heading out of town for our first game, and I won't be back until Sunday night. Do you ever get time off? How much did she know about football? Not a whole lot, it seemed. Officially, Tuesday is our day off, but I work out and study game film. But if we win our game on Sunday, then Monday we have a shorter day, just some workouts and such. His lips lifted in a half smile. So, in answer to your question, I don't get a whole lot of time off, not during the season at least. At the look of surprise on her face, he added, It's intense. 
but I love it. Mary admired Hank's dedication. Then again, for him to achieve the level he had, he would have to be dedicated, like insanely dedicated, which made the time he spent with Harper, the way he was so sweet with her, all the more meaningful. You have a game this Sunday, right? Yeah. Then he chuckled. Have you ever watched an NFL game? Not wanting to admit the truth, she knew she couldn't hide it. Uh, no. One of his eyebrows quirked up. Not even with your dad? He was too busy working to watch sports. Huh. At the look of true astonishment on his face, Mary laughed. Not all men are into sports, you know. I know. It's just not what I'm used to. What uh, channel will it be on? His head tilted in question. You're going to watch my game? Shyly smiling, she nodded. I think I should, don't you? To her surprise, she wanted to watch it. Uh, yeah, I do. Then I will. When he smiled, his focus completely on her, Mary's pulse skyrocketed. He told her the channel, then said, I'll be curious to hear your thoughts. How will I know which player is you? Had she just admitted that she would be closely watching him? He rushed to her face. Look for number 31. Then his eyebrows rose. I'm the one the quarterback hands the ball to, although sometimes he throws it to me. His eyes narrowed. Do you know which player's the quarterback? Mary had been to a few football games in college, so she could answer with certainty. Yes. Okay, then you should be fine. The look on his face showed he was unsure if he really believed that, but she didn't care. All she cared about was that he knew she was interested. Wait, interested in what? In him, she thought. Admit it, girl, you think he's incredibly hot. Frantic to turn her thoughts in another direction, she asked, Is it okay if Harper watches the game with me? Hank looked at Harper, then back at Mary. I doubt she'd be interested, but if she wants to watch, that's fine. Great. He loved the idea of Mary watching him play, especially since she hadn't watched an NFL game before. Though he wanted to impress her, he would have to put all thoughts of her out of his head while he was playing. That wouldn't be difficult. When he was playing, he was hyper-focused. But knowing she would be watching sent an unexpected thrill through him. Not wanting to think too hard why that was, he said, All right, it's time for Princess Pinkrose to go to bed. That's right, Mary said. Then she smiled at him. Tomorrow we'll set up our art studio, and when you get home you can see how it looks. I will. After he tucked Harper in, Hank went into his bedroom to call Simone. It wasn't that he necessarily wanted to talk to her just then, but he was desperate to try to cleanse Mary from his mind. Maybe if he spoke to Simone, he would be able to get himself back on track, to put Mary in her proper place within his head, to forget the way her gray eyes seemed to glow when she talked about painting, or the tender way she was with Harper, or the soft curve of her jaw, or the way her rosy red lips begged to be kissed, or... He had to stop. He had to relegate her to the role of Harper's nanny, nothing more. How was your day? he asked Simone after their initial greeting. Same as usual, talking to designers, placing orders, fixing all the screw-ups. Simone was a buyer for a major department store. Sounds like fun. Hank stretched out on his bed and stared at the ceiling. You know what would be more fun? Her voice had dropped to a deep, sexy tone. What? Spending time with you. You're done early tomorrow, right? Let's go out and have a good time. Forget the stress of the week. It would be fun to go out with Simone, but his priority was Harper. My daughter's in town. She'll be here for the next few weeks. That's great, Hank. I know how much she means to you. She paused. We could go somewhere after she goes to bed. Maybe that's what he needed. Time with Simone. Time playing. That would work. I'll pick you up at nine. Ooh, she purred. I look forward to it. They chatted about other things, and as Hank disconnected the call, it wasn't an image of Simone that filled his mind. Instead, Mary's face, sweet and smiling, was the only thing he could see. Chapter 10 
I want to paint a flower, Harper said the next day, as Mary set up a small easel for her. They'd gone to a nearby craft store and bought a few supplies, including a child-sized easel. Mary set the small tubs of paint in their holders. I think that's a great idea. What color are you going to paint it? Pink! Softly laughing, Mary pulled a blank sheet of paper from the roller and attached it to the bottom. <laughs> of course you are. She stepped back and looked at the space. Just like Hank had said, during the day the room was flooded with sunlight. It was perfect for an art studio. Mary had set up Harper's easel in a corner away from the ping pong table. She didn't want it to get knocked over when Hank and Harper played later that day. Thinking about Hank coming home and hanging out with them, Mary smiled. She looked forward to it. But maybe Hank wanted time alone with Harper. Why would he want Mary hanging around all the time? She would offer to give them time without her, although secretly she hoped he would suggest she join them. Later that afternoon, soon after Harper had finished her third painting, Hank walked into their makeshift art studio. Hard at work, I see. Mary turned to him, her heart fluttering to see him in his jeans and a t-shirt that emphasized his ripped chest, flat abs, and muscular biceps. Your daughter's a natural, she said pointing to the paintings that she'd hung on a line to dry. Harper ran to him and flung herself into his arms. Mary had the absurd idea that she would like to do the same. Blinking away the image did nothing to cool the heat that raced through her body at the thought. Wow, Harper, Hank said, as he held her in his arms and perused her paintings. These are beautiful. Can I hang one in my office? Harper nodded with enthusiasm, her eyes wide. Which one should I pick? Seeing the way he was with her, Mary felt her heart contract with warmth and powerful attraction. Each and every time she saw him, he never failed to pull her in with his magnetism. His sweet daddy ways, his handsome face, his amazingly athletic body. She had to cool it, pronto. Harper pressed her lips together as she looked at the three paintings, then her finger shot out as she pointed to the painting of a bright pink flower with deep green leaves underneath it and a yellow sun at the top. That one! Is that your favorite? She nodded. It's my favorite, too. When it's dry, I'll hang it in my office. He turned to Mary. I'd love to see something you painted. I, uh, I haven't painted anything yet. His head tilted in question. Why not? I, uh, I didn't bring an easel. Why didn't you buy one when you got Harper's? She shook her head. I didn't want to use your money on me. She reached into her pocket. Here's your change, by the way. He held up his hand. Use it to get yourself an easel. That wasn't something she was going to do. She set the money on the counter. No, thank you, though. He studied her. Then Harper said, Can we play ping pong? Hank set her down. Sure. That was Mary's cue to give them father-daughter time. If it's all right, she said, I'm going to excuse myself, but if you need me, let me know. Hank appraised her, then rubbed the back of his neck. You're welcome to stay, Mary. Hearing her name coming from his mouth, like it was something he enjoyed tasting, made her want to stay. But she feared he was only inviting her to be polite. I just, I want to give you and Harper time alone. His eyes didn't waver from her face. I'd like you to stay. Mary's heart leapt with excitement. He wanted her there. Even so, she shouldn't read too much into it. He probably wanted her there to handle any issues with Harper. That was all. Don't forget, she thought, you're the nanny. Don't think you can be anything more. Tamping down the thrill she'd felt seconds earlier, she smiled. All right? Hank was glad she'd agreed to stay. Normally, he loved his alone time with Harper, but the thought of not having Mary there when she could be with them seemed silly. More than silly, it would be senseless. He liked having her there, and Harper certainly liked having her there. Of course she should stay. Are you any good at ping pong? He asked her with a grin. I haven't played before. What? Did this woman do any kind of sport? She laughed. How hard could it be? He turned to Harper, who had already picked up a paddle. We're going to have to teach your nanny how to play ping pong. 
Harper giggled. There it was, the reminder of who she was to him, Harper's nanny. Well, it was true, wasn't it? That's all she was, nothing more. Disappointment rocked her, but she pushed a cheerful smile onto her face. I teach her, Harper said, as she raced around to one side of the ping-pong table, her eyes the only thing visible. I can't see. Hank laughed, then he brought a chair to where Harper stood. Stand on this, Princess Pink Rose. Harper giggled as Hank lifted her into place. If you'll stand behind her, Mary, he said with a grin, we'll show you how this is done. Mary got in position behind Harper to keep her from falling off of the chair. Hank gently hit the ball to Harper. Harper missed, so Hank hit a new ball to her. She missed again. How about you hit it to me, he said to Harper. Okay. Harper tried to copy what Hank had done, dropping the ball on the table and hitting it with a paddle, but couldn't quite make it happen. Do you want me to help you? Mary offered. I want Daddy to do it. I have an idea, Hank said. He folded the table so that one half was vertical while the other was flat. Then he came around to stand behind Harper. Mary stepped out of the way and watched as Hank wrapped his hand around Harper's and helped her hit the ball against the vertical side of the table. Good job. They did this for several minutes. I want to paint, Harper said. Hank laughed. Okay, you paint while Mary and I play ping pong. Harper jumped down from the chair and scampered to the easel, where she picked up a brush and began a fresh painting. Mary watched her, and when she turned back to Hank, he was putting the table back to its original position. Here you go, he said, as he handed her a paddle. She took it from him and got into position on her side of the table. Ready? he asked with a grin. Chapter 11 Nerves slid through Mary. She wanted to impress Hank, but she hadn't played ping-pong before. He served the ball. She swung her paddle and connected. Proud of herself, she smiled, but when he immediately hit it back in her direction and she missed, her smile vanished. Hank laughed. I can't believe you missed that. Mary shrugged. Like I told you, I haven't played before. That's one point for me. He served again and Mary hit it back. He returned, and she hit it again. Then he returned the ball, and she missed. 2-0. The smile on his face showed how proud he was that he was winning. Mary shouldn't have been surprised. Obviously, he had a competitive streak. Being in the NFL would require a competitive nature. Good thing she didn't care one way or the other. Your turn to serve. Mary tossed the ball up slightly, and after it bounced on the table in front of her, she hit it. Hank immediately returned it. It didn't take long before the score was 8-0. to zero. Then it was 11-0. to zero. Do you want to play again? he asked. You mean, she said with a tilt to her lips, do I want to get slaughtered? He chuckled. We could do something else. Maybe a game of pool? Mary's experience with pool was about the same as it was with ping pong, but she was having fun, and she didn't care about winning. She looked at Harper, who was happily painting, then she turned back to Hank. Sure. Rubbing his hands together, Hank smiled. All right. Mary watched as Hank set up the table, corralling all the balls in the triangle. He put the triangle aside and handed her a pool cue. Though Mary had never played pool herself, she had watched others play, so she had a basic idea of how it worked. I'll break, he said as he chalked his cue. He lined up his shot and hit the white ball. The ball shot in all directions, but one solid ball rolled into a nearby pocket. Looks like I'm solids and you're stripes. As he lined up his next shot, Mary admired his form, not to mention his amazingly fit body. The way he was good at these games was sexy too. She just hoped he wouldn't be too turned off by her lack of skill. Then she reminded herself that she was merely the nanny, he was playing with her because she was the only adult in the room, not because he had any romantic interest in her. She needed to enjoy herself while it lasted. Soon enough, she and Harper would go back to Los Angeles. Hank hit another ball into a pocket. He resisted calling his shots. No need to show off, 
even though he was tempted to. Then he hit another one in. On his next try, the ball bounced off the cushion and didn't go into a pocket. Your turn, he said to Mary, curious to see how she would do. If her skill at ping pong was any indication, he might have to help her. The thought made him smile. Here we go, Mary thought. She chalked her cue, taking her time, giving her heart a chance to settle into a normal rhythm. Knowing Hank was watching her didn't help. Holding the cue with her right hand, she tried to rest the narrow end on her left fingers the way Hank had done, but it didn't feel natural, and as she lined up her shot, she knew she was only going to embarrass herself. Hesitating, she bit her lip and glanced at him. His gaze was lasered in on her, and at the look in his eye, heat burst through her. Why was he looking at her like that, like she was the only thing of interest in the room? It thrilled her, but it also made her more nervous. Do you want me to help you? A million thoughts raced through her head. If he helped her, she would do better, but what would helping her entail? Maybe she wanted to show him she could do this on her own, but since she'd never played pool before, chances were good that she would make a fool of herself. But if she ripped the felt on his pool table in her attempt to impress him, that would be even worse. She straightened and turned to him. Yeah. He slowly smiled as he sauntered over to where she stood. When he held out his hand, she gave him the pool cue. Hold the cue like this. He bent over the table and showed her how to position her left hand. He made it look so easy. Straightening, he handed her the cue. You try it. She bent over the table and set the cue on her fingers, but it still didn't feel quite right. He chuckled behind her. You're too dense, Mary. That's because he was standing so close to her, watching her. Suddenly, he was all around her, his body pressed against hers as he leaned over her, his right hand covering hers. With a sudden intake of breath, she told herself to calm down. He was just trying to help her. Like this, Marigold. His voice was low and deep in her ear as his left hand adjusted the fingers on her left hand into the proper position, and hearing him use her full name as he was pressed against her made her heart thunder with longing. What was he doing, Hank wondered. This felt fantastic, but dang, he was going too far. He needed to take a step back, a giant step, maybe all the way out the door and into a cold shower, but he couldn't make himself do it. The scent of flowers was all around him, and her body was soft and pliable as he adjusted the fingers on her left hand. He liked this. With a glance at Harper to make sure she was still occupied with painting, he focused back on Mary. That was a mistake. The pulse by her throat was visible, and he desperately fought the overwhelming desire to press his lips to her throat and work his way to her mouth. Knowing this was getting way, way out of hand, he stepped back. Try it now, he said, his voice husky. Okay, she murmured, and then she used her cue to hit the cue ball. It gently hit a striped ball, which rolled a few inches and stopped. Mary turned and looked at him, her gray eyes watching him, her face alluring. I guess it's your turn. He nodded. Mrs. Stillman walked into the room. Dinner will be ready in five minutes, Hank. Where would you like to eat? Thank goodness, a distraction. Outside. Very good. Then she turned and walked away. Time for dinner, Harper, he said, forcing his eyes away from Mary and to his daughter. Let's wash up. Now he just had to get through dinner with Mary, and then after Harper went to bed, he would go out with Simone. He only hoped that would cure him of this insane attraction to Mary. Chapter 12 Mary helped Harper into her pajamas, her mind on Hank. Dinner had given her a chance to gather herself. He'd kept his attention on Harper, and as she'd watched him interact with his daughter— she thought about the way it had felt when he'd pressed against her while showing her how to play pool. She fantasized that he would invite her to play pool again, maybe after Harper went to bed. The idea thrilled her, and she kept waiting, and hoping, so desperately hoping, that he would suggest it. But they finished dinner without him saying a word about that. 
The only thing he'd promised was that he would come upstairs and tuck Harper in when she was ready for bed. In fact, he'd said he needed to work in his office for a bit, and then he would come up at eight. It was now 7.30. Mary sent London a text to let her know Harper was ready to FaceTime, and a few minutes later, Mary's phone rang. She answered it, and there was London. It was 3.30 in the morning where she was, and she looked tired. Despite that, she was as gorgeous as ever. That's Hank's ex-wife, she thought. Don't forget that. After greeting her, Mary gave the phone to Harper. She half listened to the conversation, her mind refusing to stop thinking about Hank, the way his clothes fit his body, the look on his face when she turned around after trying to hit the ball on the pool table, the way it felt to have him so close to her. Daddy teached Mary how to play pool, she heard Harper telling London. He did? London asked. Yeah, and Mary got a funny look on her face. Oh boy, Mary thought. Harper noticed more than I thought. Let me talk to her, baby girl. Okay, Mommy. Harper handed the phone to Mary, then picked up her favorite doll to finish putting the doll's pajamas on. What's Harper talking about? London asked, her eyes slightly narrowed. We were just hanging out in the game room. Deflect, she thought. Deflect. We set up an art studio out there. You should see the beautiful paintings Harper created. That's great, Mary, but what about playing pool? Hank teaching you. Her head tilted. What did Harper mean you had a funny look on your face? Mary's mind went blank. London's eyebrows shot up. Nothing's going on between the two of you, is it? No, 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 no. Mary forced a laugh. <laughs> this is only my third day. She shook her head. I don't know what Harper's talking about. Probably the embarrassed look I had when I did so bad trying to play pool. London's lips compressed. I don't know why you're playing pool with my ex-husband, Mary. You're there to tend Harper. Nothing more. That's why I hired you. I'd hate to... change our arrangement. The subtle threat was like a slap in the face. I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Like I said, we were just hanging out. Harper was painting, and... There was no point in trying to defend herself. I'm sorry, London. Truly. London smiled. All right. Let me say goodnight to Harper. Mary gave the phone to Harper once more, and after they'd said their goodbyes, Mary ended the call and put the phone away. Read me a story, please, Mary, Harper said. Glad to do something that might take her mind off of Hank, Mary smiled. Which story do you want me to read? Harper went to the small bookshelf tucked in the corner and pulled out her favorite princess story, then carried it back to Mary. They climbed on her bed and snuggled against the pillows as Mary opened the book and began reading. Ten minutes later, a knock sounded at the door. Daddy! Harper squealed as she launched herself off of the bed and toward the door. Then she flung it open and jumped up and down until Hank swept her into his strong arms. Mary watched all this from the bed, her heart pounding and her mind racing. As much as she was attracted to Hank, and she was beyond attracted, she had to squelch it, and squelch it hard. Hank thought Mary looked awfully comfortable sitting on Harper's bed, and he had to suppress the impulse to join her. "'Tuck me in, Daddy,' Harper said, and he tore his gaze away from Mary and focused on his daughter. "'That's why I'm here, Princess Pinkrose.' He carried her to the bed, and Mary climbed off, standing on the opposite side. After pulling back the covers, Hank laid Harper on the sheets. Mary leaned over the bed and pressed a kiss to her forehead. Good night, Harper. See you in the morning. Harper smiled at her. Good night, Mary. Mary threw him a tentative smile, then she left. Watching the door close behind her, he wondered why her expression seemed downcast. Pushing aside his question, he read Harper a story, then tucked her in and left, going into his room to get ready for his date with Simone. Mary was having a hard time getting into the book she was reading. After rereading the same sentence for the fourth time, she gave up, setting her e-reader on the table beside the bed and leaning against the pillows. What had London meant when she'd said she would hate to have to change their arrangement? Would she fire her? Would she make them go back to Los Angeles, even though London was out of the country? Would she do that, just to keep Mary away from Hank? Why was Mary even thinking like that? 
There was nothing between her and Hank. Hank was Harper's father, for heaven's sake, not a romantic prospect. Sighing, Mary threw back the covers and decided to go into the kitchen and get a glass of ice water. Wearing a pair of shorts and a tank top, her face scrubbed clean of makeup, Mary made her way down the stairs and into the kitchen. She took a glass out of the cupboard, went to the refrigerator, then pressed the button to get crushed ice. The machine rumbled as the ice maker crushed the ice and dispensed it into her glass, and then she filled it with water. I wondered who was in here, a voice said behind her. Mary jumped, nearly dropping her glass as she spun around to find Hank standing there, looking incredibly handsome in a green button-up shirt that emphasized his eyes, along with a pair of black slacks. Was he going out? At this hour? Where was he going? Who was he going with? Wait, it was none of her business, but jealousy slammed through her nonetheless, and she had to know. Sorry, he said with a chuckle. I didn't mean to startle you. That's okay. Hank noticed Mary had removed all of her makeup, which made her look 18, but she wasn't anywhere near being a teenager. She was only a few years younger than he was, and even though she wore a simple pair of shorts and a tank top, she was as stunning as ever. More than usual, actually. She looked innocent and vulnerable. He needed to turn his thoughts in another direction, immediately. Her clear-eyed gaze swept over him. Are you going out? Maybe this would be a good time to mention that he was seeing someone. Maybe it would be a step to cool his attraction to her. Yes, Simone and I are going out. I'm sure you'll meet her soon enough. We've been dating for a few months. Had that really been necessary to add? Yes, yes it had been. The open expression on Mary's face dimmed. Or maybe that was his imagination. Oh, well, have fun. I doubt I'll have as much fun as we had in the game room earlier. The thought jumped into his head, taking him by surprise. But he shoved it away quickly and forcefully. Thanks. Good night. She turned and walked away. With his attention going to her retreating body, Hank enjoyed the view. Then he spun around and walked toward the door. Dismay flooded Mary. Hank had a girlfriend. Why was she surprised? A man like him? Undoubtedly, he had to fight them off. Stop, she thought. Just stop. You can't have him anyway. Regardless, when she got into her room, she immediately googled Hank Parson and Simone on her phone and got several hits. Her name was Simone Greenwood, and she was stunning. Tall, slender, blonde, gorgeous. Mary didn't expect anything less, and Hank was going to see her right now. Sliding down in her bed, Mary threw the covers over her head and wallowed in self-pity. She'd finally found a man she could fall for who seemed perfect in every way, but he was unavailable on so many levels. How serious were he and Simone? He'd said they'd been dating several months. Not that it mattered. Even if he was single, he was out of reach. She turned off the light and closed her eyes, but the only image in her mind was Hank Parson. Chapter 13 Mary woke early the next morning, Saturday, her mind immediately going to Hank. Had he already left for the day? Half hoping he had, and half hoping he hadn't, she went into Harper's room. The little girl was still asleep, so Mary showered and got ready, but by the time she was done, Harper had arisen and was no longer in her room. Wanting to make certain Harper was being watched over, Mary hurried down the stairs, and as she rounded the corner into the family room, she crashed right into Hank. Whoa, he said, as he grasped her arms to keep her from falling. Pleasure bounded through her, but when she pictured him with a beautiful Simone, jealousy replaced the pleasure. Where are you going in such a hurry? A smirk curved his mouth. Hungry for breakfast? He released her arms, and for the briefest of moments, she wondered what he would do if she threw her arms around him and kissed him. Scorching heat blazed across her cheeks, and she turned away so he wouldn't see. Just looking for Harper. Hank chuckled. Mrs. Stillman made French toast, Harper's favorite. He glanced toward the kitchen. There's plenty more if you're hungry. Great. The way Mary looked this morning, so fresh and vibrant, 
did something interesting to Hank's heart. When he'd caught her to keep her from falling, he'd wanted to drag her into his arms, but that would be all kinds of wrong. He thought about his date with Simone the night before. They'd gone dancing, and though he'd enjoyed himself, his mind had kept going to Mary. His plan to use his date with Simone to cleanse Mary from his thoughts hadn't exactly worked. In fact, it had had the opposite effect. He'd kept thinking about playing pool with Mary, wishing she was the one in his arms, the one he was dating. As he looked at her now, and remembered that she was only there because she was taking care of Harper, he knew he had to put an end to his wishful thinking. Good thing he was going out of town for the weekend, that his mind would be fully occupied with football. I'm about to head out, he said. Then with a grin, he added, I'll expect your complete and honest thoughts on the game when I get back. Mary laughed. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Then she tilted her head. My first priority is Harper, don't forget. I may not even be able to watch the game. Now that would be a crying shame. Shaking her head, she smiled. Good luck with everything. Thanks. She turned and walked toward the kitchen, and he watched her go. Then he thought about the little surprise he'd arranged for her and wished he could be there to see her face. A delivery came for you, Mrs. Stillman said to Mary as she sat down to have lunch with Harper. Narrowing her eyes in surprise, Mary said, For me? What is it? Mrs. Stillman smiled and shrugged. There are packages in the entryway. Curious, Mary forced herself to wait until after lunch. Once they finished eating, she turned to Harper. Should we see what came for me? Harper nodded, her eyes wide, then the two of them hurried into the entryway. Boxes of varying sizes were piled on the floor. What could they be? Mary asked. I don't know, Harper said. Let's open them and find out. After grabbing a pair of scissors, Mary opened the largest box and found another box inside, this one clearly labeled as a floor easel. Kind of astonished, when she saw a printed note inside, she pulled it out. It said, Mary, I hope these items will suit your needs. Thanks for all you do, Hank. Beyond thrilled that he would do this for her, her heart soared. He really was a wonderful man. Not a selfish bone in his body, as far as she could tell. What was London talking about? London. Her employer. Hank's ex-wife the woman who had the power to drag her away from here and keep her from ever seeing Hank again. At least as long as she worked for her. And Mary wanted to keep working for her. Joy tempered by reality. Mary opened the other boxes to find a brush holder, large sheets of canvas panels, acrylic paints, and an assortment of brushes. Very good quality brushes. Excited to get started, she asked Harper to help her carry the items to their art studio where they set everything up. They'd spent the morning playing on the swing set, so Mary hoped Harper was ready to spend some time painting. Do you want to paint outside today? We could paint pictures of the trees. And the flowers, Harper said. Yes, and the flowers. As she put brush to canvas, Mary's heart sang with happiness. This was what she loved, and having Hank be so supportive only sweetened the feeling. Harper stood next to her, painting on her own easel. They worked outside, the September day glorious. Chapter 14 The next day, when it was time for Hank's game to start, Mary and Harper snuggled on the couch, bowls of popcorn on their laps, and a tray of veggies and dip on the coffee table. Have you ever watched your daddy on TV before? Mary asked, as a player on the opposing team kicked the ball. She shook her head. Mary kept a sharp eye on the screen as the offense for the Sacramento Vipers took the field. Where was Hank? There he is, Mary shouted, a little too loudly. Harper jumped. Softly laughing, Mary said, sorry, sweetheart. Harper laughed too. I got scared on accident. That made Mary laugh harder. Yes, I startled you. Looking at the TV, Harper asked, where's my daddy? Do you see the numbers three and one on that man? Yes. That's him. He's number 31. I can't see him. I know. It's hard to see his face with his helmet on. But Mary had no trouble recognizing him, and he looked hotter than ever. Sexy and strong and powerful and... 
That's Harper's father, she reminded herself, and London's ex-husband, so stop noticing how hot he is. Knowing that would be impossible, Mary instead tried to focus on the game unfolding before her, and whenever the quarterback, Josh Weisner, handed Hank the ball, she couldn't stop from shouting, Go! 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 When Mary cheered, Harper cheered as well, and when Mary clapped, Harper clapped. The only thing Mary didn't like was seeing Hank get tackled, which happened over and over. But when he made a touchdown, that was about as exciting as it got. The camera zoomed in on him, and she could see the grin under his helmet. When the game was over and the Vipers had won, Mary was beyond eager to give her report to Hank. Okay, she was just beyond eager to see him, to have him standing in front of her. Better yet, to have him standing behind her as he taught her how to play pool. The thought sent a powerful tingle to the tips of her toes. That night, anxious to see Hank, Mary put Harper to bed before carrying her e-reader down to the family room and settling onto the couch. Hopeful he wouldn't be home too late, when she heard the front door open, her heart went into a gallop. Should she greet him at the door, or wait for him to find her? What if he went straight upstairs and never saw her, never knew she was waiting for him? Would it be weird for her to approach him? What if he was too tired to talk? He had to be exhausted. While her mind ran through the possibilities, Hank walked into the kitchen and took a glass out of the cupboard. He hadn't noticed her yet. A large table sat between the family room and the kitchen, so she decided she had better speak up. Great game, she said, and when he spun around, she laughed. His face seemed to light up, which pleased her beyond measure. You watched it, huh? She stood and walked into the kitchen, sliding onto a bar stool. Yep, so did Harper. Hank hadn't expected to see Mary that night. Had she been waiting for him? Of course she had. Hmm, what did that mean? Still on his game-winning high, he grinned as he leaned against the counter, the island between him and Mary. She did? Then he laughed, <laughs> for about five minutes, I'll bet. Mary shook her head. She might have lost interest when you guys were on defense, but she was very interested when you were on the field. How interested had Mary been, he wondered. What did you think of the game? I have to admit, it was a lot more exciting than I expected. She chuckled. <laughs> then again, I'm sure it helped that I was cheering for your team. Just his team? Or him, too? Curious, he wasn't about to ask. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you for the easel and the supplies, she said, a shy smile curving her mouth. That was totally unexpected. You're welcome. Have you put them to use? Most definitely. And will you show me what you painted? I'm not done yet, but when I am, you can see it. He nodded, then down the glass of water he'd poured. What's your schedule tomorrow? Mary asked. I mean, I know Harper will want to see you. He hoped it was more than Harper who wanted to see him. Since we won, it will be a bit easier tomorrow. I'll be home around one thirty. All right. Though he enjoyed this time with her, he was exhausted. I'm beat, but I'll see you in Harper tomorrow. Of course. She climbed off the bar stool. Sorry I kept you. Shaking his head, he smiled. No worries. I enjoy talking to you. He decided to say it. Seeing you tonight was a nice surprise. Really? Mary thought. Thrilled to hear that, Mary's lips lifted into a smile. I just... I had to let you know I enjoyed the game. I'm happy to hear it. Then he walked around the counter and motioned upstairs. Shall we? Blushing furiously at the thought that they were going upstairs together, Mary nodded. What was wrong with her? Both of their bedrooms were upstairs. Why was her mind going in any other direction? When they reached the landing... Hank wished her good night before turning and walking toward his room. Forcing herself not to stare after him, Mary turned in the opposite direction and walked to her room, her mind jumping ahead to the next afternoon when Hank would return. Chapter 15 The next day, after Mary and Harper played outside for a while, they headed to their art studio. Mary helped Harper get started on finger painting, which Harper adored. It's all squishy, she said with a smile, as she ran her paint-soaked fingers all over the sheet of paper laid out on the table. 
What are you painting? Mary asked. It's just colors. Her expression was serious, like this was a great art project. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. Your daddy will love it. Can I play with my daddy today? Picturing Hank's smile and handsome face, Mary grinned. Yes, he'll be home after lunch. Yay! Yay, indeed. Wanting to know the moment Hank got home, after lunch, Mary sat on the couch in the family room with Harper and read to her from a stack of books. Just before two o'clock, he arrived. Harper threw herself at him, and when he flinched as he picked her up, Mary realized that he must be sore from the game. Of course he was. He'd been tackled by huge men multiple times, and not just by one man at a time. It was usually several burly football players taking him down at once. That would absolutely make him sore. Hank was sore all over, just like every Monday after a game. Still, he wouldn't let that stop him from holding his baby girl. He set her down. What do you want to do today? Let's go swimming, Harper sang out. That sounds like fun. Then he looked right at Mary. You'll join us, of course. He didn't want to give her a chance to say no, not only because he would enjoy her company, but because he kind of wanted to, no, definitely wanted to, see her in a bikini. Was that wrong? If it was, he didn't care. Then it occurred to him that maybe she didn't want him to see her in a bikini. How self-absorbed was he? If you want to, he added. Sure, she said with a smile. Glad that was settled, he added. All right, I'll meet you ladies out back in a few minutes. Harper jumped up and down. Yay, Daddy's going swimming with me. Ten minutes later, Hank walked outside. Harper and Mary were already in the pool, floaties on Harper's arms, with Mary right beside her. A sense of comfort settled over him. When Harper was with Mary, she was well taken care of. He had no doubt about that. Hi, Daddy. Look at me. He smiled. I see you. His gaze slid to Mary, who was treading water. All he could see of her bikini was bright orange distorted by the water. He would have to wait. Then he wondered what the heck he was thinking. She was Harper's nanny. How many times did he have to remind himself of that? Shoving aside the interest that had been growing from a simmer to a low boil, he went to the deep end of the pool and dove in, staying under the water as he swam toward Harper and Mary. Not meaning to, as he approached them, his gaze slid over Mary's body, which was clearly visible under the water. He was not disappointed. Tearing his gaze away, he surfaced beside Harper and focused completely on her while he got himself under control. Hank looked beyond amazing in his swim trunks. Ripped chest and abs, wide shoulders, and muscular biceps all on display. Woo! Maybe agreeing to play in the pool with him and Harper wasn't such a good idea after all. Then Mary looked at Harper, who was loving every minute of the attention her father showered upon her. That's what this was all about. She had to stop thinking about herself. This wasn't about her, or about Hank. Both of them were there for Harper. She had to put her attraction aside, especially after her warning from London the other night. Let's play shark, Hank said to Harper. I'll be the shark and you're the fish. Mary will have to help you get away from me. He bared his teeth and growled. Harper screamed with terror and happiness, and Mary grabbed her hands and swam backwards, Hank right behind Harper. Go, Mary, go! The shark's going to get me! I'm coming, Hank said right behind her. Harper screamed again, but her wide smile belied the fear in her voice. I got you, Hank said, as he wrapped his arms around her and held her close. Harper giggled furiously, and Mary hoped he would suggest coming after her next. Heat rushed to her face at the thought. Only a few feet separated her from Hank, and when she remembered the way it had felt to have him right behind her, calling her Marigold, the heat in her face turned blazing hot, and she splashed a bit of water on her cheeks to cool down. Hi, Hank, a female voice called from the edge of the pool. Mary's head snapped in that direction, and she immediately recognized Simone, Tall and slender with blonde hair pulled into a stylish updo, perfectly shaped eyebrows, and thick lashes which emphasized her cornflower blue eyes, Simone was more stunning than she'd been in her online photos. Simone, 
Hank said, a note of surprise in his voice. I had to stop by and congratulate you on your game. As usual, you were fantastic. Mary couldn't miss the pride that slid over Hank's face. It was a good game. Simone's focus went to Harper. Hi, honey. How are you? Harper tucked her head into Hank's neck. Then Simone looked at Mary, her expression less than friendly. You must be the nanny. How did she know that? Oh, yeah. Hank had gone out with her the other night. He must have mentioned that she was there taking care of Harper. Yes, she said. I'm Mary. Simone gave her a tight smile before turning her attention back to Hank. Can I talk to you for a minute? Hank glanced at Mary, wondering what Simone wanted. She didn't usually show up at his house unannounced. He climbed out of the pool, then grabbed a towel and wrapped it around his waist. What's up? he asked. She walked toward the house, most likely so Mary wouldn't be able to overhear, but stopped right outside the door. Standing close to him, she glanced over his shoulder toward the pool before meeting his eyes. Why is the nanny in the pool with you? She ran her finger along his shoulder. Don't you think she should let you and Harper play by yourselves? Did she have a point? Hank asked himself. Was it wrong to let Mary play in the pool with him and Harper? Not sure, he said. I suppose. You should give the poor woman a chance to be by herself. Guilt sliced through him. Mary hadn't had any time off since she'd been there. What was wrong with him? You're right. Simone smiled. Mary couldn't hear what they were saying, but she couldn't miss the way Simone stood so close to Hank, the way she touched his bare chest, the way her body language broadcasted that he belonged to her. Turning her back on them, Mary concentrated on playing with Harper. I'm done swimming, Harper said. Are you sure? Harper nodded. I'm thirsty. Okay, let's dry off and we'll get something cold to drink. She guided Harper to the steps leading out of the pool and helped her climb out. Then she followed. Simone looked her way, and then Hank turned around. Self-conscious in a bright orange bikini, when Mary met Hank's eyes, which showed frank admiration, she bit her lip and quickly wrapped herself in a towel. Dang, Hank thought. Mary looked hot in that bikini. He couldn't tear his eyes away, but when she covered herself with a large towel, Hank managed to break his stare. Something fun, just the three of us. Simone was still talking, but he'd completely miss what she'd said. Facing her, he tried to catch up. Yeah, we can do that. Great, where do you want to go? Tonight? She laughed and touched his chest. Yes, tonight. Tonight we need to celebrate your win. He'd been looking forward to spending time with Mary tonight. That is, Harper and Mary. Then Harper's nanny can have the night off, Simone said. I'm sure she'd like the chance to go out on the town. He pictured her dancing at a club, men hitting on her, dancing with her in their arms. He didn't like it. Tonight won't work, he heard himself say. Disappointment radiated from Simone's face. Why not? She never took no for an answer, at least not at first. I'm still recovering from the game. I don't want to go out tonight. Her head tilted as she smiled. We can hang out here then. The only reason he would be willing to agree would be if Mary wanted the night off. He didn't want to make her work 24-7. Give me a minute, he said. Simone frowned, but he turned and walked over to Mary anyway. All done swimming, Princess Pink Rose? Hank asked as he stopped beside Harper. Mary wondered what he and Simone had been discussing, but she didn't say anything. Harper nodded. Then Hank turned to Mary. How would you like tonight off? That wasn't what she had expected, and not what she wanted either. Not when the other option would most likely be spending time with Hank. Suspecting Simone was behind this, Mary scrambled to come up with an answer that wouldn't give away her true desire. If you want time with Harper, I understand, but I don't have anything else I need to do. His forehead creased. But you haven't had any time off since you've gotten here. I'm fine with that. All I would do is sit in my room by myself. I'd rather hang out with... with Harper. Especially when it meant she was able to be with him, too. And truly, if she wasn't taking care of Harper, she would paint, which she did anyway. No, she was perfectly content with the way things were. Are you sure? 
She smiled. Yes. All right. Never mind then. I'm thirsty, Harper said. Can I have a drink, please? Of course, Mary replied. Then she took her by the hand and led her into the house, all the while wondering what Simone's next move would be. Chapter 16 All of Hank's guilt had been washed away by Mary's sincere answer. He had no doubt that she loved his little Harper, which made her all the more attractive to him. Hank, Simone said, drawing his mind away from Mary and back to her. He walked over to her as a different kind of guilt descended, the kind that said he should tell her there was no reason for her to waste her time with him, that his interest was waning. So? she asked, a bright smile on her perfectly made-up face. Are we on for tonight? We can order in, or Mrs. Stillman can make us one of her specialties, and then we can have a movie night. All of those things sounded fun, but he would prefer doing them with Mary. I'm sorry, Simone. Tonight's not going to work. Her lips formed a little pout, something he used to think was endearing, but now just found annoying. Come on, Hank. It'll be fun. I'm just not up for it. Her lips compressed. It's that nanny, isn't it? Well, yeah, he thought, but he wasn't about to admit that to her. He barely admitted it to himself. What would your ex-wife think about that? You having a thing for the nanny? She shook her head. It's so cliché, Hank. He wasn't sure if Simone and London had any friends in common, but he knew it wouldn't be impossible for her to get in touch with London if she wanted to, and he wouldn't put it past her to get word to London that, indeed, he did have a thing for the nanny. Punishing him for doing something that displeased her was exactly the kind of thing Simone would do. He had to deny it, and deny it hard. I don't have a thing for the nanny, he said. She's great with Harper, no doubt about that. But come on, Simone, she's just a kid, as unsophisticated as they come. I could never be interested in her. She's an artist, for crap's sake, doesn't even like football. He made a scoffing sound in his throat as he shook his head. Believe me, there's nothing there, and there never will be. Hank felt like a dirtbag for saying those things about Mary, especially when he'd grown to care about her so much, was so attracted to her. But he had to convince Simone that he didn't have a thing for her. If London found out, there would be hell to pay. All right, all right, Simone said with a Cheshire-like smile. Let me know when you're up for a night out. Then she pulled him in for a deep kiss, one that told him how much she wanted him. He couldn't help himself. He kissed her back with just as much passion. Mary couldn't believe what Hank had said about her, and if she hadn't left her shoes out back, she wouldn't have overheard the horrible words spilling from his mouth. She'd been happier thinking he was a nice guy. But nope, London was right. Hank was charming, yet selfish, more like a complete jerk, pretending he liked her, that he respected her, all the while his true feelings were completely the opposite. And the way he'd kiss Simone? Yeah, he definitely liked her. Then and there, Mary put aside her fantasy that there could be anything beyond friendship between her and Hank, and even friendship seemed questionable. Hank was glad when Simone finally left. He felt bad that he turned her down, but he didn't regret it. After walking her to her car, he came back inside to see what Mary and Harper were up to. It wasn't even three o'clock, so they had hours ahead of them. The thought made him smile. When he didn't find them in the kitchen, he headed to the game room. Sure enough, that's where they were. Look at these beautiful pictures, he said, stopping in front of some finger paintings hanging to dry. He turned to Harper, his eyes wide. Who did these? Her face broke into a bright smile, and she touched her chest. I did. Really? I never knew you were such a good painter, Princess Pink Rose. Her head tilted from side to side. I like to paint. Stealing a glance at Mary, who was attaching a fresh sheet of paper to Harper's easel, Hank waited for her to acknowledge him. When she didn't do so much as look his way, his forehead creased in question. Will you paint my nails, Daddy? Harper asked as her hand slipped into his. Please? What? He tore his gaze from Mary and turned to Harper. I want pink nails. She waved the hand that wasn't holding his, showing him that her nails were uncolored. Oh, uh, I don't have any nail polish. Mary has some. 
Hank looked Mary's way. She must have heard her name, because she lifted her gaze from the easel and glanced at him, but after a split second, she turned her attention to Harper. I'll get my nail polished, she said, her smile clearly meant for Harper only, then she turned and left. What was going on? Why did she seem decidedly unfriendly all of a sudden? Was it because Simone had come over? He was an idiot. Of course that was why. Simone had interrupted the fun they'd been having in the pool. When Simone had told him to get out and talk to her, he'd done exactly that. Really, though, why would that upset Mary? In all reality, she was the nanny. Why would she have a problem with him dating Simone? She knew he was dating Simone. He told her the other night before going out, yet she'd been waiting up for him after his game the day before. And earlier, when they'd been in the pool, she'd been as friendly as ever. It was only after Simone had shown up that Mary had started to act differently. Uncertain what he should do, but no less attracted to her, Hank decided it was time to let her know that his interest lay with her, not Simone. But he would have to tread carefully, because even though he'd gotten the feeling that she was interested in him too, now he wasn't so sure. Hitting on her when she had no interest would be a big mistake. Chapter 17 With her manicure supplies in hand, Mary made her way back to the game room slash art studio. Knowing Hank was there, waiting for her, brought on a kaleidoscope of emotions, excitement and anticipation, but even more so, hurt feelings and embarrassment. Despite that, and even after overhearing the things he'd said about her, the magnetism he exuded, and the need she had to have him notice her, to want her, had hardly dimmed and that made his words hurt all the worse. Frustrated with herself that his words hadn't killed her interest, she sighed as she opened the door to the art studio and stepped across the threshold. Keeping her focus on Harper, she could feel Hank's eyes on her. I brought all my nail polish so you can choose which one you want. Mary set the bottles on a low table, then waited while Harper examined each one, picking one up and staring at it before setting it down and choosing another. Finally, after studying each one, she held up two, a hot pink and a deep red. I like these. Smiling, Mary said, then we'll use both. We can alternate, pink on one finger, then red, then pink, and so on. Okay, she turned to Hank. I want Daddy to do it. Not able to stop herself, Mary looked at Hank, whose eyebrows were raised. I, uh, I've never painted nails before. Wanting to make Harper happy, and putting aside her stung feelings, Mary smiled tightly. I'll show you how. His gaze lingered on her. Why was he looking at her like that, especially after what he'd said to Simone? Clenching her jaw in annoyance that she was even asking herself those things when she needed to draw a bright red line between their roles, she tore her eyes away from him and looked at Harper. Let's go outside so we don't get any polish on the carpet. Come on, Daddy, Harper said, her hand still clutched in his as she tugged him toward the door. Once they were all outside, Mary led the way to a shady spot near the pool. Sitting cross-legged on the pavers, she patted the ground in front of her. Sit here, Harper. Casting a quick glance at Hank, she didn't direct him where to sit. Why should she help him any more than she was already? He didn't let her off that easily, though. Where should I sit, Marigold? His voice was low and sexy. Hearing him say her full name, especially with that deep tone, brought back the memory of Friday when he'd leaned over her on the pool table and murmured in her ear. Heat pounded through her. She forced her suddenly rapid breathing to slow. You can sit wherever you want. She couldn't let him get to her like this, not when she knew the truth of the way he felt about her. A slow smile tugged up the corners of his mouth, if you say so. Then he sat right beside her. That wasn't what she had in mind, and when the subtle scent of his cologne wrapped around her, she had to stop herself from swaying in his direction. Turning her full attention to the task at hand, she shook the bottle of base coat, then unscrewed the cap and lifted out the tiny brush. Let's start with your toes, Harper. Put your foot on my leg. Then she glanced at Hank out of the corner of her eye. He was watching her intently, his striking green eyes boring into her. What was going on? 
Why was he looking at her like that when he'd stated in no uncertain terms that she wasn't his type, that he would never be interested in her? Because that wasn't the message his eyes were broadcasting. Harper's foot landed on Mary's leg, yanking her attention away from Hank and back to Harper. Glad for the distraction, Mary bent forward slightly and gently grasped Harper's big toe. This is the base coat, she said, which you put on each nail before you add the color. Keeping her attention on Harper's toe, she added, you brush on a thin coat, like this. Then she brushed some on. Barely glancing at him, she held out the bottle of base coat. Now you do it. He cupped her hand with both of his before taking the bottle. Then he stroked the tender skin on the back of her hand with his thumb. Sensations raced up her arm, and she had to work to keep from gasping. Seconds later, he let go. Torn between loving the feel of his skin against hers and furious that he was playing with her, she clenched her jaw. Did he think she was a stupid little girl? That she would fall for him just because he gave her some attention? That he was too amazing to resist? Clearly, he had no idea she'd overheard what he'd said to Simone. Besides, he was dating Simone. How dare he put any moves on her, no matter how subtle? London was so right, so very, very right, and if it wasn't for Harper and how much she loved being with her father, Mary would tell London that she and Harper needed to go back to L.A. right away. But she would never do that to Harper. Let me have your foot, Harper, Hank said. Harper moved her foot from Mary's leg to Hank's, and Mary shifted her gaze so that she was watching him. His focus was on what he was doing. Knowing it was safe to observe him, when she saw the incongruity of his large hands holding the tiny brush as he carefully painted the base coat on Harper's toenails, despite her anger at him, a minuscule smile forced its way onto her lips. When he was done, Harper held out her hands. Do my fingers, Daddy? He looked at Mary, a question on his face. After tossing a smile at Harper, when Mary looked at Hank, the corners of her lips straightened. Do the same thing as you did with her toes. Looking a little uncertain, he held each of Harper's tiny fingers in turn, painting base coat on each nail. When he was done, he put the lid on the bottle of base coat. It has to dry now, Harper said, like this was old hat for her. Do you still want both of these colors? Mary asked, as they waited for the base coat to dry. Yes. Okay. She handed the bottles to Hank, not giving him a chance to touch her hands again. Forcing herself to hold his gaze, she said, Shake the bottles really well, and then you paint them on just like you did with a base coat. He grinned. Alternating colors, of course. Frowning, she said, Of course. Got it. After shaking the bottles, he opened the bottle of pink polish and did a decent job of painting it on every other nail on Harper's fingers and toes. Then he did the same with the red. What do you think, Princess Pink Rose? Harper admired her nails. It's pretty. Thank you, Daddy. You're welcome. Keeping her eyes pointed at Harper's nails, Mary said, This coat will take longer to dry, otherwise the polish will smear. Once Harper's nails are done, you'll need to add a top coat. Hank chuckled. I had no idea painting nails was so involved. Despite herself, Mary looked at him and tried to tamp down the irritation she felt. I'm sure there's a lot about women you don't know. Where did that come from? Completely out of line. Mary's face burned. Hank's gaze lasered in on her, and his voice was low and sexy. I'd like to learn. The butterflies in her belly began to dance, and she frantically tried to calm them. Tried and failed. Why was he looking at her like that when he had zero interest? Confused, Mary tore her gaze away and ignored his comment. I like the colors you picked, she said to Harper. They're perfect for you. Can we play a game after? What game would you like to play? The cherry game. Mary smiled. Hi-ho, cherry -o? Yeah. Okay. Will you play with us, Daddy? Watching him out of the corner of her eye, Mary waited to see what he would say. In a way, it would be a relief if he bowed out. On the other hand, she didn't want him to leave. I'd love to, Princess Pink Rose. Harper grinned. Yay! Why should she expect him to bow out? She's the one who should leave. 
it was time to give Hank and Harper father-daughter time, and putting space between her and Hank would be a good thing. She smiled at Harper. You and your daddy should play, just the two of you, okay? Harper didn't seem phased at all. Okay. Pushing herself to her feet, Mary looked at Hank. I'll be in my room if you need me. Then, not giving him a chance to comment, she turned and walked away. Chapter 18 Hank watched Mary go, surprised at how disappointed he was that she was leaving. My nails are dry, Daddy, Harper said a few minutes later, as she tapped a painted nail with her fingertip. It's not sticky, that's how you tell. So now we do the top coat? Yes, then they'll be shiny. He adored his little Harper and loved this time with her, but not having Mary with them felt wrong somehow. Turning his attention to Harper, he painted on the top coat, and when it was dry, they went inside and into the sitting room. After taking the game out of a cabinet, Hank opened the box on the coffee table, then turned to Harper. How do you play hi ho Cherio? Harper pointed to the little baskets with plastic pieces in them. You have to put the fruit on the trees first. Once the game was set up, he asked, Now what? Her face serious, she pointed to the spinner. Don't choose the basket or the dog or the bird. Why not? What happens if I pick those ones? You have to put the fruit back on the tree. Confused, he said, but the fruit's already on the tree. Harper sighed like he was a big idiot. You have to take them off first, Daddy. The Vipers normally lined up over 90 plays in their playbook for a typical game, and for each of those, Hank memorized the position and action of each of the 11 guys on offense. Hi Ho Cherio was a game for small children. Maybe he needed to read the rules. That, or ask for Mary's help. He liked the second option better. When Mary heard voices floating up the stairs and into her room, she'd left her door open just in case. She tiptoed into the hall that overlooked the sitting room. She could hear Harper explaining the game to Hank. Badly wanting to join them, she held back a soft sigh. It had been her idea to leave them alone, her idea to put space between her and Hank, an idea she now regretted. Mary, Hank called out. Mary, we need you. Eyes widening, Mary had to hold herself back from racing down the stairs. Instead, she counted to five. No reason to give away the fact that she'd been standing there. Then she leaned over the railing and looked down to see Hank and Harper sitting on the floor in front of the coffee table. Her earlier hurt feelings and the irritation she'd harbored toward Hank had already begun to dissipate. How could she stay mad at him when she found him so irresistible? What's wrong? she called down. Hank looked up, and when his eyes met hers, she had to work to stay where she was. I'm a little confused about how to play this game. Smiling, she shook her head. It's a very simple game, Hank. He grinned up at her. Can you show me how to play? Evidently, I don't want to choose the basket or the dog or the bird. With a soft chuckle, she descended the stairs, fully aware that Hank was watching her every step. When she reached the coffee table, she sat beside Harper. Sounds like we need to show your daddy how to play Hi-Ho Cherio. Harper giggled and looked at Hank. What color are you, Harper? Green. Lifting her eyes to Hank's, Mary asked, And you? Blue. All right, I'll be red. Harper goes first. Harper flicked the spinner, and it spun around and around, stopping on the wedge with two pieces of fruit on it. Harper removed two green apples from her tree and dropped them in her basket. Oh, I see how this works now. Mary couldn't resist. I'm glad it's not too complicated for you. I know how much you like to win. He smiled as his eyes bored into hers. We need to have a rematch. Memories of their very brief game of pool filled her mind, and her pulse fluttered. Then she remembered the red line she had decided to create, the line delineating her role as nanny and his role as her employer's ex-husband. A rematch was out of the question. We'll see, she heard herself say. His eyes twinkled, then he turned to Harper. Whose turn is it now? Your turn. 
Hank spun the spinner, and it landed on the wedge with one fruit. What do I do now? You take one of your blueberries off the tree and put it in your basket, Harper said. Okay. He did as she instructed. Now what? It's Mary's turn. Harper bounced up and down. They played three more games, Harper winning two and Mary winning one. Hank was having too much fun to care that he'd lost every game. It was all chance anyway. If it was a strategy game, he would feel differently about losing. The important thing was that Harper was having fun. He also liked that Mary had joined them. She seemed in better spirits now. Maybe because more time had passed and Simone had left? Not sure what to make of her mood changes, especially if they were related to Simone, Hank looked her way. She had turned to Harper, and he took advantage of her focus on his daughter to study her face, the curve of her jaw, the way her long lashes curled, the perfect tilt of her nose, the way her lips begged for him to minister to them with his own. The thought of kissing her sent a jolt through him, a jolt of pleasure that he had to suppress. Unless he was ready to admit to her that he was intrigued by her, he had to stop letting his thoughts run wild. Was he ready to admit the way he was feeling? Was his attraction to her strong enough? He wasn't sure. If London knew how he felt toward Mary, she would be livid. Was Mary worth earning London's wrath? And what would that mean for Harper? Surely London would fire Mary on the spot. Harper would be crushed. He had to get himself under control. Do you want to play again? Mary asked Harper. Give your daddy a chance to win? When Mary slid her gaze toward him, Hank's chest tightened with dismay. The more he considered giving up any chance of something more with her, the deeper his disappointment grew, which made him want her all the more. Harper shook her head. I don't want to play a game. I'm hungry. It's a little early for dinner, Hank said, forcing away his despair. But maybe you can have a snack. He looked at Mary for confirmation. How about some grapes? Mary suggested. Okay. While you two have a snack, I'll be working in my office. He stood, not wanting to leave them, but he needed to review the previous day's game. I'll see you ladies at dinner. When dinner time rolled around, Mary led Harper to the outside eating area. The evening was pleasant, so she knew Hank would want to eat out there. The place settings on the table confirmed her guess. It was funny that after such a short time, she could guess what he was going to do. Felt like she knew him already. Except maybe she didn't. She recalled what she'd overheard him saying to Simone earlier. Was that the real Hank Parson? Or was the real Hank Parson the person he was when it was just the three of them? Mary, Hank, and Harper. Why would he be two different people anyway? Uncertain what to believe, she helped Harper into her chair just as Hank walked into the dining area, his smile only highlighting how handsome he was. Disconcerted by her array of emotions, Mary turned her attention to Harper, making sure she had what she needed. What have you two been up to? he asked. I played on the swing, Harper said. Mary pushed me. At the mention of her name, she lifted her gaze to see Hank watching her, his eyes intent. That sounds like fun. Maybe we can all play together after dinner. Yay, Harper said. Mary played it cool, not responding at all, just sliding into her seat. She shouldn't encourage him, not when she didn't know what his agenda was. Hank sat as well, and Mrs. Stillman rolled out a cart loaded with a grilled chicken salad, piles of freshly baked rolls, corn on the cob, and steamed broccoli and carrots. Those smell heavenly, Mary said, when Mrs. Stillman set the rolls near her. Thank you, Mrs. Stillman said. There are plenty more. After she set all the food on the table, she wheeled the cart back into the house, and they filled their plates. As they ate, they talked about mundane things, and as dinner drew to a close, Mary became nervous. Did Hank plan on having them all hang out in the game room? Did she want to? To be honest, she did. Despite her confusion over the contrast between what he'd said to Simone and the way he was so kind to her, she found him undeniably appealing, and she loved every minute she spent with him. 
but if he gave any indication that he was interested in her, she would be forced to press him to explain why he'd said those things about her to Simone. Chapter 19 Who's up for a game of ping pong? Hank asked as they walked into the game room after dinner. I am, I am, Harper shouted as she jumped up and down. Mary smiled at Harper's enthusiasm, but she was on edge. Dinner had been routine, the conversation relaxing, but now they were in this space, this room where things had seemed to heat up between her and Hank several days earlier. And she hadn't forgotten London's warning, the one she'd given after Harper had mentioned that Hank had taught Mary how to play pool, the one where London had said she would hate to have to make other arrangements. Mary would hate that too. Being at Hank's house had been more amazing than she had ever imagined, and she had no doubt that Harper was happy here too. She couldn't do anything to jeopardize that. And yet, when she looked at Hank, saw what a good father he was, felt his generosity firsthand, saw what a good man he was, what a hard worker, not to mention how good-looking, how fit, how masculine, Mary's pulse fluttered with a longing she'd never known before. All right, Hank said, Harper's first. Mary felt his eyes on her, and when she looked his way, he raised his eyebrows. Mary should help Harper. Desperately trying to shove down her yearning, Mary forced a laugh. Maybe you've forgotten. I didn't score a single point when we played before. He grinned. I'll go easy on you. I promise. The tone of his voice sent goosebumps flaring across her skin. Why did she have to be so enamored of him? Driving her feelings aside, she said, All right. Then she helped Harper onto the chair that Hank had put into place. Standing behind her, she waited for Hank to serve the ball. Do you want me to help you? she asked Harper. Harper picked up the paddle. No, I do it myself. Smiling, Mary said, Okay. Hank gently served the ball, and Harper swung and hit it but it bounced off the net and rolled to the floor. I hit it, Mary, Harper said, as she turned around with a big smile. You sure did. She gently squeezed Harper's shoulders, then she looked at Hank, whose lips had tilted into a smile. Harper turned back around, and Hank lobbed another soft one to her, which she nearly hit. After another miss, she asked, Will you help me, Mary? Of course. Mary covered Harper's hand with hers, and when Hank served the ball to them, they hit it back. We hit it, Harper said, looking up at Mary. Yes, but we have to keep going. They hit the ball back and forth a couple of times until they hit it into the net. When the ball rolled to the floor, Harper jumped down from the chair. I can stand on my head, Daddy. Watch me. She dashed to the wall and executed a perfect handstand, holding her place against the wall for a good ten seconds. Wow, I'm impressed, Princess Pink Rose. Hank's voice rang with admiration. Did Mary teach you that? Mary laughed. <laughs> no way. My friend Katie showed me, Harper said. What else can you do? She grinned, clearly thrilled to have her father's approval and attention. I can do a somersault. Watch me. Then she proceeded to do three somersaults in a row. That is amazing. Harper beamed. Mary loved the interaction between Hank and Harper, and as hard as she tried to suppress it, her attraction to him could not be denied. But she had to deny it, and deny it firmly. He was London's ex-husband. Why did she have to keep reminding herself of that? And even if he wasn't, she couldn't be sure of him. One minute he seemed interested in her, the next he was saying she was a kid who held zero interest for him. No. It was best for her to keep that red line bright and visible. Can we watch a movie? Harper asked. Now that was an idea Mary could get behind. No playing ping pong, and certainly no playing pool. That's a great idea, she said. What movie do you want to watch? The Little Mermaid. Mary laughed. You mean The Little Mermaid? Yeah. I don't think I have that movie. I'm sure we can stream it from somewhere. Mary wouldn't let him talk Harper out of it. Once they were all settled on the couch in the family room, Hank began streaming The Little Mermaid. 
Harper was fully focused on the large television, and as she sat to his left, Hank's eyes slid to Mary, who sat on Harper's other side. Deciding to take a chance, he rested his arm on the back of the couch behind Harper, then ran one of his fingers across the bare skin of Mary's arm. The moment his finger touched her, her head swung in his direction. Eyes wide, she looked at him as her lips parted. Letting a lazy smile curve his mouth, his eyes never wavered from hers. Her eyebrows slid together as her teeth sank into her lower lip and confusion clouded her eyes. The uncertainty on her face rattled him and he drew his arm back to his lap. Glancing at her out of the corner of his eye, he saw that she was facing the front again, though her forehead was creased. Had he misread her completely? He thought she had some interest in him, but maybe he'd been wrong. Feeling like a fool for his serious miscalculation, Hank clenched his jaw and vowed to behave himself from now on. In fact, he knew he owed Mary an apology for thinking of her in terms that she clearly didn't reciprocate. After Harper went to bed, he would have a talk with her, clear the air, start fresh. Feeling marginally better, he focused on the movie. Hank's touch was a scorch on her arm. Mary stared at the TV screen, but she might as well have been looking at a blank wall. While her heart galloped with joy at the look of interest she'd seen on Hank's face, her mind rebelled, telling her heart to slow to a walk. And when he'd withdrawn his hand, she'd had to fight the urge to reach behind Harper and put her hand on him. But that would be stupid, especially when the words she'd heard him say to Simone still rang in her ears. No, it was good he'd pulled back. The more she thought about it, the more confused she became, because his actions completely contradicted what he'd said. Maybe it was time to ask him flat out what was going on. Chapter 20 I like the little mermaid, Harper said, as the movie finished and they turned the TV off. Mary smiled at her mispronunciation. I like it too. Do you like the little mermaid, Daddy? Hank tugged her into his arms and tickled her. You're my little mermaid. Harper giggled, her feet kicking in the air. I'm not a mermaid. You looked like a mermaid when you were swimming today. Her giggles only grew louder, but after several moments, Hank sat her up. Okay, time for bed, my little princess. Then he turned to Mary, the laughter suddenly gone from his eyes. I'll tuck her in when she's ready for bed. His tone was different, more... Not formal exactly, but there seemed to be a less casual air to it, like he barely knew her, like she was just an employee. Idiot, she thought, that's what you are. She may not be his employee, but she was still the hired help. Why had she ever thought things could be different? Then again, why had he touched her like he had during the movie, looked at her the way he had, acted the way he had when they'd played pool several days earlier? Fresh confusion descended upon her, but she ignored it, instead taking Harper's hand and leading her up the stairs and into her room. Hank was nervous. He'd read Harper a story and tucked her in, and now, as he closed the door to her room, his gaze shot to the next door in the hallway, the door to Mary's room. He needed to talk to her, to clear the air, to apologize for stepping out of line. What would she say? What would she do? Sucking in a breath, he reminded himself that he was Hank Parson, star running back in the NFL, accomplished athlete. More importantly, he was Harper's father. He could do this. He could handle whatever came. Slowly exhaling, he strode to Mary's door and firmly wrapped his fist against the wood. Keep this professional, he thought. That will tone down the awkwardness. At least he hoped it would. The door opened and there she stood, wearing shorts and a tank top, her hair pulled into a messy bun, her face scrubbed clean, her eyes wide and questioning as her lips parted. He battled the nearly overwhelming need to drag her into his arms and kiss that luscious mouth. I need to talk to you. Huskiness scratched his throat. Mary hadn't expected to see Hank tonight, 
and she especially hadn't expected to see him standing in her doorway, demanding a conversation. But seeing him now, towering over her, his eyes intense, his body ripped and powerful, his face beyond handsome, there was no way she would tell him no. No warm smile accompanied his request, and she wondered if he had bad news to deliver. Had he talked to London? Had she told him to fire her? Would she be packing her bags and leaving that very night? Her heart thumped with dread. Come with me, he said. Then he turned and walked down the hallway and toward the stairs. Mary hurried to follow, and when Hank reached the sitting room, he paused at the French doors, turning to look at her. Then he held the door open for her, and she stepped onto the tiled patio. The sun had set, but the evening was pleasant. Are you warm enough? Hank asked her. She nodded, and when he motioned to the pair of cushioned chairs, Mary sat. Hank sat in the adjacent chair, then leaned forward, resting his forearms on his knees, his gaze on the ground. He looked tense, which made Mary tense, but she held her tongue, waiting for him to take the lead. After several moments, he straightened and turned to her, his face grim. I owe you an apology. This wasn't what she was expecting. And what was he apologizing for? Did he know she'd overheard his conversation with Simone? Or at least the part of it where he'd said the less than flattering things about her? Is that what this was all about? Tightly coiled, she waited for him to go on. I made an assumption, he continued. I was wrong to do that, and I'm sorry. An assumption, she thought. What assumption? Anxious to figure out what this was really about, she said. What are you talking about? A muscle worked in his jaw, and he looked away before meeting her eyes. I assumed you were, well, that you were interested in me, romantically. Her mouth fell open, and she sharply inhaled. His assumption was right, 100% right. What if she told him he was right? What would happen then? And was he interested in her? How could that be, after what she'd heard him tell Simone? Was he playing with her? Taking advantage of her? Mentally flailing, Mary stared at him. Sometimes my ego's a little too big, I guess. His handsome face, his mouth, was only inches away. What were the possibilities here? Boldness flared inside her. Maybe she should take a chance. I'm not saying you were right in your assumption, but what if you were? What then? His eyes widened in clear surprise, then he rubbed a finger across his upper lip. I don't know. His eyes narrowed. Are you? Interested, I mean. Dare she admit it? After what she'd heard him say to Simone that very day? Wanting to know why he'd said those things, but not wanting to admit she'd heard him say them, she said, I don't think I'm your type. Remembering what he'd said, she added, You're not really into art, right? Football's more your thing. Plus, I'm a lot younger than you. Hank tilted his head. Why did those words sound familiar? Then it hit him. Those were the things he'd said to Simone. Had Mary heard him? Embarrassed and ashamed for saying things about her that were untrue, Hank scrubbed his face with his hands. You heard what I said to Simone, didn't you? Mary stared at him, then she nodded. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I was just... I left my shoes outside. She was apologizing to him? That made him feel even worse. It was time to come clean. I had to tell her that. Why? Mary had worked for London for several weeks now. Did she have any idea how vindictive the woman could be? He considered mentioning that to Mary, but didn't like the idea of talking smack about his ex-wife, especially because he wasn't sure how Mary felt about him. He had to tread carefully. His lips pursed, just trying to avoid a complication. She nodded. With London. So she did know, or at least had an idea. Yeah. Wait, did this mean she was interested in him? It was starting to come together now, the mixed signals he'd gotten, the interest he'd sensed, 
but the coolness she had exhibited after Simone's visit, after she'd overheard his idiotic comments. All the same, he wasn't certain how she felt. Maybe he was still misreading her. He had to find out. But would she admit it? It was time to put himself out there. Mary, can we be honest with each other? Chapter 21 Mary was nervous. What if she admitted that she was attracted to him and he took advantage of her? What if he really was charming but selfish? Yes, she said in answer to his question. If she wasn't willing to be honest, what was the point? He nodded, the line of his mouth firm. Good. When his green eyes focused intently on her, desire skittered across her skin, settling deep inside her. No matter the cost, she would tell him the truth, tell him how she felt. I'm attracted to you, Mary, he said, sending the butterflies in her belly into a full-on riot. Maybe too much. Was that possible, to be attracted to someone too much? Holding back the smile that wanted to burst onto her mouth, she kept her gaze steady on him, mentally encouraging him to go on, to tell her what she'd been hoping to hear. You're Harper's nanny. You don't work for me, but you work for London. That, well, that could be a problem. She knew that, firsthand. She held back a frown. A tentative smile curved his lips. Of course, none of that matters if this attraction is one-sided. Okay, time for her confession. She softly inhaled. I'm attracted to you too, Hank. His smile grew, making the lines around his eyes crinkle. Mary? A voice called from the living room. Mary, I'm thirsty. Mary leapt to her feet at the sound of Harper's voice, her eyes going to Hank. I need to... He nodded. We'll finish our conversation later. Anticipation at having that conversation flooded her. Then she turned and hurried inside. I'm right here, Harper. Harper turned to her, her favorite blanket clutched in her arms. I'm thirsty. Okay, let's get you a drink of water. Mary's eyes went to Hank, who had walked inside. Daddy, Harper said, running over to him. He scooped her up. Mary went into the kitchen and filled a small cup with cold water, then walked toward Hank and Harper. Now that they had declared their interest in each other, the atmosphere between them was distinctly different. Where before there was the unknown, now there was a certain level of comfort, of familiarity, of knowing how they felt, of electricity. Here you go, Mary said, as she handed the cup to Harper. Harper took a few sips, then handed the cup back to Mary. Let's get you back to bed, Hank said, as he carried her toward the stairs. Mary watched them ascend the staircase. Now what? When was Hank planning on continuing their conversation? Not sure, she went back outside. On impulse, she went into the art studio and turned on the lights. Walking over to the painting she'd been working on, a painting of Harper, based on a photograph of the little girl, Mary squirted paint onto her palette then picked up a brush. You need to stay in bed now, Princess Pink Rose, Hank said, as he settled Harper under her covers. No more getting out of bed. Time to go to sleep. He kissed her on the forehead, and when she closed her eyes and turned onto her side, he turned and left the room, closing the door behind him. Smiling, he walked down the stairs and into the family room. His conversation with Mary was going well, and he was thrilled to know his instincts were correct, that she was attracted to him, too. Glancing around the room, he didn't see her, and when he looked out back, he saw the lights on in the game room. Striding across the tiled patio, he was eager to continue their conversation, to see where things would lead. There you are, he said, as he walked into the game room. She stood in front of a canvas, paintbrush in hand, but from where he stood, he couldn't see what she was painting. Curious, he walked over to her and looked over her shoulder. It was a painting of Harper. He was no art aficionado, but even to his untrained eye, he could see she was good. That looks just like her, he said, as he glanced at Mary. He lifted his hand and gestured toward the painting. You've captured her... her essence, I guess. 
He smiled at her. It's beautiful. Mary's face lit up. Thank you. Seeing the joy on her face, the delight, Hank wanted nothing more than to kiss her. But he didn't. It was too soon. They'd barely admitted their attraction. He wasn't going to jump in with a kiss just yet. Not until the moment felt right. Don't let me stop you, he said. She dipped her head. I wasn't sure how long you would be, so I... She glanced at the painting, then looked at him, her eyes wide. This was fascinating, watching her work. More fascinating than he would have ever thought. And her reaction to his being there? Her shyness? Endearing. I'm just... I'm not used to an audience. She softly chuckled, <laughs> besides Harper. He got it, but he didn't want to leave. He also didn't want her to stop painting. Yes, he wanted her to pay attention to him, but he understood passion, understood the need to do what was driving you. He wanted to encourage her, not stop her for his own selfish reasons. What if I... He pointed toward the pool table. Shoot some pool while you work. Mary liked having him there, but she was self-conscious about him watching her paint. His suggestion was a good compromise. Okay. He walked to the pool table, which was on the other side of the room. She adjusted her easel and canvas so that he wouldn't be able to see her work, maybe not even see her face behind the easel, and she continued painting. As much as she loved painting side by side with Harper, being able to fully concentrate on her work was a luxury, and she took full advantage, the sound of Hank hitting the balls fading into the background. Half an hour later, she realized the room had gone silent. Lifting her head, she looked toward the pool table, but Hank wasn't there. Had he left without saying good night? She walked to a window that looked toward the house, her gaze searching. The lights were on inside the house, and the blinds were up, so she was able to see inside. That's when she saw him, talking to Simone. Her heart stuttered to a stop, then began to pound. What was Simone doing there? Chapter 22 It's getting late, Hank said to Simone as they stood in the archway that led from the family room into the entry, and I need to get up early. I'm well aware of the time, Hank, but I need to talk to you. She glanced behind him toward the family room. Aren't you going to invite me in? He didn't want to. He wanted to go back out to the game room and be with Mary. If he hadn't come inside to check on Harper, he never would have heard the doorbell, never would have been interrupted. Still, he'd been dating Simone for several months. At a minimum, he owed her some courtesy. He swept his hand in the direction of the couch. Of course. She walked into the family room and sat down. He sat near her. What's going on? She took his hand in hers. I want to apologize for earlier. She shook her head. It's been bothering me all day. His eyebrows creased. Apologize for what? Her face relaxed. For questioning you about the nanny. Mary, he thought. She'd been thinking about Mary all day? That couldn't be good. Okay. I shouldn't have. That is, it wasn't my place to tell you what to do. That was true, but it hadn't been a big deal. He'd already forgotten about it. It's fine, Simone. Just forget it. That's just it, Hank. I can't forget it. I... She looked at their intertwined hands before meeting his gaze. I saw something in that girl's eyes. Something I couldn't shake. What? Hank thought. He tilted his head in question. She just... Simone's lips compressed for a moment. I know when a woman is interested in a man, Hank, and that girl is definitely interested in you. This wasn't good. He knew how Mary felt, but he didn't realize it had been so obvious to Simone. Where are you going with this? One shapely eyebrow arched. You don't seem surprised by this information. Making a scoffing sound in his throat, he shook his head. First off, you assume way too much. Second, you're being completely ridiculous. She didn't look convinced, so he went on. Simone, Mary is Harper's nanny, nothing more. He paused. I'm still unclear why you're telling me this. 
She looked at him like he was simple-minded. Because, Hank, how can the girl do a good job of caring for your daughter when she's fixated on you? He hadn't thought of that. Was that really a concern? From everything he'd seen, Mary did an excellent job of caring for Harper. She hadn't done a single thing to give him even a moment of doubt, and she hardly seemed fixated on him. It was more the other way around. He was fixated on her. I'm gone most of the time, Simone, and Mary takes very good care of Harper. Simone's delicate jaw tightened. She's living under the same roof as you, playing in the pool with you, part of your daily life. She shook her head, her blue eyes blazing. You're asking for trouble, Hank. It was too late. He and Mary had already shared their feelings for each other. Nothing Simone said would change that. I talked to London, she said, shattering Hank's confidence. You what? He yanked his hands from hers and leapt to his feet. Closing his eyes, he shook his head. Then he stared at her, betrayal pounding through his veins. You spoke to my ex-wife? Fury dripped from each word. Why would you do that? He paused as his thoughts jumbled, then clarified. How did you find her? Her number's a highly guarded secret. Turns out we have a friend in common. How hard had Simone worked to get London's number? How many of her friends had she contacted in her search? The answer to that question worried him, because if she'd been that determined to talk to his ex-wife about Mary, that could only mean bad things for him, things that would keep him and Mary from having a chance at, well, at whatever the future might hold for them. Simone stood and faced him. I admit, she wasn't happy to hear from me, at first, but I care about you, Hank. Her voice was soft, her blue eyes tender. I did it for you. His whole body went still. What did you do, Simone? Nothing, really. Just, you know, told her my concerns. Your concerns? He had to play it cool, pretend like she was wrong about everything. Besides, there really was nothing to tell. All that had happened was he and Mary had admitted they were attracted to each other. Was that really so terrible? Your concerns about what? I don't know what you're talking about. Simone's lips curved slightly, then she stroked his arms and kept her eyes on his. My concern about Harper's nanny taking advantage of you. Football season will take all of your attention, Hank. That will leave you vulnerable. Vulnerable to what? He wasn't sure, but he'd heard enough. I'm a big boy, Simone. I don't need you to worry about me. When she frowned, he added, It's time for you to leave. Her mouth fell open, and a sound of shock slipped out. Leave? But I haven't told you what London said. He didn't want to know, yet he had to. What? What did London say? He hated that he needed to care, but London controlled access to Harper, and he wouldn't do anything that would jeopardize that. She said she would take care of it, that's all. What did that mean? Take care of it how? Simone shrugged. She didn't elaborate, but I told her not to worry, that I would keep an eye on things. That seemed to set her mind at ease. Hank wanted nothing more than to kick Simone out, to never see her again, but he had zero doubt that that would send Simone straight to London, and London wouldn't hesitate to punish him. Either she would yank Harper away from him, or she would fire Mary, which would devastate Harper. Either option was out of the question. He and London had already agreed that London would have primary custody. For months at a time, she wasn't working, whereas Hank only had a few weeks a year where he was free. Hank had frequent custody, but technically, right now, he wasn't supposed to have Harper. It wouldn't be difficult for London to send for Harper and Mary, to have them join her on her movie shoot. Sure, he could have his attorney do something about this, but how long would that take? And did he really have the energy to go through that now, right when football season had started? No, he would have to shut off this attraction to Mary. There was no other way. Anyway, that attraction had barely begun. How hard would it be to end it? And to keep Simone from running to London, he would have to let her remain part of his life, to let the charade of his feigned interest continue, at least for now. But he didn't have to let her stick around tonight. I appreciate your concern, Simone. 
The lie left a bitter taste in his mouth. It's only you and Harper that I care about. Hank was certain that was a lie. Simone obviously felt threatened by Mary and didn't want to lose her place in Hank's life. She was blind to the fact that by contacting London, she'd done exactly that. She just didn't know it yet. I'm really tired, he said, and that was true. This conversation, this knowledge, had wrung him out. I understand. She smiled at him, then she slid her arms around his neck and rested her head against his shoulder. Frowning, he put his arms around her. No reason to make her think he was less interested in her than he'd been all along. How often would she be talking to London? Or should he say, reporting to London? Simone pulled away, her eyes on him. Tomorrow's your day off. How about I take you to lunch? No, he wasn't going to let her manipulate his time. You know I go in for a workout on Tuesdays, and when I get home, I'll be spending time with my daughter. Her head tilted, her eyes narrowing. And the nanny? What? Will you be spending time with the nanny as well? Irritation climbed his throat. Hard to say. She is here to take care of Harper, you realize. Her lips pursed. Be careful, Hank. Not sure whether her warning was based on her worry of losing him or whether it meant she would report back to London, he grunted a reply, then he turned toward the entry. Simone took the hint and walked to the front door. I'll see you soon, she said with a warm smile, then she opened the door and left. Hank closed the door behind her, the tension he'd been holding in his body releasing in a loud rush of breath. Then he turned and strode to the game room. He needed to tell Mary what had happened, tell her that there could never be anything between them. Chapter 23 Mary watched the interaction between Hank and Simone with growing trepidation. What were they talking about? Why was he holding her in his arms? Had he meant it when he told her he was attracted to her? Did that mean anything to him, or was he just playing with her? A few minutes later, he walked Simone to the door, and she left without so much as a kiss. Interesting. Hank was striding out to the art studio. The outdoor lights illuminated his face, and when she saw his flattened lips and clenched jaw, her pulse accelerated. Seconds later, he burst through the door, his gaze searching. With no idea what was going on, she didn't move, waiting for him to spot her by the window. A moment later, he did. And in just a few steps he was in front of her, his eyes burning into hers. Had she done something wrong? Frantically searching her memory, she couldn't recall anything that would have made him angry at her. Wondering if Simone had made something up, she didn't let her eyes waver from his. Without warning, he cupped her face in his hands, and as his mouth descended toward hers, she gasped, her pulse skyrocketing. A split second later, his lips claimed hers. Too stunned to react, too disbelieving that he was kissing her, and with such passion, Mary froze but after several seconds, her body took over and her arms wound around his neck as she sank against him. Hank hadn't meant to kiss Mary. He'd meant to come in and tell her there could never be anything between them, that the stakes were too high, that it wasn't worth it. But when he'd seen her standing there, looking so vulnerable, so sweet and untouched, all of his logic had gone out the window. Now, as he held her in his arms, his lips devouring hers— her warm body melting against his, he was glad he'd followed his instincts. She fit into his arms perfectly, like she'd been made for him, and as her uniquely marigold scent surrounded him, he savored this moment, memorizing the feel of her, the taste of her, everything about her, because as much as he liked this, loved it, his logical side took over, and screamed at him that this attraction he had for her wasn't worth the risk of having his harper yanked away from him. After another moment, he released her. Stepping back, he studied her face. Eyes wide, she stared right back. He shouldn't have kissed her. It was going to make this so much harder, for both of them. What's going on? she asked when he failed to speak. Why was Simone here? Glad for the opening, he sighed as he shook his head. She called London. What? 
Why? He took her by the hand and led her to the couch tucked along one wall, where they sat side by side. Then he laid it all out, told her exactly what Simone had said. The power of Hank's sudden and passionate kiss lingered on Mary's lips, but as she digested what he was telling her, the lovely sensation she'd felt faded, replaced by worry, and finally by despair. So, he said, we need to put this attraction aside. It's not worth the risk. Frowning deeply, he added, I shouldn't have kissed you. I'm sorry. She wasn't. Not really. Although she could see his point. How do you know she actually talked to London? Mary asked. She could just have said that to, you know, control you. Although after the way London had warned Mary the other night, she knew it didn't really matter whether or not Simone had talked to her. Even if she hadn't, nothing was stopping Simone from reaching out to London, and if she and Hank pursued this attraction, it would only be a matter of time before it all came crashing down around them, with Harper left in the rubble. That was unacceptable. Harper was the innocent party here. They had to put her needs before their own. I don't know for sure, but I'm not willing to take the chance. His face softened. Not if it means I lose Harper, or Harper loses you. She already lost her last nanny, and I can see how much she adores you. He shook his head. We have to be the adults here. One side of his mouth lifted in a slight smile. We can keep this platonic. He was right. Of course he was. She just wished there was some other way, because that kiss, it had set her on fire, and she didn't know if it was a fire she would be able to quench. Hank wondered if he was asking too much of both of them. When he saw her each day, when he interacted with her, would he be able to forget that kiss? No, there was no way, which made him all the more angry at himself. If he'd never kissed her, maybe this wouldn't be so hard. But it was out there. It had happened. He couldn't take it back. Couldn't change it. So he needed to turn his mind in another direction, channel his energy another way. To football. That had always been his saving grace. He would work that much harder. The Vipers had won their first game, but they would have a tough game on Sunday against the Salt Lake City Raptors. So, what now? Mary asked. Only a few inches separated them on the couch, and he was tempted, oh so tempted, to pull her onto his lap for another kiss, a final kiss. He even shifted his body, ready to lift her, but he held back. He had to exhibit self-control now, right now. We go on, he said, just like before. You take care of Harper, and I play football and be her father. He swallowed over the knot in his throat, the one that said he hated being forced to do something he didn't want to, but that he would do it anyway. And we move on. Forcing a laugh, he added, soon enough you'll be going back to L.A. with Harper, so what would the point have been anyway? Mary stared at her lap, then she met his eyes with a smile he could tell was forced. Right, exactly, there are lots of other people out there, people who are more appropriate, right? Gritting his teeth, he nodded and grunted his agreement, but the idea of some other man making a move on Mary, holding her, kissing her, made him clench his fists and he wished he was on the field at that very moment. He would take down whomever was in front of him. Hard. Was it so easy for Hank to shut off his feelings? His desire? Because inside, Mary was dying. The beginning of their fledgling relationship had ended before it had ever had a chance to begin. Frustration plowed through her, but she'd made a choice, had decided that she was willing to make the sacrifice for Harper. In the last few weeks, Harper had wedged her way right into Mary's heart, and she would never do anything to hurt her. Besides, even if she was willing, who was to say there would be a future for her and Hank? Just because they had this initial draw toward each other didn't mean a relationship between them would last. It was better this way. They would be friends with a common goal. Raising Harper to be healthy and happy. What could be better than that? I'll, uh, Hank began. I'll leave you to your painting. He stood. Tomorrow's my day off, so after I go in for a workout, I'll come home and have lunch with you and Harper, but then I'll be studying game film for most of the afternoon. Okay. A smile tugged at his lips. 
Good night. Good night. She watched him leave, then walked over to her easel. She'd lost all desire to paint that night, so she cleaned up, then went to bed, wondering how she was going to stand seeing him every day without being able to touch him, especially with the memory of that kiss scorching her soul. Chapter 24 Daddy's home, Harper called out the next day as she and Mary sat in front of the coffee table playing a game of Candyland. Harper leapt to her feet and ran to Hank, throwing her arms around his legs before he picked her up. Mary stood, her heart pounding, and when he looked her way, the memory of the kiss they'd shared the night before threaded through her, filling her with pure joy that was quickly followed by the depths of despair. Looks like you're playing Candyland, he said to Harper as he set her down. Yes! She slid her hand into his. Come play with us! Harper tugged Hank forward, and as he walked into the family room, his gaze was on Mary. Throughout his workout that morning, his mind had continually gone to her, wondering how she was doing, if she was thinking about him, if she'd been able to put aside her feelings, because he hadn't. The more he tried, the more he wanted her. Maybe it had something to do with her being out of reach, but he didn't think so. He found her alluring, lovely, sweet, talented, wonderful. Why did things have to be so complicated? As he approached her, she kept her eyes on him, never once looking away, almost like she was challenging him, or maybe herself, to hold herself steady despite all that had happened, all that had changed since the day before. He was the first to break their stare, looking at the game board on the coffee table. Looks like you're in the middle of a game. We can start over, Mary said, and Hank looked at her sharply. Was there a double meaning there? No, that didn't make sense. They'd already agreed to start over, to just be friends, even after their heated kiss. All right. You sit there, Daddy, Harper directed, pointing to the floor in front of the end of the coffee table. Harper and Mary sat across from each other, Harper to his left and Mary to his right. He would have preferred to sit beside Mary, but after he told her they had to put aside their feelings, he couldn't contradict that so soon. I'll be the red guy, Harper said, as Mary shuffled the cards. They began the game, Hank acutely aware of Mary and everything about her, her smile when Harper said something cute, the bit of paint under one of her fingernails, the strands of hair that he wanted to tuck behind her ear. But what captured his attention the most was the fullness of her lips, how smooth they were, how kissable. Knowing firsthand how those lips felt when they were pressed against his, Hank had trouble tearing his gaze away, trouble restraining himself from reaching over and dragging her against him. It's your turn, Hank, Mary said, her voice soft. He lifted his gaze from her mouth, and when their eyes met, he could see that she was remembering their kiss too, and he knew she had enjoyed it every bit as much as he had. This was torture. How was she supposed to live like this? How could she sit there so calmly, mere inches away from him, the memory of being held in his arms still so fresh, and be expected to act like he meant nothing to her? It was impossible, especially when she could see her feelings reflected in his eyes. Not even trying to force her desires away. Instead, as she watched him draw his card and move his game piece, she let her wanting of him soak into her bones and fill her up. Why fight it? It was no use anyway. She was falling for him and falling hard. Fighting it only made her more miserable. Instead, she would embrace it. It wouldn't change anything between them. She'd agreed they couldn't act on their feelings, and she would stick by that. But at the same time, she wouldn't suppress her feelings, her desires. She would just let them be. I win, Harper called out a few minutes later. Yes, you did. Good job. Lunch is ready, Mrs. Stillman said as she entered the room. Thank you, Hank said. Then he stood and held out his hand to Mary. Mary looked at his hand, her pulse fluttering, then she met his eyes. They were intense, focused solely on her. Hesitating for only a moment, she placed her hand in his. The instant they touched, fire ignited inside her, racing up her arm, burning her deep inside. Still, 
She didn't pull away, didn't break their touch. Instead, she gripped his hand as he helped her stand. Harper scampered after Mrs. Stillman, headed toward the outside dining area. They were alone, at least for the moment. Inches of space separated them, but the chasm between what they wanted and what was possible was as difficult a bridge as the Grand Canyon. Marigold, Hank murmured, his hand still holding hers. The scratchiness in his voice left no doubt that he was struggling with this as much as she was. She studied his face as she stood in front of him, her heart pounding with a yearning for what she couldn't have. He stared down at her, and it was as if her whole body was reaching for him, begging him to draw her into his arms, to kiss her again. But he didn't. He blinked once, slowly, then he released her hand. Sighing audibly, he lifted his gaze toward the French doors, then he looked at her. Waiting for him to say something, anything, Mary nearly held her breath. Lunch is ready, he said. Then with a tight smile, he turned and walked away. Mary stared after him, her heart collapsing in on itself. He was going to stick with this. He really was. Why did that surprise her? To get where he was, he had achieved a level of discipline that very few could equal. Keeping their relationship platonic had to be much easier than what he truly had to deny himself throughout his life to become the world-class athlete that he was. Mary only hoped she could do the same. Hank was struggling. Throughout his life, he'd had to forego many things to reach the achievement of being one of the best running backs in the NFL. But having to walk away from Mary when he wanted nothing more than to drag her into his arms and kiss her like it was the last time he would see her, it was beyond difficult. He opened the French door, his ears attuned to her footsteps behind him, and when he heard her coming, he paused and held the door for her. She passed him, her floral scent following in her wake, wrapping around him. Closing his eyes, he inhaled deeply. Then he opened his eyes, exhaled, and strode to the dining area where Harper was already in her seat. Mary sat beside Harper, and he sat at the head of the table, near Harper. As they ate, shredded chicken wraps and a salad, Hank asked Harper what she was going to do after lunch. Swimming! Grinning, she looked at Mary. Following Harper's gaze, he saw Mary smile at Harper, then reach out and tuck a loose strand of Harper's long blonde hair behind her ear. Though he continued watching Mary, she refused to look at him, so he turned his attention to Harper. That sounds like fun. I can swim, Daddy, but I still wear my floaties. That's because they keep you safe. I know. Her voice was serious as she speared a piece of chicken. When I'm bigger, I won't have to wear floaties. Mary doesn't have to wear floaties. Hank laughed. <laughs> That's right. And you're growing so fast, I can hardly believe it. Pretty soon you'll be as big as Mary. When he looked Mary's way, she lifted her eyes to him, but immediately turned her attention back to Harper. You can practice your kicks, she said. I can hold my breath for fifteen, Harper said with a nod. Fifteen seconds? Hank asked. She nodded. Wow, that's amazing. They finished eating, and when Hank stood to leave, he realized he and Mary hadn't exchanged a single word. Chapter 25 When Mary's phone notified her that London was initiating a FaceTime session, she nearly told Harper, but it was only three o'clock. That wasn't when London typically spoke to Harper. This call was for her. She was sure of it. Glancing toward Harper, who was sprawled out on the floor of the art studio on her stomach, a red crayon in her hand as she colored in her favorite princess coloring book, Mary accepted the call. Hello, Mary said as she sat on the couch, the same couch she'd sat on the night before when Hank had told her there could be nothing between them. Shoving down that memory, she focused on London, whose face filled the screen of her phone. How are you? London asked. How's Harper? Mary glanced toward Harper, who was focused on coloring. We're great. We just finished swimming a bit ago, and now we're doing some artwork. Wonderful. Is everything okay? London sighed. You tell me, Mary. Uh-oh. 
she forced a look of puzzlement. What do you mean? Yesterday evening I received a call from a woman named Simone. So, Mary thought, Simone really had spoken to London. Not good. Mary cocked her head. Simone? The woman Hank's dating? London's eyebrows went up. Yes. What did she want? London's lips compressed for a moment. She told me some strange things about you, Mary, but I know you, so I wanted to talk to you about it. Okay. Mary dragged the word out. She could do this. She could play the confused, innocent party. She just had to believe that Simone was a crazy woman who would make things up about her. For all she knew, Simone had made things up about her. If Mary believed it, she could convince London as well. What did she tell you? I know my ex-husband is a good-looking man, London began. Mary narrowed her eyes like this was a ridiculous thing to say, like the way Hank looked was something she'd never noticed. Anyway, London said, this Simone woman seems to think you're becoming, shall we say, enamored of Hank. Mary's heart did a kind of kathump because she was beyond enamored of Hank, so beyond. Reaching down to her thigh, she pinched it as hard as she could, nearly bringing tears to her eyes. Better to have tears shimmering in her eyes than to have her true feelings for Hank shining from them. What? Mary asked, putting as much fury into her voice as she could muster. Then she glanced at Harper, who was ignoring Mary in her conversation. Even so, she lowered her voice. That's insane, London. London was a good actress. Would she recognize that Mary was putting on an act? London frowned. I'm glad to hear that, Mary, because I really don't have time to deal with this right now. There's nothing to deal with, Mary said. I can promise you that. And it was true, even though she wished it were different. She dropped her chin as she focused on the screen. I've met this woman, Simone. She's kind of... Mary grimaced. Crazy, you know? London frowned. Hank always did attract all kinds. Forcing a smile, Mary shook her head. Well, he attracted a doozy in this one. London was quiet as she stared at Mary, and Mary could see the wheels turning. I told you how Hank can be, London said. Don't forget that. Don't do something that you'll regret, Mary. Something that will make life miserable for all of us. Needing to understand what London would do, she asked, What do you mean? London sighed. You and Harper have developed a strong bond. I really, really don't want to break that. She stared straight into the camera. Please don't make me do that, Mary. I would never. London cut her off. Mary. Real tears filled Mary's eyes, and she looked at Harper once again before focusing back on London. I adore Harper. Of course I won't do anything to jeopardize my job. London's face seemed to relax. I'm glad to hear it. Mary was ready for this conversation to be over. She blinked to clear her eyes. Do you want to talk to Harper? Smiling, London said, Absolutely. Mary brought the phone to Harper, who was thrilled to talk to her mother. Standing to the side, Mary listened carefully to the conversation, worried Harper would say something in innocence that London would misconstrue. But that didn't happen, and Mary was pleased that London didn't so much as ask Harper anything about Mary or Hank. When their conversation was over, Mary disconnected the session and tucked her phone into her pocket, her mind in turmoil. London had made it clear that if Mary got involved with Hank, she would fire her. But she was falling in love with Hank, had begun imagining what a future with him would look like. She also loved Harper, feared what being fired would do to her. Yet another worry was that if word got around that she'd fallen for her charge's father, no one would hire her. Her career as a nanny would be over. Thoughts flying, she asked herself what would happen if she and Hank ignored all of their concerns and went for it. Assuming a relationship between them succeeded, if the repercussions were too much, would that break them? And if it did, what would happen then? Would London fight to keep Harper out of Hank's life to punish him? 
It would be bad enough for Mary to lose her job, and possibly any future as a nanny. But what would all of that do to Harper? Mary was being torn to pieces. The only solution was to put aside her attraction to Hank and focus on why she was there, to take care of Harper. Soon enough, she would go back to L.A. and her life would go on. When it was time to return to Sacramento to accompany Harper on her future visits with Hank, Mary would have to deal with her feelings then. For now, though, at that moment, she needed to stop thinking about Hank Parson in any terms except as Harper's father. Chapter 26 That evening, when Mary and Harper joined Hank for dinner, Mary wanted to have a moment alone with Hank to tell him about a conversation with London, to let him know that Simone really had talked to her. It was only fair to warn him, to make sure he knew exactly what was going on. At lunch, unable to pretend all was well, she'd avoided interacting with him, but in the intervening hours, she'd come to realize that it was silly to avoid him, that it would only make things harder. Besides, both of their focuses needed to be on Harper, not on how they felt about each other. How was swimming? Hank asked Harper as she set her glass of milk down. Good! After she went swimming, Mary said with a direct look at Hank, Harper talked to her mommy. That was news to Hank. He turned to Harper. Is that right? Yes, she's doing a movie. I know she is. What did she have to say? Hank's eyes cut to Mary. Mary nodded slightly, her lips compressed, like there was more to this story. I don't know, Harper said with a shrug, her focus on the tomatoes and her salad. Hank would have to talk to Mary alone, see why London had called in the middle of the day. The thought of being alone with Mary made him smile with anticipation. A knock sounded on Mary's door. Harper had just gone to bed, and she'd known Hank would want to talk to her, so she hadn't gotten ready for bed. Nerves singing at the idea of being alone with him, she opened her door. There he stood, looking as gorgeous as ever. No, 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 she thought. He's not gorgeous. He's Harper's father. That's it. That's all you're allowed to think about him. So control yourself. Let's go outside, he said by way of greeting. Mary nodded, and when Hank stepped back and swept his arm toward the hallway, she led the way to the back patio, sitting in the chair she was becoming more and more familiar with. Hank sat in the adjacent chair, and when the scent of his cologne wrapped around her, making her want to climb onto his lap and snuggle against him, she screamed at herself to remember the stakes. Only then did she manage to get herself under control. What did London say? he asked. Glad he was getting right to the point, which was better than talking about how they were feeling, Mary repeated the conversation she'd had with London. Staring into the distance, Hank leaned back in his chair, his mind racing, his body tense with anger. Simone actually called her. He shook his head as the semblance of a smile tugged up the corners of his mouth. Why am I not surprised? What are you going to do? He turned to Mary. Her job had been threatened, all because of him. This wasn't fair. He and Mary were both single. Getting involved wouldn't hurt anyone. Why did London have to make such a big deal out of the very possibility? Why did she have to exhibit so much control over the lives of other people, over his life? Fury at his ex-wife slashed through him. She'd left him, had cheated on him. That affair had fizzled. Was that why she didn't want him to find happiness? Because she was no longer happy? How was that his fault? Audibly sighing, he clenched his jaw as he looked at Mary. She was nothing like London. Where London was ambitious and driven, Mary was sweet and thoughtful. Where London was all about herself, Mary was willing to sacrifice for others. Now that he thought about it, Simone was much more like London than he'd realized. How had he not recognized that before now? Didn't matter anyway. It was over with Simone. She had betrayed his trust, gone behind his back to talk to his ex-wife about something that she had no business discussing with anyone. Fresh fury at Simone pounded through him, but Mary was still waiting for an answer to her question. I don't know what I'm going to do about Simone, he finally said, resigned to the idea that, for now at least, he would have to keep up the charade that he had no interest in Mary. 
Mary nodded, her eyes downcast. Seeing how she was affected by all of this drama, he frowned. He wanted nothing more than to fix everything, to bring that bright smile back to her face. Look, he said, not sure what he was going to say even as the words tumbled out of his mouth. It's no one's business how we feel about each other, whether we're interested in each other or even if we hate each other. As long as we're doing our jobs, yours as Harper's nanny, mine as Harper's father, then why is the way we feel about each other anyone else's business? Was that really what he thought? What about London's threats? Maybe he wanted to show her that she couldn't dictate his life. In reality, she couldn't, but she could dictate Mary's life, at least as far as her employment went. Was he willing to risk that? Was Hank right? Mary wondered. But what about what London had said? And did he really care so much about her that he was willing to toss aside convention and to anger London? Heart soaring at the possibility, Mary smiled. Still, she was worried. I understand what you're saying, she said, glad they were talking about this. But I'm scared. I don't want to lose my job. It's not just a job to me. I love Harper. I won't let that happen. The way he was looking at her, so focused, so intense, made her pulse pound harder. That, coupled with his words, settled her fears. She had confidence that he really could fix this. London was his ex-wife. Shouldn't he know her well enough to resolve this? Okay, she said on a release of breath. The future had just gotten considerably brighter. Now what? Chapter 27 That was a good question, and Hank answered the only way he knew how. Standing, he tugged Mary to her feet. Only a wisp of air separated them, and as he gazed down at her, he knew this was about more than showing London she wasn't in control. This was about his undeniable attraction to Mary, an attraction that had been growing every day, an attraction that he had no intention of curbing. He tucked a loose strand of hair behind her ear, then curled his hand around her neck. His gaze traced the outline of her jaw, stopping on those luscious lips, then moved to her eyes, eyes that were watching him with unmistakable wanting. Seeing his need reflected in her eyes, Hank reached out with his other hand and ran a finger across her bottom lip. Her eyes fluttered closed, and a soft sigh slipped from her mouth. He smiled, and taking advantage of her closed eyes, he bent down and pressed a soft kiss to the side of her throat, moving along the curve of her jaw. Her skin was smooth, tender, baby soft, and oh so delicious. Mary could barely stand it, the feel of his lips caressing the sensitive skin along her jaw. Desperate to have him kiss her, she nearly turned her head to meet his mouth with hers, but his hold on the back of her neck told her he didn't want her to move, so she didn't. As excruciating as it was to hold perfectly still, she did it. It was the best kind of unbearable tension. A soft sigh climbed her throat as his kisses enchanted her, captivated her, branded her. His lips were millimeters from hers, and with her eyes still closed, she held perfectly still as she anticipated his mouth claiming hers. Then it did, his lips consuming hers. Sensations uncoiled within her, and she let her body melt against his as her arms wound around his neck. Happiness and desire engulfed her as she clung to him. This was heaven. This was what she was made for. After several moments, he released her. Breathless, she gazed up at him as she took half a step back, her lips tingling. Once I got a taste of your lips, he murmured, his voice low and sexy. I couldn't go another day without tasting them again. Desire flared within her, and she smiled. Then the memory of London's face, so firm and resolute, filled her mind, along with a message that if Mary and Hank became involved, London would fire her. Mary was tempting fate. There was no doubt. That thought cooled the passion in which she'd been basking. Turned out she wasn't so sure Hank could fix this after all. She'd let her fantasies carry her away. That and her powerful yearning. We shouldn't be doing this, she said, 
her voice soft, as if she feared speaking too loud would give them away. No one was there but them. Harper was sound asleep, and Mrs. Stillman had left hours ago. Still, Mary couldn't stop the caution. A muscle worked in Hank's jaw, but his eyes never wavered from hers. I know. The acknowledgement was simple, but it wasn't what Mary wanted to hear. Deep inside, she'd hoped he would say not to worry, that he would fix everything, that they could do what they wanted. But that had been wishful thinking. The fingers of his hand wove into hers as he appraised her. No one can know about this. About us. Us, she thought. Was there an us? Mary wanted nothing more. The idea that Hank felt the same made rainbows and butterflies come to life inside her. But no one could know. Her despair must have shown on her face, because he stroked her cheek and added, Not yet. Did that mean there would be an end to the secretiveness? Hope flooded her. Was Hank making promises he wouldn't be able to keep? He wasn't sure. All he was sure of was that he wasn't willing to give this up, wasn't willing to give her up. He was falling for her. He knew that now. Trust me, Mary. I do trust you. The look in her eyes confirmed her words, which only added to the pressure. But he was used to pressure. He thrived on pressure. Good. Then he drew her against him and enveloped her in his embrace. With Hank's powerful arms around her, Mary felt the most exquisite sense of security. Nothing could hurt her. Nothing and no one. We have to be aware of Harper, he murmured beside her ear. She pulled away. What do you mean? We can't have her telling London something that will make her suspicious. Remembering how Harper had told London about Hank teaching her to play pool, Mary nodded. Right. She paused. What about Mrs. Stillman? I trust Mrs. Stillman implicitly, but just to be safe, we should be careful around her, too. Yeah. He gazed at her. I'm sorry it has to be this way. No one was sorrier than she was, but at the same time, she was glad Hank knew the stakes, knew how important it was to protect Harper from the repercussions, because if London found out, she would fire Mary, no question. Smiling sadly, she said, I'm sorry, too. He led her to the couch that sat near the chairs they'd used earlier, and they snuggled and quietly talked, and as the evening grew late, they went inside and said good night. Chapter 28 The next day, Mary took one of Hank's cars and spent hours with Harper at the Sacramento Children's Museum. He told her that Wednesdays and Thursdays were his toughest and longest days, those were the days the team had to learn the new plays in preparation for the upcoming game, so he would be home late that night. Hank didn't get home until just before Harper went to bed. He tucked her in, then went straight to Mary's room, leading her out to the game room. How was your day? he asked as he closed the door behind them. It was as if the world had disappeared and it was just the two of them. I took Harper to the Children's Museum. As you can imagine, she loved it. Seeing the carrying in her eyes, the commitment to his little girl, only made Hank fall harder for Mary. He'd missed her. When he'd had a moment to think about something other than football, his thoughts had gone straight to her. Always to her. Watching her now, he knew what he had to do, and in two long strides he closed the distance between them before pulling her into his arms and kissing her with passion. I missed you, he said as he smiled at her. If this was what keeping their relationship a secret would be like, it wouldn't be as hard as Mary had thought. Smiling up at him as he held her loosely in his arms, still feeling the thrill of his kiss, she relaxed. We should play pool, she said with a grin. His head tilted. Oh yeah? You want another lesson? The memory of him pressed against her stirred something within her. Maybe, but I might not need one. I've been practicing. He looked suitably impressed. Really? Well, just today so far, but I can hit a ball into a pocket. She'd practiced a bit while Harper had played with her collection of Play-Doh, and now she felt more comfortable using the cue. Okay, you're on. He racked the balls, then turned to her. Do you want a break? Smiling with more confidence than she felt, she nodded. 
Yeah. He stepped back and motioned toward the table. All yours. Loving how easy it was to be with him, how comfortable she felt, how she could be herself, she chalked her cue and stepped up to the table. Setting the narrow end of the cue on the fingers of her left hand, she lined it up with the white ball as she held the wider end with her right hand, then she slid the cue back and forth a couple of times before shoving it forward and hitting the white ball. It slammed into the triangle of balls, and the balls scattered. None of them rolled into a pocket, but Mary didn't care. She was just having fun. Besides, the balls had scattered pretty well. It was better than any of her practice breaks. She turned to Hank with a smile. Guess it's your turn. He chuckled, then chalked his cue and proceeded to pocket five striped balls, one after the other. Finally, he missed. I wasn't sure I was going to get a turn, she said with a grin as she stepped forward. He laughed. Mary lined the white ball up with a solid ball that was close to a pocket and managed to hit it in. She couldn't help but throw a proud smile at Hank. Knowing his eyes were on her sent a tingle radiating to the tips of her fingers and toes. Turning her focus back to the game, which was difficult with him having such an effect on her, she managed to hit another solid ball into a pocket before missing on her third try. It didn't take long for him to finish off the stripes before hitting the eight ball in. His expertise was sexy. You make that look easy, Hank, she said with a smile. Her praise warmed him, but he wanted more out of this. Let's make this interesting. What do you have in mind? The way she stood there, looking so sweet, so beautiful, he almost swept her into his arms, but he held back. Right now he wanted to get to know her better. Whenever one of us hits a ball into a pocket, that person gets to ask the other a question, and the person being asked has to answer, and the answer has to be the complete truth. Her lips curved upward. You're on. He laughed. You realize I'll be asking most of the questions. Confident much? He smiled as he racked the balls, then he turned to her with a playful grin. I'll break this time. All right. With another look her way, a look that almost made him set his cue down and go to her for another taste of those delectable lips, he promised himself he would get several more kisses from her before the night was through. Anticipation surged through him as he hit the break shot. Balls scattered, and a striped ball rolled into a pocket. He faced her with a grin. Okay, first question. He would have lots of chances to ask questions, so he would make the first one simple. Chapter 29 Mary stood on the opposite side of the table from Hank, and when he sauntered toward her, she held her ground. Would he kiss her again? She desperately hoped so. All three of his kisses had been the most amazing kisses she'd ever experienced. If he didn't kiss her again, she might just have to take the initiative and kiss him first. Eagerness threaded through her, and when he stopped three feet in front of her, she nearly held her breath. He smiled down at her. I'll start off easy. What's your favorite color? Tilting her head as if to say, that's easy, yet it's not, she replied, lavender, but not just a basic lavender more of a lavender with pale gray undertones. Hank burst out laughing, leave it to an artist to turn such a simple question into a complicated one. Grinning, Mary said, it's still your turn. Yes, it is. He went back to the pool table, lined up his shot, and the ball zipped right into the pocket. He turned to her with a smirk. Maybe a harder question will actually be easy. Who knows? Worth a try. All right. What do you like to paint? I like to paint both portraits and landscapes. Her lips tilted upwards. I hope I'll get the chance to ask you some questions soon. He smirked. Don't hold your breath. Then he turned back to the pool table. Mary watched as he neatly put another ball into a pocket, not able to stop herself from admiring everything about him. Dang, she was falling for him hard. This had the potential to bring a lot of heartache. She knew it, but there was no way to stop it, even if she wanted to. Third question, he said as he faced her. Okay. Staring at his handsome face, she wanted to fall into his arms, but she kept herself under control. What do you like to do in your free time, besides painting? That was easy. I like to read. 
He smiled an easy grin. I think I need to come up with something more difficult. He turned back to the pool table, then said over his shoulder, Just give me a second. She laughed, and when he missed his next shot, she smirked. That's what overconfidence will get you. Maybe I wanted to give you a chance. She shook her head. No way. You would never miss on purpose. That's true. Mary managed to knock a ball into a pocket. Not wanting to waste this chance to ask a penetrating question, she went right for the jugular. How do you feel about Simone? I mean, besides being mad at her for talking to London. Hank went still, and Mary knew it had been the right question to ask. Remember, she said, you have to tell the complete truth. His jaw clenched. I can see I was being way too easy on you. One side of her mouth quirked up. That's not my fault. He softly chuckled as he shook his head. Then he walked to the window and looked outside, before turning around and sauntering over to her, stopping several feet away, his eyes boring into hers. What is it you really want to know, Marigold? Hearing him use her full name did interesting things to her heart, especially when he used his low and sexy voice to say it. Not letting that distract her, she asked herself what it was she wanted to know. Well, she began, you've been dating her a while, right? So are you going to keep dating her? Do you... do you love her? Hank frowned. As with everything right now, it's complicated. Complicated, she repeated. That wasn't a word she wanted to hear in relation to Simone. How so? Hank could see it was important to Mary that he answer this as fully as possible. First off... No, I don't love her. I don't think I ever did. The more he thought about it, the more he realized how much like London Simone was, the more he knew he could never love her. Not now that he'd met Mary, someone so different from both women. He knew she wouldn't like the other half of his answer. As far as dating her, I'm between a rock and a hard place, Mary. He huffed out a breath. Simone told London that she would. He did air quotes keep an eye on things. If I tell her I'm done with her, she'll go straight to London. That could be a problem. He frowned. No, that would be a problem. A big one. Mary's lips flattened, then she closed her eyes and shook her head. He stepped forward and pulled her into his arms. This wasn't right, the way things were out of their control, and he hated it. But he loved the feel of her as she sank against him. Couldn't get enough of that. He lifted her chin, and when their eyes met, he lowered his lips until they were pressed against hers. When her arms went around his neck, he kissed her with a passion he hadn't felt in a very, very long time. After several moments, they separated, and he took a step back. He wanted more, so much more, but things were too complicated for that. It's still your turn, he said, as he forced his thoughts back to pool. Mary had to catch her breath. Every time Hank kissed her, it was as if he stole her breath right out of her body. But she loved it. Okay, she said as she picked up her cue, chalking it while she got her breathing under control. She lined up her next shot, and to her surprise, the ball rolled into the pocket. Nice, Hank said. She turned to him with a grin. Another question. Go easy on me. She laughed. <laughs> you wish? Then she considered what to ask. There was one thing she really wanted to know, something he may not even have an answer to, but she still had to ask. How far are you willing to go for me? He tilted his head. What do you mean? If London finds out that we're, you know, becoming involved, what would you do? Would you deny everything? Would you dump me? Her voice softened. Or would you, would you fight for me? The truth was, Hank didn't know, and he wasn't sure it was fair of her to ask him. It was so early in their relationship, and he didn't know what hammer London would hold over him. Would she threaten to reduce his visitations with Harper? That wasn't a risk he was willing to take, but he didn't want to tell Mary she wasn't worth fighting for. In moments, he was in front of her. Placing his hands on her upper arms, he stared straight into her eyes, I care about you, Mary. I've grown to care about you more every day. 
That doesn't answer my question. Her voice was just above a whisper. He didn't know what to say. You don't know, she said. Do you? He felt like a complete jerk. Why couldn't he declare that he would go to the ends of the earth for her? Because he didn't know that for sure. Straightening, he dropped his hands to his sides. You want me to be honest? Yes. I don't know what I would do. That's my honest answer. She nodded, but he could read the disappointment in her eyes. Good night, Hank. Before he could think of something to say, she walked past him and out the door. Was he losing her already? The very idea brought a sharp pain to his chest. Chapter 30 The monkeys are my favorite, Harper said, as she and Mary wandered around the Sacramento Zoo. Why are they your favorite? Because they climb the trees. Can I have some bubble gum? Mary laughed. You mean bubble gum? I said bubble gum. Smiling, Mary knelt in front of Harper and gave her a hug. Do you know how adorable you are? Harper laughed. I know. That only made Mary laugh harder. Of course you do. And yes, you can have some bubble gum. She took a piece out of her purse and handed it to Harper. Now how about we go see the giraffes? Giraffes! Yay! That afternoon, as she and Harper played in the pool, Mary's thoughts went to Hank. His answer the night before hadn't been what she'd been hoping for, but she was grateful he'd been honest. She would give him credit for that. But what about her? How far was she willing to go for him? What if London confronted her about Hank? Would she deny it? Come to think of it, she'd already told London that there was nothing between them. But what if London knew for sure? What if she gave Mary one last chance to choose between her job and Hank? Would she dump him? Or would she fight for him? Her eyes went to Harper, who was happily splashing around in the pool. Mary truly loved her. Couldn't imagine spending her days without her. Was she willing to lose her job, lose Harper, for a chance with Hank? What if she took that chance and it didn't work out? She would lose both Harper and Hank. Was the risk worth it? When she realized her own answer was ambiguous, her disappointment in Hank vanished. She couldn't hold his honest answer against him, not when she didn't know what she would do. She would apologize for running out on him. Tonight. Are you up for a game of pool? Hank asked when he knocked on Mary's door after tucking Harper in. He'd been home for less than an hour, but the idea of spending time with Mary had given him a burst of energy. The night before, after she'd left the game room, he thought a lot about her question. His answer hadn't changed, but he didn't want to end things with her. Instead, he wanted to convince her not to give up on him. Sure, she said, with more enthusiasm than he'd expected. He'd kind of presumed she would turn him down and tell him there was no point in spending time together if he wasn't willing to fight for her. He led the way down the stairs and into the game room, the room he was almost beginning to think of as their room. Do you want to play ping pong tonight? He grinned. Have you been practicing? She laughed. No, Harper and I were busy doing other things today. We didn't even come in here. The reminder of why she was at his house was like a bucket of ice being dumped on him. Right. She must have sensed his change of mood. What's wrong? Glancing toward the couch, he said, Let's sit. Without a word, she glided over to the couch and settled onto its cushions. He sat beside her, and when the floral scent that was uniquely marigold wrapped around him, his entire body calmed. How did she manage to do that? I'm sorry I... she began, while at the same time he said, I need to explain. Then they both laughed. <laughs> Ladies first. With a brief nod, she said, I'm sorry I walked out last night. I should have, I don't know, talked it over with you. He completely agreed, although he didn't know what he would have said in that moment. It's okay, Mary. I understand. We can talk now. She glanced at her lap before meeting his eyes with a nod. Okay. Like I said last night, I really care for you. I might even be. Did he want to say it? I might be falling for you. Mary's heart nearly burst with joy. Did he mean it? He was falling for her? Then he went on. 
But. Why did there always have to be a but? But, he said again, his voice softer. We can't broadcast our feelings. Not yet. He scraped his hands through his hair. Let me talk to London when she gets back to L.A. What would you tell her? I don't know yet. Though thrilled he was willing to go to bat for her, for them, she was still worried about what London would do. She remembered reading about an incident that had happened years ago, before London was famous. London had been up for the same part as another actress, a woman who was an acquaintance of hers. The rumor was that London had known that the other actress was having personal problems, problems that could end up being an issue on set. London had secretly recorded the other actress talking about those problems, and had then anonymously sent the recording to the producer of the movie. The other actress had been passed over, and London had been hired. It was the movie that had launched her into stardom. Did Hank know about that incident? Mary wasn't sure how many people had heard about it. She'd only found out through her entertainment attorney father. He told her about it when she'd announced she was going to nanny for London. I don't want to get fired, she said now. I'd miss Harper so much. And what would it do to Harper? Hank stroked her cheek, sending tingles cascading through her. See, that's something I love about you. Harper is very important to you. He smiled. That's priceless. Maybe this isn't worth it, Hank. Not if it will affect Harper. He straightened and scrubbed his hands over his face. Then he met her eyes. You're right. She didn't want to be right. She wanted to be completely and utterly wrong. Why couldn't he tell her it was totally worth it, that everything would be fine? Because she was falling in love with him. Totally and without question. A shard of ice slid into her heart, one that would inevitably break her heart in two. Hank didn't like admitting that there was little hope of Mary keeping her job if she got involved with him. Hated it, truth be told. But he wasn't going to pretend. Not when it came to Harper. I'm not ready. Mary's voice was just above a whisper. Her eyes pointed to her hands twisting in her lap. Not ready for what? She lifted her gaze, and the sadness in her eyes gutted him. To give you up. His breath came out in a rush. He wasn't ready either. Frustration at London and her controlling ways washed over him. Without thinking twice, he tugged Mary against him, his arms enveloping her in a powerful embrace, his cheek pressed against her hair. I've got this, he said, determined to make that true. Mary pulled away enough to look at him. How? Before he had a chance to answer, his phone rang. Frowning, he pulled his phone out of his pocket, read the name on the screen, then looked at Mary with a scowl. It's Simone. Panic swept over Mary. What if Simone knew she and Hank were snuggling on the couch? Was there some way she could see? Frantically looking in the direction of the window and toward the empty house, Mary said, You'd better talk to her. Grimacing, Hank nodded, then he swiped to answer. Mary barely listened to his side of the conversation, her mind racing with what he'd meant when he'd said, I've got this. Did he really? Or was he placating her? A few minutes later, he put his phone away. What did she say? A muscle worked in Hank's jaw. I'm going out with her tomorrow night. Wishing more than anything that he could tell Simone it was over, Mary only nodded in mute acceptance. I'm sorry, but until I meet with London, this is how it will have to be. As much as she hated it, Mary understood. I know. You don't deserve this. She wasn't the only one affected. Neither do you. With his attention focused on her, he smiled. Are you really this perfect? Grinning, she said, yes, and don't you forget it. Laughter burst from his mouth. <laughs> That's what I thought, which is why I can't wait another second to do this. Then he gathered her onto his lap, cupped her face with his hands, and pulled her down so that her mouth crushed his. Mary slid her hands behind his head, her fingers curling into his hair, holding on to him like he was the only thing keeping her alive, the only thing worth living for. His arms moved to her waist, and his grip was so tight that she couldn't move. But that was fine with her. She didn't want to move from that spot for the rest of her life. 
Chapter 31 Early Friday afternoon, Mary heard the front door open. She and Harper were playing Go Fish Alphabet in the family room, practicing Harper's letters. I think your daddy's home, she said to Harper, wanting to leap up and run to him herself. Yay, Harper said, dropping her cards on the table and racing to the front door. Oh, what would it be like if the three of them were a family? That fantasy had crept into her mind more than once. It wasn't good for her to think that way. Not when they couldn't even admit that they had feelings for each other. Not when he was going out with another woman that very night. Holding back a frown, when she heard his voice as he greeted Harper, she couldn't restrain herself any longer. She jumped to her feet, then forced herself to calmly walk into the entryway. Hello, she said, with eyes only for him. Harper had her arms around him, her face snuggled into his neck. His lips slowly curved upward, a smile meant just for her. Mesmerized by his very presence, Mary felt her heart pounding as she recalled the way he kissed her the night before. "'How's my Princess Pink Rose?' he said. Then he winked at Mary, his gaze never wavering from her face. "'We went swimming,' Harper said, as she pulled away and looked at him. "'You did?' His gaze slid to Mary, and at the look in his eye, her whole body heated. Maybe I can go swimming with you tomorrow. Today, Harper said. I'm sorry, Princess Pinkrose. I have to leave in an hour. Harper's lower lip slid into a pout, and she crossed her arms. Paint my nails, Daddy, please. He laughed. I think I have time to do that. Her pout vanished. He set her down and turned to Mary. Can Mary help me? Harper nodded with enthusiasm. Great. Meet me by the pool in a few minutes and bring all of your nail painting supplies. Okay. Ten minutes later, Hank was sitting beside Mary, with Harper across from them. Even though he couldn't kiss Mary, couldn't even touch her, he loved that she was there, was part of his time with Harper. There's already polish on your nails, he said to Harper with mock confusion. What am I supposed to do? Harper giggled. You have to take it off, Daddy. Take it off? You mean, like with an eraser? Or maybe I should chew it off? That sent her into gales of laughter. No, you use the green stuff. Hank's eyes widened. Green stuff? Like grass? No, she said with another burst of giggles. She pointed to a bottle sitting on the ground in front of Mary. That stuff! He picked it up and examined it, then unscrewed the cap and sniffed it, before pulling it away with his mouth puckered. That doesn't smell very good. You want me to put it on your nails? Harper nodded like this was a serious thing. Yes, you have to or it won't come off. Okay, if you say so. Twenty minutes later, the old polish was off and the new was on. He was getting pretty good at this. What do you think? He asked Harper. She admired her fingers and toes. It's pretty. Yes, it is. Can you push me on the swing? Of course. I'd love to. They all stood and made their way to the playset, with Harper racing ahead. Hank had to get ready for his date with Simone soon, but dang it if he was going to let her dictate his time with his daughter. Tempted to call her and cancel, especially as Mary walked next to him, he gritted his teeth. As a kind of rebellious move, he took Mary's hand, which earned him a surprised look. Smiling at her, when her lovely face lit up, he gently squeezed her hand. This fed right into Mary's fantasy. Her, Hank, and Harper. A happy family enjoying a beautiful September afternoon, painting nails and playing on swings. Could her life be any more perfect? Yes, her mind screamed. It would be perfect if it was real. Another part of her argued that it was real, completely real. Just because they had to keep their feelings a secret didn't make them any less real. Push me, Daddy, Harper called from the swing. Hank released Mary's hand with a look of regret, and she desperately wanted to slip her hand back into his, to feel him close to her, his arms securely holding her, his lips claiming hers. That would have to wait, no matter how difficult, and when they no longer had to keep their love a secret, it would be all the sweeter. Coming, Princess Pink Rose, Hank called out as he jogged toward Harper. 
Mary watched him go, her heart contracting with love and longing. The last few evenings with him had been wonderful, but tonight she would be on her own, and she knew the only thing she would be able to think about would be him out with Simone. Frowning, she reached the playset and watched him push Harper on the swing. Chapter 32 Saturday morning, Mary woke early. She hadn't slept well, tossing and turning all night as she wondered what was happening on Hank's date with Simone. Where had they gone? What had they done? How late had they stayed out? Throwing the covers off, Mary climbed out of bed and quickly showered before going into Harper's room. Harper's long blonde hair was spread out on her pillow, and soft snores filled the room. Smiling, Mary left and went downstairs. When she heard Hank talking to Mrs. Stillman, her heart raced. The sound of his voice left her yearning for his arms to be wrapped around her, for his eyes to be focused on her, for his mouth to be on hers. But when she pictured him embracing Simone, focusing on Simone, kissing Simone, pain radiated throughout her chest. Softly sighing, she entered the kitchen. Pushing a bright smile onto her face, she said, Good morning. Hank and Mrs. Stillman, who were both standing next to the counter as they chatted, turned to her. Good morning, Mrs. Stillman said, but her usual bright smile had dimmed. Wondering what was going on, Mary looked to Hank, whose gaze went right to her, his eyes never wavering. Good morning. A small smile lifted his lips. She approached the pair, stopping when she reached them. Though her mind refused to stop thinking about Hank and Simone, she could see something else was happening. Mrs. Stillman was just telling me that her husband is having foot surgery on Monday. Mary turned to Mrs. Stillman. Oh my goodness, I hope it's nothing serious. Is there anything I can do? Mrs. Stillman placed a hand on Mary's arm with a warm smile. It's a minor procedure, and thank you for offering, but we'll be fine. She glanced at Hank. I was just telling Hank that I'll be gone all next week to care for my husband. We were discussing what to do. Without missing a beat, Mary said, I can help out. She smiled. I do know how to cook. Are you sure? Of course. Harper can help me. We'll have a blast. Relief filled both Hank's and Mrs. Stillman's faces. That would be a great help. Some nights we can order in, but if you can take care of the other meals, that would be awesome. No problem. This would even add to Mary's fantasy that she, Hank, and Harper were a family. They would have the house to themselves all week, just the three of them. Excited now, she said. Harper and I can go to the grocery store this weekend to prepare. It'll be fun. Mrs. Stillman laughed. I'm glad you'll enjoy it. I will. It'll be a change of pace. They discussed a few other duties that Mary would take over, primarily laundry and keeping the house tidy. Then when Harper wandered into the kitchen, Mrs. Stillman made French toast. Hank was beyond impressed that Mary had volunteered to basically take over all of Mrs. Stillman's work on top of caring for Harper. He knew women did all of those things all the time. But since Mary was still willing to when she didn't have to, it touched him. Another reason he was falling in love with her. He could never imagine London or Simone offering to take on the cooking, laundry, and cleaning. No, both of them would hire a service, no question. As he pictured Simone, he thought about their date the night before. Despite his severe irritation with her, the evening had gone reasonably well. They'd gone to dinner and a play, but when Simone had suggested they go dancing, he'd begged off, claiming he was too tired, that he had to get his rest before Sunday's game. They'd called it a night relatively early, and as he'd driven home, he'd harbored a secret hope that Mary would be up, waiting for him. Of course, she hadn't been, and he'd been disappointed. Now, though, he looked forward to the coming week when they could spend time together. They would have to be careful around Harper, of course, but other than that, they wouldn't have to hide their searing attraction for one another. Hank sat with Mary and Harper as they ate breakfast. I'll be gone for a few hours this morning, but I'll come home for the afternoon before I leave again to check in at the hotel. I thought your game was at home tomorrow. It is, but when we have home games, the entire team stays at a hotel the night before. I don't have to check in until seven, though. Why does the team stay in a hotel when you could stay in your own house? 
It's a good way to make sure everyone is ready for Sunday's game. Plus, we usually have a last-minute team meeting, and on Sunday morning, they feed us the right kind of breakfast to get us ready. Also, when everyone's together, no one will be late to the stadium. That makes sense. He studied her. Are you going to watch the game? Her lips immediately lifted into a smile. Of course. Then she put an arm around Harper. Right, Harper? We're going to watch your daddy on TV tomorrow. Uh-huh, Harper said, around a mouthful of French toast. Hank laughed, pleased to know that Mary would be watching him. So much had changed between them over the last week. They had to keep their budding relationship secret, but knowing she was there for him, that she was his, did something special to his heart. Chapter 33 Mary had finished going over some final instructions with Mrs. Stillman, who would be leaving that afternoon and not returning for another week, when Hank walked into Harper's room, where she and Mary were sorting Harper's laundry. "'What are you ladies doing?' Hank asked. "'Harper, tell your daddy what you learned today.' A serious expression came over her face as she pointed to the clothes on the floor. "'You have to make two piles, Daddy.' "'How come?' "'So you don't get them mixed up.' Mary laughed. Harper learned how to separate the light-colored clothes from the dark ones. She smiled at Harper. Because we don't want everything to turn gray, right? Right, Harper said with a firm nod. Good idea. So, he said, with a meaningful look at Mary, do you ladies want to go for a swim? Harper pumped her fists into the air as she jumped up and down. Swimming! Mary? Sounds like fun, Mary said with a shy smile. And with any luck, Simone wouldn't show up and ruin it again. Great, I'll throw on my swim trunks and meet you out by the pool in a bit. A short time later, Mary and Harper walked out to the pool. Hank was already in the water, and as Mary removed her cover-up, revealing her blue bikini, she was very aware of Hank's eyes on her. Glancing his way, when she saw the lazy smile lifting the corners of his mouth, she had to push down the burst of heat that swept over her. Ready to get in? She asked Harper. I need my floaties. Mary helped her put them on, then walked her to the edge of the pool. Jump in, Hank said, his arms open, ready to catch her. Harper smiled brightly, and after only a second's hesitation, she leapt into Hank's arms. Mary wanted to do the same, but instead, she demurely walked to the stairs and waded into the cool turquoise water, then made her way to Hank and Harper. Hank grinned as she reached him. There you are. Yes, here I am. Harper was busy splashing and kicking, not paying attention to the adults, which is when Mary felt Hank's hand slip into hers under the water. Gripping his hand, she gazed into his eyes, her love for him filling her heart. Then Mary looked toward the house. Don't worry, Hank said, drawing her attention back to him. I told Mrs. Stillman not to let anyone in, even Simone. Feeling more relaxed, Mary smiled, her hand still clutching his. Look at me, Harper called. They both turned to her. She was about ten feet away and doing her best to swim toward them. Look at you, Hank said, as he released Mary's hand and moved in Harper's direction. Smiling as she watched them, Mary made her way to them. Let's play shark, Harper said when they were together. Hank looked at Mary with a grin. I'll be the shark. A thrill went through her at the look in his eyes. Then she grabbed Harper's hands and swam backwards, with Hank trailing a few feet behind Harper. Go, Mary, go, Harper squealed. The shark's gonna get me. Mary laughed and swam as fast as she could, which wasn't all that fast, especially going backwards. It didn't take long for Hank to catch them, and when he grabbed Harper, she screamed in terror, a huge grin on her face. Got you, Hank said. Mary released Harper's hands and laughed with them. They did this a few more times, and then Harper said to Hank, Now you get Mary! Hank looked at Mary, his lips curving into a smile that sent a burst of heat pulsing through her. She loved the idea of Hank chasing her, especially because he would easily catch her. But would Harper tell London about it? 
Your daddy's too fast for me, she said, as she tossed a look of warning at Hank. He's the shark, Harper said. Hank read the warning on Mary's face, but the opportunity was too good to pass up. That's right, he said to Harper. I'm the shark, but I think Mary's a scaredy cat. Harper giggled, and when he looked at Mary, she was frowning. I'm sorry, that wasn't nice. No, it wasn't. He moved closer to her, wishing he could kiss her, but knowing that would be foolish with Harper watching. Instead, he reached under the water and stroked her back, eliciting a soft gasp from her. I think it's time for me to get out. Why? I just... She shook her head as she glanced toward Harper, who had turned and begun swimming away. I can't do this right now. Mary made her way to the edge of the pool. Hang on, he said, before following her to the edge. At his words, she turned, her back to the side of the pool. Hank looked toward Harper, and after making sure she was swimming the other way, he moved close to Mary, trapping her between the wall and his body. Hank, Mary said, her body on fire as he pressed against her. Shh. He pressed a finger to her lips. Then, after he glanced toward Harper once more, he kissed her with a passion that took her by surprise. Daddy! Harper called out, and he sprang away from Mary. Mary's head jerked in Harper's direction, but she wasn't looking their way. Heaving a sigh of relief, Mary smiled at Hank, whose eyes crinkled as he smiled in return. What is it, baby? Hank asked. Look at me, she said. Hank laughed, then after tossing another smile at Mary, he swam away. Mary watched him go, her heart brimming with love, while her mind reminded her that this could all fall apart at any moment. Chapter 34 Is my daddy on TV? Harper asked the next day as she and Mary sat on the couch in the family room, ready to watch the game. Only the two of them were in the house. Mrs. Stillman was spending time with her husband before his surgery the next day, and the only sound came from the TV. He'll be on in a minute, Mary said, eager to see him. After they'd finished swimming the day before, she and Hank had played games with Harper and taken turns reading to her, and after Hank had grilled chicken for dinner, he'd had to leave for the hotel. After he told Harper goodbye, he pulled Mary out of Harper's view and held her in his arms for an extended embrace before kissing her one last time. Her love for him grew with every kiss, and despite having to keep their relationship a secret, she was happier than she'd ever been. There he is, Mary said as the offense took the field. Love and pride mingled within her, and she couldn't wipe the smile from her face as she watched him play. He did well, making several first downs before being tackled each time. She remembered how he'd flinched when he'd pick Harper up the previous Monday, the day after his game, and as she watched the huge men fall on top of him, she cringed on his behalf. By the time the second half began, the Vipers were tied, but they had possession of the ball. Mary grinned as she realized how much she'd learned about football already. She watched as quarterback Josh Weisner handed the ball off to Hank. Hank took off at a sprint. No one was near him, and he was 30 yards from the end zone. Mary leapt to her feet, shouting, Go! 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 Harper did the same, and Mary smiled while keeping her eyes glued to the TV. As Mary watched, she noticed Hank do a little hop as his free hand reached for his left leg, but he kept running. As she saw him nearly fall... Her smile slid from her face and she went silent. Something was wrong. So very, very wrong. Heart pounding with worry, Mary watched as Hank, only a few yards from the end zone, began to stumble. Despite that, he reached the end zone, tumbling to the ground. Touchdown! He didn't get up, and he was in obvious pain. After a few moments, he rolled onto his back. What had happened? Was he okay? Heart racing with fear and worry, Mary stared at the TV. The voice of the announcer broke through her troubled mind, and she heard him say something about a pulled hamstring. Was that bad? What would that mean for Hank? Daddy fell down, Harper said. Creases had formed on her forehead. 
Sitting on the couch, Mary pulled Harper onto her lap, holding her close. Your daddy's fine. We'll see him in a few hours. All the while, she stared at the TV, watching as people rushed to Hank's side, kneeling beside him, talking to him. The TV replayed the touchdown, and Mary gritted her teeth, frantic to see what was happening with Hank. Finally, the screen went back to Hank, who was being helped off the field, his left foot barely touching the ground as he hobbled onto the sidelines. Sitting in silence as the game proceeded, Mary hardly watched. The only reason she kept it on was to see if the announcers gave some sort of update on Hank. They didn't, and by the time the game was over and the Vipers had won, Mary was desperate for Hank to get home. She remembered the way he'd kissed her goodbye the previous afternoon, and without conscious thought, she touched her lips with her fingers. I'm hungry, Harper said. Glad for something to do, Mary stood. Me too. Will you help me scoop out a watermelon? Harper nodded, her eyes wide as she smiled. That evening, the moment Mary heard the front door opening, she turned to Harper. Your daddy's home. They were sitting on the couch watching a princess movie, but they both jumped up and raced to meet him in the entry. Earlier, Mary had explained to Harper that her daddy had a sore leg, so when they reached him, Harper stopped short of flinging herself at him like she usually did. Instead, she smiled up at him. Mary's instinct was to throw her arms around him, but she held back, not only because Harper was there, but because she wasn't sure how he was feeling. You're home, she said instead, certain her eyes broadcast her love and concern. Yep, Hank said with a half smile. Mary stepped back so he could come inside, and as he passed her, his hand slid into hers for a moment. Love surged through her, and she followed him into the family room, noting his limp. Seeing Mary and Harper brightened an otherwise less than stellar day. Yeah, the Vipers had won, and yeah, his touchdown had made all the difference, but pulling his hamstrings sucked, and he was angry at himself. Maybe if he'd done more conditioning on his legs he could have prevented it. Then again, maybe not. But now he would most likely miss the next couple of games. How are you? Mary asked as she sat beside him, concern clear on her lovely face. Right now he needed her, wanted to feel her in his arms, her lips on his. Harper, would you go into my room and find my phone? Harper nodded, then she ran out of the room. Hank didn't hesitate. He pulled Mary against him with a sly smile. That ought to give us a minute or two. Mary exulted in the feel of his embrace, snuggling against him as she wrapped her arms around his neck. After a few moments, she lifted her head and kissed him with all the yearning in her heart. Their kiss was filled with love and longing, and she never wanted it to end. When she heard Harper coming down the stairs, she reluctantly put some space between them, although she couldn't quite make herself release his hand, not yet. But when Harper entered the room, she let go. I can't find it, Harper said. That's okay, sweetheart, Hank said. Then he patted the couch cushion beside him. Come sit by me. Harper bounced onto the couch and wrapped her little arms around his larger one before pressing her cheek against it. Mary was on his other side, and when Hank took her hand, she eagerly accepted it. This is just what I needed. Tell me about your leg, Mary said, not able to wait a moment longer. It's an awesome leg, Hank said with a smirk, all muscle and power. Gently shoving his shoulder, she laughed. <laughs> Stop it. He chuckled. It's a strain, not a tear. Should take a couple of weeks to heal. That's not too bad, right? She desperately hoped that was true. Could be a lot worse, that's for sure. He appraised her. Good thing I have you to take care of me. Mary's heart nearly burst with love as she nodded. Are you hungry? The need to take care of him was powerful, and she would do anything to bring him comfort. I could eat. I can do something about that. She released his hand and stood, then smiled as she looked at Harper, who was snuggling against Hank as she watched the movie they'd left on. Mary's eye shifted to Hank. His lips curved in a smile that seemed to say he appreciated her for being there for him. With her heart brimming with love, she walked into the kitchen. Chapter 35 
Early the next morning, while Mary was making breakfast, Hank came into the kitchen. Good morning, beautiful. Harper was still in bed, so it was just the two of them. She turned around, and when he reached her, walking with obvious discomfort, she threw her arms around him and held him tight. Now that's a nice way to be greeted, he murmured into her ear. She smiled, then pulled back and looked at him. He pressed his mouth to hers, then slid his fingers through her hair. Finally, he released her, his gaze unfaltering. I want you to know how happy you make me, how glad I am that you're in my life. Heart soaring at his words, she couldn't stop smiling. You make me happy too, Hank, so very happy. That was such an understatement. He filled her with joy, excitement, love. She didn't want to think about how hard it would be when London sent for her and Harper. It had been nearly two weeks since she and Harper had arrived in Sacramento. The filming London was doing now would be finished soon. Mary had put that completely out of her mind, instead focusing on the present, but now that the end was drawing closer, she couldn't ignore it any longer. Still, at that moment, she didn't want to think about it. What are you making? Hank asked with a glance at the stove. Oh! Mary raced to the stove to flip the bacon over. Then she glanced at Hank over her shoulder as she laughed. <laughs> that was close. He walked up behind her and put his arms around her, then rested his chin on her head. Leaning back against his powerful chest, Mary closed her eyes and relished the moment. She needed to relish every moment, because she didn't know how many more they would have. I was thinking of making omelets and smoothies. She turned in his arms. Does that sound good to you? She loved cooking for him, more than she thought she would. That sounds perfect. He smiled down at her, before kissing her slowly and thoroughly. The sound of Harper coming down the stairs reached them, and with terrible reluctance, Mary gently pushed Hank away. He frowned, but he stepped back. Mary busied herself with gathering the ingredients for the omelet, setting everything on the counter. What's on your schedule today? Today, Hank said, as he picked Harper up and set her on a bar stool before taking one himself. Today I'll get my hamstring worked on. But today's an easy day, right? Since you guys won? Yeah. My main focus for the next couple of weeks will be getting my hamstring healed so I can get back on the field. Mary held back a grimace. She'd hated seeing Hank tackled, but it was even worse when she'd seen him nearly writhing in the end zone, especially since she wasn't there with him, couldn't do anything to help him. She whisked the eggs in a bowl, then looked up at him. Does that mean you won't be playing in Sunday's game? At the frown on his face, she had her answer. Hank hated that he had to miss any games at all, but he had to give his hamstring time to heal. With any luck, I'll just miss one or two games. Mary nodded, but he could see she was worried. It'll be fine. He said that as much to comfort her as to comfort himself. He really did believe this would be a short-lived issue. He would be back on the field in no time. After enjoying a hearty breakfast with his favorite ladies, he kissed Harper goodbye, then sent her upstairs to brush her teeth, taking the opportunity to hold Mary in his arms and kiss her until she melted against him. His feelings for her had grown much deeper than he would have thought possible in such a short period of time. He was in love with her, plain and simple, but this thing with London and with Simone added a layer of complication that frustrated him beyond measure. I'll be home after lunch, he said to Mary, then he kissed her once more before walking out the door. Mary was done with the painting of Harper, and she decided it would be a wonderful gift for Hank. She and Harper were in their art studio, Mary putting the finishing touches on the painting, and Harper doing more finger paintings, her favorite form of art lately. Do you need more paint? Mary asked, as she looked Harper's way. I need more pink, Harper said, as she used a finger to paint a flower. Mary squirted a bit of pink paint on the paper, then pointed to a colorful winged creature on the right side of the paper. What's that? A flutterby. Mary smiled. A butterfly? Uh-huh. Harper dipped her finger in the pink paint and drew lines radiating out from the yellow center of a flower. I love the colors you chose for your butterfly, and the pink flower is very pretty. Thank you. Mary smiled again, then she went back to her own easel. 
She wanted to surprise Hank with a painting, so she took the canvas off the easel and tucked it in a corner where it could dry without being seen. Then she put a fresh canvas up and thought about what to paint next. All Hank wanted was to hang out with Mary and Harper. He pulled into his driveway, parked in his garage, and shut off the engine. His hamstring was tender from being worked over, but that did little to distract him from his typical Monday-after-a-game soreness. Groaning as he climbed out of his car, he turned his mind to how he would spend the rest of the day. Though he would need to take time to study game film, he was eager to be with Mary and Harper, and when he didn't see them in the house, he went straight to the game room slash art studio. They didn't see him when he walked in, so he took a moment to observe Mary kneeling beside Harper, showing her how to use her fingertips to create orange, yellow, and red leaves on a tree. Watching her, he thought about her selfless nature, her sweet way with Harper, her talent and passion for painting, and how beautiful she was both inside and out. She was an amazing woman, a woman he wanted in his life, all the time. He could see a life with her. The idea kind of shocked him, but the more he considered it, the more he wanted it, the more he wanted her. Mary was the woman for him. He was sure of it. Smiling, he watched them a moment longer, and when Mary lifted her head and saw him, her face lit up in a way that told him exactly how she felt about him. Hank, she said, before pushing herself to her feet. His smile only grew as she approached him. She stopped several feet away, then glanced behind her at Harper. My hands are dirty, Harper said, holding up her paint-covered hands. Let's get you washed up, she said. Then she glanced at Hank with a smile before turning back to Harper. Then you can give your daddy a big hug. Okay. Harper ran into the bathroom, and Hank waited while Mary helped her get cleaned up. When they were done, Harper raced to him, then stopped. Does your leg hurt, Daddy? He bent to kneel in front of her, but his injured hamstring made it painful, so he straightened. Yeah, it does, but I'll be okay. It will get better soon. He held out his hand, and she placed her hand in his. Let's sit on the couch, then you can give me a hug. Okay. They walked together, and after he sat down and pulled Harper onto his lap for a hug, he looked at Mary. She smiled softly, then joined them, sitting beside him on the couch. He liked this, and it felt so right. The three of them, like they were a family. But when he remembered that he and Mary had to keep their feelings a secret, even from Harper, he bit back a frown. Is your leg hurting? Mary asked when she saw Hank's lips tug downward. It's fine, he said, then he placed his hand on hers. Worried that he wasn't telling her something, she pushed a smile onto her face, then she heard his phone vibrate in his pocket. He released her hand and took the phone out, then shook his head with a deep frown. It's Simone. He swiped to answer, and after a brief conversation, he disconnected the call. What does she want? Mary asked, unhappy that Simone was interrupting her time with Hank. She's at the front door. What? Yeah. She came to see how I'm doing. What are you going to do? He set Harper on the cushion next to him, then stood. I'm going to talk to her. Mary watched him go, disappointment growing within her. If Hank couldn't get rid of Simone, her day would be ruined. Hopeful he would manage to send her on her way, she asked Harper if she wanted to finish her finger painting. I want to make the tree with my finger. Okay, let's do it. Although she couldn't see through the windows of the main house in the bright sunlight, Mary looked in that direction anyway. What was Simone saying to Hank? What would Hank do? Chapter 36 Hank braced himself to face Simone, then opened the front door. Oh, Hank! True concern shone from Simone's eyes, then she threw her arms around him. After a moment, she stepped back. I was watching the game when you got hurt. It was awful to see you in pain. She reached out and touched his arm. How are you? How's the leg? It's just a strained hamstring. Could have been worse. Her face smoothed out. I'm glad. She glanced behind him. May I come in? Here we go, he thought. I'm not really up for company. Astonishment filled her face. 
I'm not company, Hank. Come on. She chuckled. And besides, I need to make sure Mrs. Stillman's taking good care of you. Before he thought it through, he said, Mrs. Stillman's gone this week. The moment the words left his mouth, he knew it was a mistake. What? Why? Hank held back a sigh. Her husband had foot surgery today. Then it's settled. I'm staying. With a firmness that reminded him of London, she walked inside the house. Thinking of London reminded him of the stakes, of the need to keep Simone on his side. Things between him and Mary were heating up. The thought of Simone reporting to London that he'd refused to let her in, refused to let her help him, refused because Mary was there. No, he couldn't take a chance on London disrupting Harper's life just to spite him. Couldn't let her rip Mary from his life. Not now. Clamping his jaw, Hank took a moment to gather himself, softly closing the door before following Simone into the family room. What needs to be done? she asked, her gaze shooting around the room. What do you mean? You said Mrs. Stillman's gone this week. Who's doing the cooking? Who's making sure you're being taken care of? He almost blurted that Mary was doing those things, but he caught himself in time. I'm a big boy, Simone. I can take care of myself for a week. She laughed. You don't cook, Hank. At least, I've never seen you cook. His eyebrows rose in question. And you do? Well, not often, but I can follow a recipe. Are you offering to make dinner? Maybe. She drew the word out. I also know how to call out for food. He laughed and shook his head. Then he walked in her direction. His hamstring acted up, which made him limp. Oh, baby. Here, come sit down and put your feet up. I'll get you something cold to drink. He had to get her out of there. If anyone was going to fuss over him, he wanted it to be Mary, not Simone. Sit down, Hank. Please, let me take care of you. He opened his mouth to argue, but she put her hand up and turned her head away. I won't hear any arguments from you. I'm here to help, and that's how it's going to be. Biting back the urge to tell her to leave, he sat on the couch. She took a pillow from the couch and placed it on the coffee table. Then she lifted his left leg and set his foot on the pillow. There, all set. She smiled at him. Be right back. He watched her go into the kitchen to grab him a drink. All the while, he scrambled to come up with a way to get her to leave without making her suspicious. Moments later, she was back, a cold beer in her hand. Here you go. Thanks, he muttered, before taking a swig. I appreciate your help, Simone. I really do, but I'm fine. You don't have to stick around. But I want to, Hank. She sank onto the couch beside him. I love you. Don't you know that? He didn't love her. At this point, he could hardly stand to be around her. She looked around. Where's Harper? He knew what she was really asking. Where's Mary? She's in the art studio, painting. Art studio? Her perfectly groomed eyebrows slammed together. Since when do you have an art studio? The game room. He shook his head. Whatever. Looking thoughtful, she stood and went to the window that looked toward the game room. After staring outside for several moments, she came back to the couch. How are things with a nanny? This was dangerous ground. Hoping she would drop it, he shrugged. Fine. No more playing in the pool? Hank's mind went straight to Saturday, when he'd played with Mary in the pool, and to the way he'd pinned her against the edge and kissed her with passion. Heat rolled through him at the memory. Schooling his expression, he shook his head. You know, Simone, I'm not feeling all that great. I'm really not in the mood to hang out today. That was certainly true. Her lips compressed as she looked at him. In fact, I'm going to head upstairs and take a nap. That wasn't true, but she didn't have to know that. That's fine, Hank. You go on upstairs and nap, and I'll start working on dinner. Well, crap, he thought. He was going to have to lay it on the line. He couldn't pretend a moment longer. Look, he began, his heart rate accelerating. You need to go. Her eyebrows shot up, but he continued. It's over between us, Simone. When she didn't say anything, he added, I don't want to see you anymore. With her jaw set in a firm line, she never took her eyes off of him as she stood. That's how it is? He nodded. He didn't even feel bad. 
In fact, he felt great. Yeah. All right. If that's the way you want to play it. I'm not playing it anything, Simone. Though it was uncomfortable, he pushed himself to his feet. He didn't want to be looking up at her as he spoke. You went behind my back to talk to my ex-wife. Then you basically threatened me. He shook his head, his frown deep. You and me? He motioned between the two of them. We're done. Dang, that felt good. Her lips flattened and her nostrils flared. Then she strode toward the front door. Stopping in the entry, she turned to face him, her eyes narrowed. It wasn't a threat, Hank. Without another word, she walked out the door, slamming it behind her. Swearing under his breath, Hank locked the front door, then went back to the couch to gather his thoughts. Would Simone go straight to London? Or would her pride keep her from admitting he dumped her? Perhaps the idea of punishing him would be enough for her to overlook her pride. Shaking his head with a deep sigh, Hank could feel his whole body tense. He needed to tell Mary that he'd just ruined everything. Chapter 37 Do you like my tree, Mary? Harper asked as she added a few more red leaves with her fingertip. I love it, Mary said. Though she was looking at Harper's work, her mind was on Hank and what was happening in the house. He'd been gone for nearly half an hour. Should she go in and see what was happening? Or would that only complicate things? She told herself to be patient and to trust Hank, but not knowing was excruciating. I'm hungry, Harper said a few minutes later. Worried about facing Simone, Mary knew she didn't have a choice. Okay, let's wash up and then we'll have a snack. Five minutes later, Mary and Harper walked into the family room. To her surprise, Hank was sitting on the couch, alone. Glancing around in confusion, Mary asked, Is Simone here? Hank shook his head, his eyes downcast. Nope. Something was wrong, but before she could question him, she needed to take care of Harper. After slicing celery, she put it, along with a large dollop of peanut butter, on a plate, then she poured a glass of milk. She got Harper settled at the table with her snack, purposely putting her in a chair whose back was to the family room, so she and Hank could have a bit of privacy while they spoke. Then she joined him on the couch. What happened? She kept her voice low. I may have made a mistake, Hank said, and then he told her what had happened. Forehead furrowing, Mary was quiet as she considered the possible ramifications, but deep inside, okay, maybe not that deep, she was elated that Hank had broken things off with Simone. There's nothing we can do now, she said. Maybe, maybe she won't follow through. Maybe she'll think she can, I don't know, win you back somehow. He huffed out a laugh. <laughs> There's no way she can win me back. That thrilled her to no end, but she held back her smile. But if she thinks she can? Yeah, I guess so. All we can do is wait. When London FaceTimes with Harper tonight, I'll see if I can, you know, gauge if she suspects anything. Hank took her hand, stroking her palm with his thumb. I want you to know something, Mary. At the earnest look on his face, Mary's hope soared. Was this it? Was he going to tell her he loved her? Before meeting you, I never realized there was a hole in my life, that something was missing. But now that I've gotten to know you... He smiled. Now I know. Nearly holding her breath, Mary kept her eyes on his, completely drawn in by his magnetism. He reached up and ran a finger down her jaw. I'm falling in love with you, Marigold. The power of her own love swept over her, making it hard to breathe. He loved her. Staring into his eyes, she smiled. I love you so much. Just saying the words made her feelings explode within her. He stroked her face before pulling her to him, his mouth crushing hers. Happiness streamed through her, filling her up, crowding out all other emotions. Mary, Harper cried out. I spilled. Hank released her and she twisted around to look at Harper, who was watching them. With a glance at Hank, whose eyes reflected the panic she felt, Mary stood and walked into the kitchen to grab the roll of paper towels. As she sopped up the milk, her mind raced with what to do. Why are you kissing my daddy? Harper asked, her tone puzzled. Ah, uh, 
Baffled at what to say, Mary finished wiping up the milk. Then she put the remaining paper towels on the counter, her eyes going to Hank. Scrambling to come up with a reasonable excuse, Hank walked into the room. He said the first thing that jumped into his head. Mary was telling me a secret. Mary told you a secret on your mouth? Harper said with a giggle. Desperate to turn her mind in another direction, he said, Are you done with your snack? She nodded. Let me help you down, then. I don't need help, she said. Then she climbed down from the chair and ran into the family room, where some of her favorite books were still sitting on the coffee table. Hank turned to Mary. Even with this new possible disaster, he couldn't hold back a smile. Now that he told her how he felt, and she told him, he couldn't be happier. Wasn't even all that worried about London finding out. Mary bit her lip, her forehead creased. Should we... I don't know, say something else to Harper about that kiss? If we make a big deal about it, that will only make her think about it more. Maybe if we... He shook his head. Let it drop. She'll forget about it. Mary wasn't sure that was true, but she didn't have a better solution. And maybe he was right. Still, she was worried. She frowned. What? It's just, I love Harper. I love taking care of her. I don't want to get fired. Stop assuming the worst will happen. Mary's frown deepened. Did he really not get it? Or did he just not care? Could he be that selfish, just as London had warned? Amazed that she could go from the heights of happiness to the depths of despair in sixty seconds flat, Mary waited for him to say something, to tell her he would fix this, that she could have it both ways, that he would convince London to keep her as Harper's nanny, even though she was in love with him. When he didn't say anything, she took another step back. Can you watch Harper? Of course. With a small nod, Mary turned to leave. Wait. She stopped and faced him. Where are you going? I just... She pointed toward the upstairs. I need some time. We'll figure this out, Marigold. Trust me. She thought she did, but her confidence in the situation had deteriorated first with him breaking things off with Simone without talking to her beforehand, without figuring out a strategy, then with him making light of Harper seeing their kiss. Why was he being so reckless? Was this all a game to him? I'll be in my room, she said, before turning and walking away. Frustrated that Mary couldn't see the good in what was happening, the possibilities, Hank shook his head as he watched her go. She was making all kinds of assumptions about the bad things that could happen without stopping to consider that there might be a silver lining. Yeah, he was concerned about what London would do if Harper told her she'd seen him kissing Mary, but he thought Mary was going a little overboard on her reaction. Maybe freeing himself from Simone had made him ready to take chances he wouldn't have taken before. All he knew was he was in love with Mary, didn't want to lose her, was tired of hiding the way he felt about her, Maybe that was part of it, too. Now that he told her how he felt, he wanted to show her, wanted the world to know. Maybe the sabotaging of their secret was a subconscious act. Playing football all these years, he'd learned to trust his instincts, and his instincts told him to stop hiding the truth. He just hoped Mary would come around to his point of view. Chapter 38 Mary stood on her small balcony, her thoughts whirling. Hank loved her, and she loved him. She didn't want to keep it a secret either, but she wasn't ready to face London, to tell her the truth. And she didn't want to lose her job. It wasn't just a job to her. She loved Harper, and hated the idea of someone else taking care of her. What if the new nanny didn't love her like Mary did, or thought painting was too messy and refused to let Harper express her creative side? What if she wouldn't read to her whenever Harper wanted, or didn't feed her the right kinds of foods? On the other hand, Mary loved Hank. So much. Was she willing to give him up? Give up the love that was blossoming between them? Why couldn't she have everything she wanted? Why did life have to be so complicated? Her phone notified her that someone was initiating a FaceTime session. Mary pulled her phone from her pocket. It was London. Why was she calling in the middle of the day? Simone must have talked to her. Heart racing, Mary took a deep breath to calm herself. Then she answered. 
London had a big smile on her face. Not the expression Mary expected to see if she had just found out Mary and Hank were involved. Hello, London said. Hi. I have some wonderful news. So, this had nothing to do with her and Hank. Mary's heart slowed to a normal rate. What's up? Her smile grew. I'm done filming, so I'm flying home tonight. A million thoughts bounded through Mary's head, but she managed to keep her face neutral. At least, she hoped it was neutral. That's great. I've arranged for you and Harper to fly home tomorrow, first thing in the morning. I'm so excited to see her. First thing tomorrow, Mary thought, already? Mary wasn't ready to tell Hank goodbye, not yet. Oh, she said. Struggling to maintain her composure, Mary could feel tears pushing into her eyes. What's wrong? London asked. I just... it's so sudden. Scrambling for something to say, Mary said the first thing that came into her mind. Harper's having such a wonderful time. I... I don't know if she's ready to leave. London's eyebrows bunched, then they smoothed out. She'll be fine, Mary. Besides, I'm sure she'll be thrilled to see me. London waved her hand. Anyway, it's all arranged. The limo will pick you up at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. There was nothing she could do. This was completely out of her control. All right, we'll be ready. The sound of a door opening could be heard in the background, and London turned her head. Someone said something, and she nodded in their direction. Then she turned back to the camera. Looks like it's time for me to head to the airport. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, have a good flight. You too, Mary. Then the session ended. She would have to tell Hank goodbye. How was she going to do that? She wasn't ready. Not in the least. Why was she wasting her time stewing in her sadness when she could be with him? What an idiot she was. She ran out of her bedroom and down the stairs, pausing for a moment when she reached the archway that led to the family room. Hank was sitting on the couch with Harper, reading her a story, and doing a fantastic job of changing his voice as he read. Harper was enthralled. Heart-wrenching at the scene, Mary waited until he finished the book, then she walked into the room. Her feelings must have been written all over her face, because when Hank saw her, his face fell. He turned to Harper. Princess Pinkrose, would you like to watch The Little Mermaid? Harper's head bobbed up and down, and minutes later, she was sprawled out on the couch, happily watching the movie. Hank took Mary by the hand and led her into the cozy sitting room, where they sat beside each other on the couch. What's wrong? he asked without preamble. London called. His eyes widened, and Mary shook her head. It's not what you think. She said she's done filming and it's time for us to come home. She swallowed over the huge knot in her throat. We leave in the morning. In the morning, Hank thought. He'd known all along that this was only a visit, but he'd put off thinking about the day Mary and Harper would actually leave. But now it was here. Mary was waiting for him to say something, but he just needed a moment to think. He stared at his hands balled in his lap, his thoughts firing in all directions. What should we do? Mary asked, after he'd been silent for nearly a minute. He lifted his head and met her eyes. There's nothing we can do. London has primary custody, so tomorrow you... you leave. He didn't like saying it out loud. It made it real. She grabbed his hands and implored him with her eyes. But I love you, Hank. I don't want to leave. Tears flooded her eyes. But I love Harper, too. I can't leave her, either. Seeing her deep devotion to Harper meant everything to him. I don't want you to leave either, neither one of you, but there's nothing we can do about it. Not today. Not today? What do you mean? Was he willing to fight for primary custody? Is that what he wanted? Would he even have a chance at winning? That would be a major challenge, and in all reality, it wasn't something he could take on until the season was over. He knew Mary wanted him to fix this, and he wished he could, but he shook his head. He didn't want to give her false hope. I didn't mean anything. A gentle sigh slipped from Mary's lips. All hope was lost. Unless she was willing to give up being Harper's nanny, something she wasn't willing to consider, 
she would have to say goodbye to Hank. At least she would see him again. Harper was scheduled to come back for a visit at the end of October. She could wait that long to see him, couldn't she? Looking at him now, her body tingling with a memory of being in his arms, of having his mouth on hers, she wasn't sure she could. Come here, he said. She went into his arms eagerly, laying her head against his shoulder, feeling safe and secure in his powerful embrace. Holding back the sobs that wanted to erupt from her throat, she savored this moment, drawing on the warmth from his body and the strength from his arms to buoy her up. They would enjoy these last hours together, and then they would say goodbye. She could do this. She could do hard things. For the rest of the afternoon and into the evening, the three of them played together, ate dinner together, and just spent time together. Mary told Harper that in the morning they were going to her other house, that her mother would be there, and she seemed excited about that. It was only Mary who was struggling. At least, she thought it was only her. Hank seemed to be handling everything just fine. Maybe she was more wrapped up in him than he was in her. Chapter 39 The next morning, Mary was up early. She'd hardly slept the night before. She'd already packed for both herself and Harper. The limo would arrive in a few hours, and she was determined to spend as much of that time with Hank as she could. After getting ready, she went downstairs, prepared to make a big breakfast for the three of them. But as she descended the stairs, she could smell something wonderful cooking. Had Mrs. Stillman returned early? Curious, she went into the kitchen and found Hank standing in front of the stove, flipping a batch of French toast and he was wearing an apron. The surprise of seeing him in a completely unexpected role made her smile, something she desperately needed. Look at you, she said as she approached him, stopping on the opposite side of the island. He lifted his head, and when he saw her, he smiled. Thought I'd send you and Harper off with a good breakfast. He grinned. Your flight's too short for anything besides a couple of peanuts. The reminder that she was leaving dimmed her happiness, but she had to face reality. It smells delicious. I only burned one batch, so I'm doing pretty good. She laughed. <laughs> yeah, one burned batch is acceptable. He scooped the golden brown slices of bread out of the pan and placed them on a plate, then dipped more bread in the batter before dropping them into the pan with a sizzle. Would you get Harper up? I'd like to spend some time with her before she leaves. Didn't he want to spend time with her? More than a little disappointed, she plastered a smile onto her mouth. Of course. He must have read the dismay in her eyes because he set the spatula down and said, Come here, Mary. Hurrying around to his side, when he opened his arms, she went right into them, and when he kissed her neck, his lips moving over her jaw and stopping on her mouth, love and desire tore through her. She wrapped her arms around his neck, not ready to say goodbye, not ever wanting to say goodbye. It'll all work out, he murmured near her ear. Why did he keep saying that? He had no idea if anything would work out, and it was starting to drive her crazy that he seemed so confident that it would. She didn't want to ruin the moment by starting an argument, so instead of responding to his words, she just held him tight. The smell of burning bread hit them. Oops, he said as he released her. Make that two batches that I burned. She didn't care, and she couldn't quite bring herself to laugh. She couldn't even crack a smile. I'll go get Harper, she said instead. Then she trudged out of the room and up the stairs. Hank was trying to make the best of an impossible situation. Why did Mary have to be so downcast? It only made it harder for both of them. Sighing, despite his determination to not become melancholy, he flipped the batch of French toast, and when Harper bounded into the kitchen a few minutes later, her bright smile cheered him considerably. "'Good morning, Princess Pinkrose,' he said as he swept her into his arms. "'I'm going on an airplane today!' "'That's right, you are.' He looked at Mary, who had followed Harper into the room. "'You and Mary.' Mary had a smile on her face, but he could tell it was forced. I get to see Mommy, Harper said. That's right, and I'm going to miss you. She hugged him. I miss you, too. 
He snuggled her in his arms, then he looked at her. Will you come back to see me? She held up her little finger. I promise my pinky. He looked at Mary, whose smile seemed genuine now. She's giving you a pinky promise. Softly chuckling, Hank wrapped his pinky around Harper's, then kissed her on the cheek before setting her down. Are you ready for French toast? Yes. Go sit at the table, and I'll bring it to you. She did as he asked, and Mary sat beside her. Limping slightly, he carried the platter to the table, set it in the middle, then sat down. They ate in relative silence, and the morose mood didn't go away as Mary helped him clean up while Harper watched a movie. In an hour, they would be gone. He tried not to think about it. Are you going to talk to London? Mary asked, as she placed a dirty dish in the dishwasher. That was something he was dreading even more than them leaving, because he knew London would be livid. Not a pleasant thing under the best of circumstances, but he would do it. Yeah. Mary straightened and looked at him. When? I'll call her tonight. Her forehead creased. Tonight? Yes. I'm going to tell her that we're together, but that you still want to take care of Harper. That it's in Harper's best interest for her to leave things be. While Mary was beyond grateful that he was willing to talk to London, to try to fix things, when he laid it out like that, panic blossomed inside her. If he told London the truth, she would fire Mary for sure. She couldn't let that happen. Harper needed her. Maybe if they kept quiet, it would all blow over. Besides, Mary would be in L.A. and Hank would be in Sacramento. They weren't going to be together any longer, were they? Really, there was nothing to tell. This incredible thing she had with him? It was about to fall completely apart. In all reality, when she was in L.A., under London's roof, she wouldn't be able to continue with him. How could she? Right under London's nose. That would be insane. There was no hiding from it. Their relationship was about to crash and burn. She wanted to be brave about this, but as she looked at Hank, at those amazing eyes, at those lips that had set her on fire numerous times, it felt as if her heart was shattering, and there was nothing she could do to stop it. No, she said, her voice just above a whisper. Don't call her. Hank tilted his head. I thought that's what you wanted. It's just, there's no point. I mean, we're not going to be together anymore. Was that really how she saw it? Hank was surprised, and a little hurt. Was she prepared to end things already? Did she want to make a clean break? Maybe she had the right idea. Maybe that would be the best way to handle this impossible situation. But he'd fallen in love with her. He told her as much the day before. And she'd said she loved him. Did that mean nothing to her? He didn't believe that. Could it be that this time at his house had just been an interlude for both of them? Had it been like their own little paradise, cut off from the world with only each other to focus on? And now that reality was about to intrude, perhaps their love for each other wouldn't stand up to it. Yes, making a clean break would be best. You're right, he said. We should let it lie. So, Mary thought, it was over. No trying to change her mind, no hint of regret, nothing. She looked away, devastated. She should have heeded London's warning, and now she would have to live with her heartbreak. Regret, painful as acid, washed over her, and she finished loading the dishwasher in silence, but she could feel Hank's eyes on her. The limo arrived a short time later. It's time to go, Mary called out to Harper, who slid off the couch and walked toward her, dragging her snow-white backpack behind her. Swallowing the tears that clogged her throat, Mary smiled. Come tell your daddy goodbye. Hank scooped Harper into his arms and held her tight as he swayed back and forth. I love you, Princess Pink Rose. I love you, Daddy. He kissed her cheek. I'll see you soon, okay? She nodded, and he set her down. Not sure what to do, because Mary wasn't about to throw herself at Hank in front of Harper, she ushered Harper out the door and toward the limo. While she secured Harper's car seat, Hank and the limo driver loaded their luggage. Climb on in, she said to Harper, 
and once Harper was inside, Mary closed the door and turned to Hank. Hank told the driver he would help Mary get in, and the driver got behind the wheel. Mary couldn't stand it a moment longer. The dam burst, and tears filled her eyes, sliding down her face. Hank pulled her into his arms, and she sank against him, her heart disintegrating into a million pieces. It's going to be okay, he murmured in her ear. You'll be back soon, and we'll figure things out. Soon wasn't soon enough. He held her while she cried, then when her tears slowed, he cupped her face with his hands and pressed a gentle kiss to her lips. I love you, Marigold. Don't forget that. Those words meant everything to her, and she smiled through her tears. I love you, too. Using his thumbs, he wiped the tears from her cheeks. Then he walked her to the other side of the limo and opened the door. After a final kiss, he helped her inside, bending down to tell Harper goodbye one more time. Mary sniffed away her tears. She couldn't have Harper seeing her so upset. Then she smiled as Hank closed the door and the limo pulled away from the curb. Minutes later, Harper burst into tears. I miss my daddy! Wanting to burst into tears herself, Mary took several deep breaths to get her emotions under control, then she smiled at Harper. I know, but we'll be back here before you know it, and today you get to see your mommy. That seemed to cheer Harper, although it didn't do a thing for Mary. Hank didn't allow himself time to miss Mary or Harper. Instead, he headed to the team facility to get his hamstring worked on. But as he drove, he couldn't help but think about Mary, about her sobs. He'd been wrong to think she wanted a clean break. Clearly, she didn't want that at all, yet she wasn't prepared to abandon Harper. That just made him love her all the more. He had no idea what he was going to do. Chapter 40 When Mary walked into London's house with Harper later that day, the familiarity of the place washed over her, and for a moment, it seemed as if the time at Hank's had been a dream. A wonderful, amazing, spectacular dream. Now that she was back, she wanted nothing more than to focus on Harper and do her job, which is why she was on edge, worried that Harper would say something about the kiss she'd witnessed. Hoping Hank was right, that not making a big deal about it would keep Harper from thinking about it, she inhaled deeply, then slowly released her breath. Welcome home, my sweet girl, London said, as she met them in the entry. Her jeans flattered her slim figure, and the turquoise blouse looked gorgeous with her blonde hair and porcelain skin. Mommy! Harper shouted, running into London's open arms. London held her tight. I missed you so much. I missed you too, Mommy. Straightening, London smiled at Mary. How was the flight? Struggling to hide how much she wished she was in Sacramento, Mary plastered a smile onto her mouth. It was fine, much shorter than your flight. London laughed. <laughs> Those international flights can be brutal. Flying private is the only thing that makes it bearable. Mary smiled like she knew what London meant, but she'd only ever flown commercial. Why don't you girls freshen up, and then we'll have some lunch. Mary followed Harper up the stairs to their wing of the house. She helped Harper get changed into a fresh outfit, then left her to play with her dolls while she went into her own room. As she walked in, an image of the room she'd had in Hank's house filled her mind, and right behind that were the memories of all the time she'd spent with Hank, all the times he'd kissed her. She missed him desperately. Trying not to think about him, she freshened up, then she and Harper met London in the shaded outdoor area that overlooked the city of Los Angeles. As they ate, London asked Harper about the things they did, and as Mary listened, her nerves were stretched thin. She was terrified that Harper was going to mention that kiss. I painted with my fingers, Harper said, holding up her hand. What did you paint? A tree. Mary showed me how to do it. Maybe you can make a tree for me. That's what Mary needed to do. She needed to concentrate on Harper and painting. She needed to evict Hank from her mind. That's when Mary realized she'd completely forgotten about the painting of Harper that she'd meant to give Hank. It was still sitting in the corner of their art studio. She'd known they were coming back in October, so she'd left all of their art supplies. 
Holding back a frown, she listened to the conversation between London and Harper. What else did you do? London asked. Harper giggled. We played shark in the pool and Daddy got me. He did? She nodded as she used her fork to pierce a chunk of cantaloupe. That sounds like fun. Uh-huh. She chewed the cantaloupe. Mary, tell Daddy a secret on his mouth. Mary almost dropped her glass of water as her gaze shot to London. Her heart began to pound so hard she thought it would explode out of her chest and land right in the middle of the pristine white tablecloth. London was staring at her, her eyebrows nearly in her hairline, her eyes wide. What is she talking about, Mary? London's calm tone belied the shock on her face that was quickly being replaced by fury. Hank was wrong. Harper hadn't forgotten. Ah, uh, Mary stammered. London threw her hand up. Don't bother, Mary. You and I will discuss this later. Then she turned to Harper and completely ignored Mary for the rest of the meal. After they'd finished eating, London finally turned to Mary. Keep Harper occupied while I make a phone call. Of course. Who was London going to call? It could be anyone. A producer or a director. But Mary knew who it was. Hank. All because of one little kiss. Okay, they'd kissed many, many times, but only once in front of Harper. Clearly, that kiss had made an impression on the little girl. It had made an impression on Mary, too, because that was the kiss she'd shared with Hank after he told her he was falling in love with her. Terrified of what would happen now, Mary tried to push it out of her mind while she read book after book to Harper, and then while they played with Harper's dolls. What was taking so long? Not knowing was torture, and when Harper started getting grumpy, Mary's nerves were stretched tight, and she nearly scolded her. Stopping herself just in time, she immediately felt bad for her impatience. It wasn't Harper's fault that her daddy was so amazing, handsome, and beyond incredible. And it wasn't her fault that Mary had let herself fall for him. Do you want to watch a movie? she asked her. I want to see Tangled. I love that one. Let's watch it. They went into the media room where Mary queued up the movie, then they stretched out on the recliners. It didn't take long for Harper to fall asleep. Mary wasn't surprised. She was worn out herself. A few minutes later, London walked into the room. She looked at Harper sleeping on the recliner, then she motioned for Mary to come with her. Chapter 41 Extreme apprehension flooded Mary as she stood and followed London out of the media room and to a nearby grouping of chairs. Have a seat, Mary. When they were both seated, Mary tried to slow her galloping heart as she wiped her suddenly sweaty palms on the legs of her jeans. I just finished a very interesting conversation with my ex-husband. Just the mention of Hank made Mary's heart do a little flip. She loved him so much. London crossed one long leg over the other. But I'd like to hear your side of the story. What had Hank told London? Mary had no way of knowing, so she decided the best option would be to tell the truth. I should have listened to you, London, she began, hoping to appeal to London's vanity. You were right. Hank's a very charming man. London's jaw tightened and her lips pinched together. You fell for him, didn't you? The memory of him holding her only hours before filled her mind, and she nodded. Yes. It came out as a whisper. Sighing audibly, London looked away as she slowly shook her head. Then she turned back to Mary. At what point did you start lying to me? What? I asked you several times if anything was going on between the two of you, and you denied it every time. She glared at Mary. At what point did you start lying to me? Was it really necessary to admit that she'd lied from the start? How would that help anything? She'd already admitted that she'd fallen for Hank. Why couldn't they just work from that point? I don't know, she finally said, not willing to admit the complete truth, but not willing to underline a particular moment when she'd lied. I see. I'm so sorry, London. I was wrong to... London threw her hands up. Save it for someone who cares. Uh-oh, 
this couldn't be good. You ignored my warnings and you flat out lied to me, Mary. That is completely unacceptable. She stared at Mary, her blue eyes chips of ice. You're fired. Mary's heart dropped and her thoughts flew. Wait, are you saying you wouldn't be firing me if I had admitted the truth from the start? A scoffing sound burst from London's throat. No, you being involved with my ex-husband is unforgivable. But lying to me on top of that... She shook her head. How dare you? How dare you claim to love my only child while at the same time carrying on with my ex-husband? She glowered at Mary. Do you have any idea how deeply you've betrayed me? Mary had known London would be upset, but she'd had no idea how much. And London was wrong. Her love for Harper wasn't something she merely claimed. I do love Harper. Tears filled her eyes. She's the sweetest, most adorable child I've ever known. I'm well aware of that, which is why you don't deserve to be her nanny. She paused. You're not irreplaceable in Harper's life, Mary. London glared at her. I'm her mother. I'm the only one who's irreplaceable. The truth of that statement hurt, and hurt deeply. In a way, Mary had begun to feel like Harper's mother. She'd taken care of her for nearly 24 hours a day since she'd been hired as her nanny. Still, she knew London was right. You made your choice, Mary. Then a small smile lifted the corners of London's mouth. The wrong choice. Something about the way London said those words prompted Mary to ask, What do you mean? Her lips twisted into a smirk. If you think you can run to Hank now, you're sorely mistaken. That thought had crossed her mind, but now she wasn't so sure. Why do you say that? London sat back in her chair and stretched her arms across the armrests, curling her fingers around the ends, her perfectly manicured nails visible. Like I said, I spoke to Hank a short time ago. What had he said, Mary wondered. Her entire body tensed. He was quite penitent, London went on. Said he felt terrible about the entire thing. Practically begged me not to fire you. Love toward Hank swept over her. He'd gone to bat for her. I told him I couldn't have you caring for our child when you destroyed my trust in you. When I explained my reasoning, he agreed with me and said he supported my decision 100%. He pointed out that Harper is his priority not you. He also said that while you were a nice diversion, he realizes that's all you were. He admitted that he'd made a mistake, that you were a mistake, one that he swears to never repeat. She paused. By the end of our conversation, he actually encouraged me to fire you, Mary, said it was the right thing to do, that it would be best for everyone. She sneered that he was glad to be rid of you. Was this true? Mary wondered. She didn't want to believe it. Maybe London was making it all up. I don't believe you, Mary said, her voice shaky. London looked at Mary, her lips compressed, then she picked up her phone. Here for yourself. She tapped her screen, then she set her phone on the table. Mary stared at it, her body tense, and a moment later, Hank's voice filled the room. I already apologize, London. Give me a break, Hank, London said. Mary should have been off limits. I'm well aware of that, and in hindsight, I can see I made a terrible mistake. His voice was nearly a growl. One thing you can count on, it's a mistake I won't make a second time. London picked up her phone and tapped the screen again, and the room fell silent. Mary thought she was going to be sick. Why had Hank said that? When he told her he loved her, had he been lying? Why would he do that? London's lips were a straight line. Believe me now? Mary didn't respond, couldn't respond. Instead, she stared at her lap. Hank was my husband. We were a family. We have a child together. Each statement was like a knife digging into Mary's heart. Hank would never be her husband. She would never have a child with him. They would never be a family. She'd been a fool to fall for him. Numbness spread throughout her body, but she forced herself to look at London. 
London went on, her voice light and airy. You've never been married, so it's impossible for you to understand the lifelong bond that Hank and I will always have. When it comes to Harper, we trust each other implicitly. When one of us makes a decision for her, the other is completely supportive. She paused. Whatever you thought you had with Hank. She waved her hand like she was shooing away an annoying insect. It was less than nothing, Mary. Completely and totally meaningless. It's sad, really. You are incredibly pathetic. London stared at her. I pity you. Crushed. Pulverized. That's how Mary felt. The entire universe was caving in on her. It wasn't just her heart that was shattered beyond repair. It was her entire soul. I can see that you're upset, London said, as she tilted her head. Let me give you a word of advice. Move away from here. Start over somewhere else. Word of what happened will get around, and no one will hire you. Her lips tugged upward. At least no one who wants to stay in my good graces. Can I at least tell Harper goodbye? Mary's voice was dull and lifeless, but the idea of Harper waking up and Mary being gone from her life was more than she could bear. London narrowed her eyes. Are you sure you're up for that? I don't want you to upset her. Forcing herself to get it together, Mary nodded. I won't upset her. Please, just let me tell her goodbye. London dismissed her with a wave of her hand. Fine, go pack your things and I'll bring her up to see you in an hour. Then you'll leave. Mary heaved herself out of the chair and stumbled away. An hour later, as promised, London brought Harper to Mary's room to see her. She'd packed and loaded her car, and now was dreading saying goodbye to the sweet little girl that had become like her own child. I already explained that you were leaving, London said matter-of-factly. I don't want you to leave, Harper cried, as she threw her arms around Mary's neck. Mary hugged her tight, barely managing to contain her own tears. I know, sweetheart, I know. Maybe I can visit you. Mary looked hopefully over Harper's shoulder at London, who frowned deeply. Yes, Harper said, visit me. She pulled back slightly and smiled at Harper. I'll do my best, I promise. Harper held up her pinky. Promise your pinky? She hooked her pinky with Harper's. Promise my pinky. Mary has to go now, London said. Give her another hug, Angel, then tell her goodbye. Harper flung herself at Mary, and Mary couldn't hold back the sobs any longer. Her world had collapsed. She'd lost Harper and Hank, just as she'd feared she would. Now she had nothing, absolutely nothing. She couldn't even nanny anymore, at least not for anyone who cared what London thought, and a lot of people cared what London thought. London gently extricated Harper from Mary's arms, holding her in her own arms. Okay, Mary. Goodbye now. Before Mary could answer, London left the room with a wailing Harper in her arms. Chapter 42 By the time she'd driven a block from London's house, Mary couldn't see through the curtain of tears, and she was forced to pull over. She sobbed until she was empty, and then she sobbed some more. Tears and snot flowed together down her face, but she didn't care. Her life was over. Everything that mattered to her had been ripped away, and it was her own fault. She'd known this could happen, but she'd let her heart rule her head. And now she was paying the price. She was alone. Completely and utterly alone. When she finally got her emotions under control, she struggled to think of where she could go. Her immediate thought was to go to her parents' house, but her embarrassment over what she'd done, how foolish she'd been, kept her from wanting to face them. Even though she knew they would love her no matter what, the thought of telling them that she'd fallen in love with Hank, fallen under his spell, really, and that he'd then turned his back on her, had actually encouraged London to fire her. It was too much. She couldn't do it. The wounds were too fresh. The shame too deep. The thought of Hank taking London's side against her brought on a fresh bout of tears, and it took another ten minutes before she'd calmed enough to think clearly. With no idea where she should go, she drew in a ragged breath, 
put her car into gear, then pulled onto the road. Eventually, she found herself heading north on I-5, and as she drove, her mind filled with memories of the last two weeks, of the happiness she'd felt the entire time she'd been at Hank's, until that morning. Had it only been that morning that Hank had held her in his arms while she'd cried and told her to trust him, that everything would be okay? She had trusted him, but he turned on her, sided with London. Who could blame him? He had a history with London, had a child with her. Of course he had to side with her. Who was married to him but a tiny diversion from football, his true passion? The memory of him saying she was a mistake hurt so deeply that her stomach cramped up and she nearly pulled off the interstate. No, she couldn't let him affect her that way. Despite feeling like her life had ended, she knew that wasn't true, that in reality, her whole life stretched out in front of her. Two hours later, after she'd stopped to fill her car with gas, she realized what she wanted to do and where she wanted to go, where she was already headed. London had encouraged her to get out of town, and she agreed. She needed to make a fresh start, but she wanted to go to the one place where she'd felt a measure of happiness, Sacramento. Even if she never saw Hank again, Sacramento was as good a place as any to start over. With a firm destination in mind, Mary felt a distinct sense of relief, of peace, and she knew it was the right thing to do, and by early evening, she entered Sacramento city limits. She and Harper had only taken a few forays away from Hank's house, but even so, she recognized a few landmarks. Sacramento was the capital of California, and though Los Angeles had eight times as many people, Sacramento was still a sizable city. Now that Mary had decided to make Sacramento her home, she felt a smile tugging up the corners of her mouth as she looked for a place to spend the night. Over the years that she'd been a live-in nanny, she'd been extremely frugal, and she'd put aside most of her earnings. Now that she was unemployed, those funds would be her lifeline. As she checked into a motel that looked clean and safe, yet was relatively inexpensive, she considered her options. Certain she could find a job as a nanny, she wondered if that was what she wanted to do. Her dream was to be an artist. Maybe it was time to get out of the nanny business. Maybe it was time to follow her dream, to become the artist she'd always wanted to be. Thinking of painting inevitably took her mind to her art studio at Hank's house, which led her to memories of being with Hank. And those memories were like a massive boulder falling on her chest. Lying on the bed in her motel room, she had to work to draw air into her lungs. It was like she was drowning in sorrow. She couldn't breathe, couldn't think, couldn't... Gasping for air, her eyes wide, her heart pounding like a jackhammer, she realized she was having a panic attack. Breathe, Mary, she thought. Just breathe. Turning her head to stare out the window, she focused on the leaves of a nearby tree. Leaves turning yellow and red. Fall leaves, gently fluttering in the September breeze. Peaceful, lovely leaves. After several minutes, the panic attack passed, and for the next few minutes, she focused on her calm, even breathing. Tomorrow would be better, she promised herself. Tomorrow would be awesome. Chapter 43 When Mary woke up the next morning, her first thought was Harper. Was she up? What did Mary need to do to take care of her? Then the reality of her situation exploded in her mind, and she allowed herself a good cry before giving herself a stern talking to. It was time to move on with her life, time to turn the page and start a new chapter. Sadness descended over her when she thought of Hank and Harper, but she couldn't let that define her couldn't let that hold her back. After a quick breakfast at a nearby diner, she went back to her motel room and used her phone to search for an apartment. Though the apartments weren't cheap, they were much less expensive than the ones in Los Angeles. As she searched for a place that would be affordable yet safe, she came to the conclusion that she would have to get a job, at least a part-time job. She was determined to devote as much time as possible to painting, but her savings would only go so far. 
Later that morning, she looked at several apartment complexes. She had no desire to live in the cheap motel where she'd spent the night, so when she found an apartment that seemed to be in a safe area, was clean, affordable, and furnished, and most importantly was immediately available, she signed the rental agreement. As she carried in her few belongings, excitement swept over her. This really was a fresh start. It was strange to only have herself to think about after being responsible for Harper, but Mary tried not to focus on that. Instead, she set up her easel in a sunny corner of the apartment, eager to paint. But that eagerness turned to despair when day after day no inspiration came. The only thing she could think about, the only person, was Hank. Why had he turned on her? She thought they loved each other. Had it all been fake? All pretend? It had seemed so real, so genuine. Confused and hurt, she tried to move on, but try as she might, she couldn't stop thinking about him, going so far as to look him up online to learn what was going on with his injury. She discovered he'd been put on the inactive list, which she learned meant he wouldn't be playing in Sunday's game. How was he feeling? Was his hamstring still sore? Was he getting by okay? Had Mrs. Stillman returned to take care of him? Wishing desperately that she was there to take care of him, she cried more tears than she knew a human could produce. But even when it seemed there were no tears left, her heart ached more than it had ever ached in her life. When Sunday arrived, she didn't even have to think about it. She turned on the small TV in her apartment to watch his game. He didn't take the field, wasn't even suited up but when the cameras panned to the sidelines and she saw him, her breath caught. He was the most beautiful man she'd ever known, and she loved him with all her heart. There was no denying it. No matter how hard she tried to pretend that he didn't mean anything to her, the truth was, he meant everything to her. Why did her dream have to end so badly, so painfully, so permanently? Over the next week, she continued to search for inspiration, while at the same time searching for a job, but underneath it all, she was counting down the days, then the hours, until she could see Hank on TV again. She'd read that he'd been taken off the inactive list, but it was still uncertain if he would play. Totally caught up in thoughts of him, when she saw him take the field, she was torn between excitement at seeing him in action and terror that he would get hurt again. Glued to the TV, Mary watched Hank's every move, and when the game ended and he walked off the field unhurt, her whole body relaxed. This was insane. She couldn't live like this, obsessing over him when he was out of her life. Thoughts of him were keeping her from moving on, keeping her from painting, something that should be as natural to her as breathing. She had to do something about this. Had to was desperate to. That's when she knew what she had to do. Chapter 44 Monday morning, Mary got some good news for a change. The children's museum called to schedule a job interview. She'd applied the previous week and was excited that she may soon have the opportunity to work with children again. The interview is scheduled for Wednesday. Although she was grateful that a job may be just around the corner, a job she was certain she would love, another item on her calendar took up all of her thoughts. On Sunday, the Vipers would be playing at home, and when the game ended and the players left the stadium, she would be there. She needed to see Hank, in person. Not certain if she would approach him, or if she even wanted him to know she was there, she had to see him. All week long, it was all she could do to not think about Sunday, to not think about seeing Hank. But in reality, she was living for that day. The rest of the days were simply obstacles to getting there. Even her job interview, which went very well, wasn't much of a diversion. And by the time Sunday morning arrived, she was up well before the sun. Taking extra care with how she looked, when it was time to leave, she was shaking with nerves. The game started at eleven, and even though she was certain she wouldn't have the chance to see him until after the game, she wanted to get there early. As she drove to the stadium, she was worried she wouldn't be able to see him at all. She'd never been to a professional football game before, 
and she'd read online that it was difficult to get near the players after the game. With no idea what to expect, when she reached the stadium, she parked in the huge lot and shut off the engine, then stayed where she was, her heart racing. What would happen when, if, she saw him? Would she be able to hang back? Or would she shove through the crowd just for the chance to get near him? What if he saw her? Would he look at her with disgust? With irritation that she would dare track him down? Or would he be happy to see her? Maybe he would even feel bad about what he'd done to her. About the way he treated her. About the way he turned on her. The more she thought about it, the more panicky she became. And when she felt a panic attack coming on, she gripped the steering wheel as she frantically looked around for something to focus on, something to anchor her. Then she looked at the stadium itself. It was huge and unmoving. Closing her eyes, Mary visualized the massive structure anchoring her to the earth, keeping her steady, keeping her calm. Finally, her breathing slowed and the attack ended. Terrified that seeing Hank would send her into a fresh attack, she rethought this whole idea. Maybe she should turn around to go home and focus on things that were going well, like her new job. On Friday, the Children's Museum had offered her the position she'd interviewed for, and she'd accepted. She would start the next day, Monday. Things were looking up. Why did she want to torture herself with hurts from the past? Because she had to do this, had to face him. Hank peeled off his sweat-soaked jersey. It had been a tough game, although they'd pulled out a win in the end. He made his way to the shower, flinching when the hot needles hit his fresh scrapes and bruises. Even though showering after a game could be painful, he was beyond grateful that he was healthy again, that his leg was 100% again. Scrubbing off the dirt and sweat from the game, Hank thought about the plays he was happy with and the plays he needed to improve. Had Mary watched the game? The thought took him by surprise, although maybe it wasn't that surprising. He hadn't gone a day without thinking about her since she had left nearly three weeks earlier. He hoped she'd been able to find another nanny job. He was still angry with London for firing her, but at least London had promised to help Mary find another position. She'd also promised that she would let Mary see Harper from time to time. He knew that would mean everything to Mary. Of course, all of that had been predicated on Hank agreeing to not contact Mary. When London had laid out the condition, he'd been about to refuse when she told him it was Mary's idea. The day before she'd left his house, she'd said there was no point in telling London about the relationship because they weren't going to be together anymore. At the time, he'd been disappointed that she felt that way. But after learning that Mary preferred the options London offered over having contact with him, he knew he had to respect what she wanted, no matter how much it hurt. He toweled off and got dressed. The game was over. It had been more exciting to see a game live than Mary had expected, but the best part was seeing Hank. Even though he was far, far away from where she was sitting, she was closer to him than she had been in weeks. The Vipers had won the game, and she wished she could be there to congratulate him, to celebrate with him. But he didn't want her. She'd heard it for herself. He saw her as a mistake, a mistake he would not repeat. His voice saying those awful, cruel words rang in her head, making her chest ache like it was being squeezed in a vice. Walking out of the stadium, she inhaled deeply. She was nervous about this next part. She needed to see him, and not from the stands. There was a blocked-off area where players would sometimes greet fans and sign autographs. That's where she would go. Thinking about Mary took away some of the high Hank felt over the Viper's win, but he knew of a sure way to rid himself of his melancholy, at least for a little while. He would stop by the fan area. It was always an ego boost to have fans clamoring for his autograph or for him to greet them, and the fans loved it, especially after a win. Hey, Josh, he said to the Viper star quarterback, you going to greet the fans? Sure, Josh said. I can spare a few minutes, but then I have plans with Shay. I'll go too, Jax Cordova, the Viper's top pass rusher, said. 
the three of them made their way out of the locker room and down the hall that led outside. Chapter 45 There's Wisner, Mary heard someone call out excitedly. She was standing behind the row of fans who were pressed up against the waist-high barriers that surrounded the area where the players would be appearing. That was the perfect place to be. She would be able to see Hank without him seeing her. She knew how he felt about her, that he regretted getting involved with her. It was imperative that he not see her. If he did, it would only make things worse. Undoubtedly, he would call security. Maybe he would even have her arrested. The thought made her exceedingly sad. Forcing aside those thoughts, she peered around the man in front of her and managed to get a glimpse of Josh Weisner, the quarterback she'd watched play many times now. He stood on the far side of the space. Hank Parsons coming, someone shouted. Mary's heart stuttered before nearly pounding out of her chest. Standing on her tiptoes, she struggled to see over the shoulders of the people in front of her. At only five feet three inches, she was definitely shorter than most of the fans straining to see, but after bobbing her head one way and then another, she managed to get a look at him. He was less than ten feet away. He looked amazing. Tall, ripped, confident, and so freaking hot. Mary could hardly stand it. He was so close, but he might as well have been on the moon. Vividly recalling the way it had felt to be held in those strong arms and to be kissed by those perfect lips, and remembering the look in his eyes when he told her he was in love with her, Mary nearly swooned as an overpowering yearning practically swamped her. She couldn't do this. This plan had been a terrible mistake. Seeing him only made her miss him more desperately than ever made her heart shatter into a million more pieces. Holding back a sob, she couldn't tear her eyes from him. He was looking in her general direction, a wide smile on his face, the smile she knew so well. She pretended he was smiling at her, but she knew he couldn't see her, not with all the people in front of her. He took a step closer, and the crowd around her moved toward him, calling his name, surging forward, crushing her. All of a sudden, she couldn't breathe, couldn't move, knew she could suffocate to death. Absolute panic flooded her. No one seemed to notice her as the crowd shoved forward on a mission to reach him. Someone slammed into her from behind, smashing her face into the back of the man in front of her, while at the same time the person behind her, a large man with a huge belly, mashed her from behind in a frenzied effort to get Hank's attention. Lungs screaming for air, she struggled to breathe, but couldn't draw a breath. Frantic to claw her way out, she tried to lift her arms, but her hands were pinned to her sides. Her ears began to buzz, and dark spots formed in her vision. Then, mercifully, the crowd shifted slightly, allowing her to draw in a ragged breath. On instinct, she screamed, Hank, help! They're crushing me! Hank heard a woman cry out and thought he heard his name. Did someone need help, or was someone just trying to get his attention? It was hard to be sure over the commotion. The crowd of fans was several people deep, and he couldn't see what was going on. He heard a cry for help again, and the woman's voice sounded hysterical. Something was definitely wrong. Make some room, he shouted, waving his arms at the fans pressed against the barrier. Step aside. The crowd parted like he was Moses himself. That's when he saw her. But he had a hard time believing it was her. What was Mary doing there? She should be in Los Angeles. Mary? Hank! He'd saved her. The crowd had opened up on his command, and now the only thing separating them was the barrier. But the look of unbelieving confusion on his face made her realize her mistake. He wasn't happy to see her, and now she would be arrested. Who's that? She heard someone near her ask, and she felt all eyes shift to her. She ignored them, 
focused solely on Hank, the man she was in love with, the man she couldn't live without. But that didn't matter. He never wanted to see her again. Frozen to the spot, her heart pounding with fear and sorrow, Mary gazed into Hank's intense green eyes. This was her chance to tell him how she felt. Even if he hated her, she had to tell him what was in her heart. Her lips lifted in a tentative smile. I love you. She put all the feeling of her heart into the words. The love. The missing. The regret. Then, when tears flooded her eyes, she began walking backwards. He didn't want her in his life. She had to accept that, no matter how painful. Shocked confusion at seeing Mary gave way to absolute joy, and when Hank heard Mary's declaration of love, his heart nearly burst with happiness. Then her eyes filled with tears, and she began backing away. Where was she going? Why was she leaving? Was this her way of saying a final goodbye? Not about to let her leave, he vaulted over the barrier and sprinted to her side. Where are you going? Her familiar floral scent, uniquely her, slipped into his nostrils, and his instinct was to drag her into his arms and kiss her. But he needed to talk to her, find out what the heck was going on. Hank was right beside her, his handsome face inches away. Mary wanted to fall into his arms, but she knew that wasn't why he was there. Without a doubt, he was going to keep her from leaving, so security could arrest her. Her tear-soaked eyes met his, and she shook her head. I'm sorry, Hank. I shouldn't have come. What are you talking about? I'll leave you alone. I promise. You don't need to have me arrested. Sorrow drenched every word. His eyebrows slammed together. What? Then he shook his head. You're coming with me. Before she could reply, he swept her into his powerful arms and strode to the barrier, setting her on the inside before leaping over himself. Then he put his arm around her shoulder and led her toward a door. At least he would have her arrested in private. That was kind of him. Leaving the clamoring fans behind them, they stepped through the door. Then he stopped and faced her, threading his fingers through hers, his eyes focused completely on her. A kaleidoscope of emotions washed over her. Top among them, confusion. We need to talk, he said. And when he kept his hand in hers as he led her down the hall, Mary felt a spark of hope. Chapter 46 Her hand in his felt so right. He'd missed the feel of her soft skin, the way her hand fit so perfectly in his. Still not quite believing she was there, he glanced at her. Had she said something about being arrested? There had been a lot of noise, so he couldn't be sure. In any case, she was with him now, and they were going to have a serious conversation. He led her out to the player's parking lot. Where are we going? she asked, her sweet voice sounding uncertain. Thrilled beyond reason to have her beside him, he smiled. Somewhere we can talk. When they reached his car, a red Audi R8, he helped her into the passenger seat, then got behind the wheel. The two-seater sports car had a cozy interior, and right now, with Mary in the passenger seat, he appreciated that. I can't believe you're here, he said with a smile that tugged up one side of his mouth. You're not mad I came? Why would she ask that? He was ecstatic. Absolutely not. He had to make something clear from the jump. He reached out and stroked her cheek. You have no idea how much I've missed you. Why was he saying that, Mary wondered. She'd heard what he'd said about her, that she was a mistake. How could he look at her like he'd actually missed her when he'd said being with her was a mistake? Was it a trick? Confused, Mary didn't know what to believe. Let's go somewhere where we can talk. Are you hungry? She hadn't eaten all day. She'd been too nervous. Yes. He chuckled. <laughs> Good, because I'm starving. He started the car and they roared out of the parking lot. 
After a short drive, they pulled into the parking lot of a restaurant that looked pretty fancy. Am I underdressed? Mary asked, as she looked at her jeans and blouse, then realized that was the least important thing right now. Hank stopped next to the valet, then glanced at his own jeans and button-up shirt. If you are, then I am too. But don't worry, I've eaten here before. They'll accommodate us. She didn't want to ask if he'd eaten there with Simone. It didn't matter. The important thing was that she was with him, and he had yet to send her away. Okay. One valet opened Hank's door, and another opened Mary's, helping her out. Hank came to her side, and when his hand slipped into hers, the spark of hope she'd felt earlier ignited into a flame. Mr. Parson, the maitre d' said with a warm smile after they entered. Welcome. Seeing that Hank was known here made Mary feel special in his reflected light. The man smiled at Mary with a nod, then said, Please follow me. They entered a brick-lined courtyard with a huge tree in the middle, ivy climbing the walls, greenery everywhere, and beautifully set tables all around. When they were seated at a small table, Mary noticed that there were just a few other diners. Then again, it was barely five o'clock. This place is stunning, she said with a smile. Hank's eyes never left her face. It's only what you deserve. Mary thought about the recording London had played for her. The way he was looking at her was completely at odds with what he'd said. Confused, but not letting the flame of hope sputter, Mary was eager to discover the truth. But first, they ordered their meal. Salmon for her, steak for him. The moment their server left, Hank took Mary's hand in his. He had to touch her, had to make sure she was really there. You said something about being arrested, he said. He had no idea what she'd been talking about, but it seemed a good place to start. What's going on, Mary? Mary seemed to shrink in on herself as she nibbled on her lower lip. What had happened, he wondered. London fired me, Mary finally said. That wasn't news, but he sensed there was more. A lot more. But she helped you find another job, right? Mary's eyes widened as she shook her head. No, she told me to leave town or she would make sure no one would hire me. Clenching his jaw, he exhaled through his nose. Have you seen Harper? Sadness slid into Mary's eyes. Not since the day she fired me. London barely let me tell Harper goodbye. Fury at London spiked in his head, but he kept his cool, if only for Mary's sake. She lied to me, he said. Mary's forehead furrowed. What? She told me you didn't want to see me, that you made a deal with her that if I didn't contact you, she would help you find another nanny job and let you stay in touch with Harper. London had told him that, Mary thought, and then kicked her out with a promise that she wouldn't find any work as a nanny in Los Angeles? Did that mean the things she told Mary that Hank had said about her were lies, too? But she'd heard him. Right now, Mary's anger at London was secondary. She had to know why Hank had said she was a mistake. I heard what you said, she began. Hank's eyebrows bunched. What I said? Mary nodded. London played a recording of your conversation. She swallowed over the knot in her throat. You said I was... a mistake. What on earth was she talking about, Hank wondered. He'd never said she was a mistake. Combing through his memory... He tried to recall the conversation he'd had with London on the day Mary and Harper had left. Then it hit him. Mary's gaze was glued to him, and as he pictured the way London had manipulated her, had manipulated both of them, he thought his head might explode. Did she play the entire phone call? Mary shook her head. I didn't think so. He gritted his teeth, then forced himself to relax. She took my words out of context. He sighed heavily, but kept Mary's hand held in his. We'd been talking about Harper's custody arrangements. London said I'd agree to the way things were, and I said I realized now that it was a mistake, a mistake I wouldn't repeat. He watched Mary's face. Does that sound familiar? What he said made sense, 
but Mary was still uncertain. Right before you said being with me was a... a mistake, London said you should have known I was off limits. Nothing was said about Harper. A muscle moved in Hank's jaw, and Mary could see he was upset about this. It wouldn't be hard for her to edit the recording, Mary. A thought occurred to her. How long was your conversation with her? One of his shoulders lifted in a shrug. Five minutes, maybe? It had been well over an hour from the time London had left Mary to make her phone call until she had come for Mary. Plenty of time to edit a recording. To think she had fallen for it. Then again, London was an award-winning actress. That, coupled with the doctored audio, who wouldn't have believed it? Mary's initial emotion was outrage, but right on its heels was hope, because right now she was sitting with Hank. London's tricks hadn't worked, at least not for long. What else did she do? Hank asked, his hand still holding hers. Mary no longer wanted to think about London and what she had done. It was all lies anyway. The important thing was that she was with Hank now. It doesn't matter, she replied. Of course it does. She shook her head. Please let it go. I don't want to cause a wedge between you and London. For Harper's sake. She amazed him. This was her chance to get back at London. To expose her lies. Her manipulation. Yet she didn't want to do that. She was more concerned about Harper's parents having harmony than about exacting revenge. Love for her filled his heart to overflowing. She was the woman for him. She would always be the woman for him. He appraised her, his heart full. I love you, Mary. Love for Hank cascaded over her, and all the despair that she'd lived with for the past few weeks evaporated, just like that. I love you, Hank, more than you'll ever know. He smiled. I plan to find out. The server set their food in front of them, forcing them to release each other's hands. What have you been doing these past few weeks? Hank asked as they ate. She filled him in on all that had happened. You live in Sacramento now? His face was alight with happiness. Mary nodded. Yep, and I start my new job tomorrow. Well, he said with a grin, that calls for a celebration. This already felt like a celebration to her, and she told him so. He laughed, okay, but we can celebrate for more than one meal, can't we? What do you have in mind? He reached across the table and took her hand. Now that we no longer have to keep our relationship a secret, I want to take you on a real date. How would you like to go dancing? A real date, she thought. Dancing with Hank. That sounded incredible. I'd love it. I promise I won't keep you out too late. Wouldn't want you to be late for your first day on the job. Mary remembered that he had just finished a rough game of football. Certain he had to be sore all over, she said. Are you sure you're up for dancing? With you? Absolutely. After they'd eaten, he brought her back to the stadium so she could pick up her car. She gave him her address, and he promised to pick her up in an hour. She hurried home to get ready for their date, giddy with excitement. As she passed her empty easel, inspiration flooded her, and she knew what she wanted to paint. A portrait of Hank. It was so obvious now. He was what made her life complete. Yes, she would start on the portrait the next day. Chapter 47 Exhilarated to go on a date with Hank, Mary smiled at her reflection as she turned this way and that. Pleased with the way she looked in the sparkly navy blue dress that reached mid-thigh, she was eager for Hank to arrive. She pulled her long hair into a French twist and put on a pair of sapphire blue earrings, and moments later, she heard a knock on her door. Hank looked more handsome than he had at lunch. Wearing dark slacks and a gray button-down shirt that accentuated his athletic body, it was all Mary could do to keep her hands to herself. Come in, she said, slightly embarrassed for him to see her humble home. Then she gave him the tour, which lasted all of thirty seconds. Not quite as nice as your house. He gazed at her, 
his eyes dancing. All I see is a beautiful woman. I don't have anything like that at my house. Oh, Hank, she breathed out, sliding her arms around his waist and laying her head against his shoulder. Hank held her close, happier than he'd been in weeks. Lifting her chin, he pressed his mouth against hers, tasting her sweet lips, something he'd missed more than he'd known. The passion she ignited in him was something he'd never felt with any other woman. Not London, not Simone, no one. Mary was special, more special than she knew. Maybe we should go, she said, her eyes glowing when he released her. He nodded his agreement, then ushered her out to his car. Once they reached the dance club, he held her hand as they walked inside. Then he immediately led her to the dance floor. Soon, a slow song came on, and as he held her in his arms and moved around the dance floor, his happiness soared to new heights. This was how it was supposed to be. Not hiding their love, but broadcasting it for the world to see. As he breathed in her unique scent, he savored the feel of her in his arms. You smell good, Marigold, he murmured in her ear. Mary loved it when he called her that, because he always accompanied it with a sexy voice, the one that made her want to crawl into his arms and never leave. As they danced the night away, her heart sang with a level of happiness she'd never known existed. Hank was the man she wanted to spend the rest of her life with. She had no doubt, but she didn't want to get ahead of herself. I have a surprise for you, she said, as he helped her into his car at the end of the night. Oh, yeah? It's something I left in the art studio. His lips slowly lifted. I'm intrigued. Then he got behind the wheel. Guess we'll go there now so you can give it to me. She laughed, excited to give him her gift. Soon, they arrived at his house. It felt strange to be there without Harper. It was too quiet. Sadness washed over her, but when she and Hank walked into the art studio, and she went into the corner to retrieve the painting of Harper, she smiled in anticipation. Holding it so he couldn't see what it was, she said, I wanted to give this to you before, but I left in such a hurry that I forgot. She turned it around so he could see it. A soft smile lit his face, then he took the canvas from her and studied it. He lifted his eyes to hers. I love it. It's so Harper. He looked at it again, then he set it on the floor, leaning it against the wall before turning to her. You'll see Harper soon. In another two weeks, actually. Mary's heart leapt with joy. I miss her. Hank wrapped her in his arms. I do too. Of course he did, she thought. He was her father. She shouldn't be thinking only about herself. She smiled sadly at him. I'm sorry I caused you so much trouble, Hank. He laughed. <laughs> You've been worth every bit of it. He ran his hands down her arms, sending electricity skating across her skin. I love you, Mary. He gazed at her, his eyes brilliant with love. Did you know that I'm going to marry you one day? She gasped as delight rushed through her. No, this is the first I've heard of it. He smiled. Marigold, you are the sunshine that brightens my days and the stars that light my nights. Her smile was so wide that she thought her face might split in two. But her heart was whole and healthy and so filled with love for him that she didn't know how it hadn't burst. He wrapped her in his strong embrace and as his lips pressed against hers with passion, she closed her eyes, swept up in the love they shared, the love that would never be a secret again. This has been Blindsided, written and narrated by Christine Kersey. Copyright 2017 by Christine Kersey. Thanks for listening.